The Theory of Moral Sentiments by Adam Smith Part 4 Of the Effect of Utility Upon the Sentiment of Approbation Chapter 1 Of the Beauty Which the Appearance of Utility Bestows Upon All the Productions of Art And of the Extensive Influence Of This Species of Beauty That utility is one of the principal sources of beauty has been observed by everybody who has considered with any attention what constitutes the nature of beauty. The conveniency of a house gives pleasure to the spectator as well as its regularity, and he is as much hurt when he observes a contrary effect as when he sees the correspondent windows of different forms or the door not placed exactly in the middle of the building. That the fitness of the system or machine to produce the end for which it is intended bestows a certain propriety of beauty upon the whole and renders the very thought and contemplation of it agreeable, is so very obvious that nobody has overlooked it. The cause, too, why utility pleases, has of late been assigned by an ingenious and agreeable philosopher, who joins the greatest depth of thought to the greatest elegance of expression, and possesses the singular and happy talent of treating the abstrusest subjects not only with the most perfect perspicuity, but with the most lively eloquence. The utility of any object, according to him, pleases the master by perpetually suggesting to him the pleasure or conveniency which it is fitted to promote. Every time he looks at it, he is put in mind of this pleasure, and the object in this manner becomes a source of perpetual satisfaction and enjoyment. The spectator enters by sympathy into the sentiments of the master, and necessarily views the object under the same agreeable aspect when we visit with the palaces of the great we cannot help conceiving the satisfaction we should enjoy if we ourselves were the masters, and were possessed of so much artful and ingenuously contrived accommodation. A similar account is given why the appearance of inconveniency should render any object disagreeable both to the owner and to the spectator. But that this fitness, this happy contrivance of any production of art, should often be more valued than the very end for which it was intended, and that the exact adjustment of the means for attaining any conveniency or pleasure should frequently be more regarded than that very conveniency or pleasure in the attainment of which their whole merit would seem to consist, has not so far, as I know, been yet taken notice of by anybody. That this, however, is very frequently the case may be observed in a thousand instances, both in the most frivolous and in the most important concerns of human life. When a person comes into his chamber, and finds the chairs all standing in the middle of the room, he is angry with his servant, and rather than see them continue in that disorder, perhaps takes the trouble himself to set them all in their places, with their backs to the wall. The whole propriety of this new situation arises from a superior conveniency in leaving the floor free and disengaged. To attain this conveniency, he voluntarily puts himself to more trouble than all he could have suffered from the want of it. Since nothing was more easy, than to have set himself down upon one of them, which is probably what he does when his labor is over. What he wanted, therefore, it seems, was not so much this conveniency as that arrangement of things which promotes it. Yet it is this conveniency which ultimately recommends that arrangement and bestows upon it the whole of its propriety and beauty. A watch in the same manner that falls behind above two minutes in a day is despised by one curious in watches, he sells it perhaps for a couple of guineas and purchases another at fifty, which will not lose above a minute in a fortnight. The sole use of watches, however, is to tell us what o'clock it is, and to hinder us from breaking any engagement or suffering any other inconveniency by our ignorance in that particular point. But the person so nice with regard to this machine will not always be found either more scrupulously punctual than any other man, or more anxiously concerned upon any other account to know precisely what time of day it is. What interests him is not so much the attainment of this piece of knowledge as the perfection of the machine which serves to attain it. How many people ruin themselves by laying out money on trinkets of frivolous utility? What pleases these lovers of toys is not so much the utility as the aptness of the machines which are fitted to promote it. All their pockets are stuffed with little conveniencies. They contrive new pockets unknown in the clothes of other people in order to carry a greater number, they walk about loaded with a multitude of baubles, in weight and sometimes in value not inferior to an ordinary Jew's box, some of which may sometimes be of some little use, but all of which might at all times be very well spared 
and of which the whole utility is certainly not worth the fatigue of bearing the burden. Nor is it only with regard to such frivolous objects that our conduct is influenced by this principle. It is often the secret motive of the most serious and important pursuits of both private and public life. The poor man's son, whom heaven in its anger has visited with ambition, when he begins to look around him, admires the condition of the rich. He finds the cottage of his father too small for his accommodation, and fancies he should be lodged more at his ease in a palace. He is displeased with being obliged to walk afoot, or to endure the fatigue of riding on horseback. He sees his superiors carried about in machines, and imagines that in one of these he could travel with less inconveniency. He feels himself naturally indolent, and willing to serve himself with his own hands as little as possible, and judges that a numerous retinue of servants would save him from a great deal of trouble. He thinks if he had attained all these, he would sit still contentedly, and be quiet, enjoying himself in the thought of the happiness and tranquility of his situation. He is enchanted with the distant idea of this felicity. It appears in his fancy like the life of some superior rank of beings, and in order to arrive at it, he devotes himself forever to the pursuit of wealth and greatness. To obtain the conveniencies which these afford, he submits in the first year, nay, in the first month of his application, to more fatigue of body and more uneasiness of mind than he could have suffered through the whole of his life from the want of them. He studies to distinguish himself in some laborious profession. With the most unrelenting industry he labors night and day to acquire talents superior to all his competitors. He endeavors next to bring those talents into public view, and with equal assiduity solicits every opportunity of employment. For this purpose he makes his court to all mankind. He serves those whom he hates and is obsequious to those whom he despises. Through the whole of his life, he pursues the idea of a certain artificial and elegant repose, which he may never arrive at, for which he sacrifices a real tranquillity that is at all times in his power, and which, if in the extremity of old age he should at last attain to it, he will find to be in no respect preferable to that humble security and contentment which he had abandoned for it. It is then, in the last dregs of life, his body wasted with toil and diseases, his mind, galled and ruffled by the memory of a thousand injuries and disappointments which he imagines he has met with from the injustice of his enemies, or from the perfidy and ingratitude of his friends, that he begins at last to find that wealth and greatness are mere trinkets of frivolous utility, no more adapted for procuring ease of body or tranquility of mind than the tweezer cases of the lover of toys, and like them too more troublesome to the person who carries them about with him then all the advantages they can afford him are commodious. There is no other real difference between them, except that the conveniencies of the one are somewhat more observable than those of the other. The palaces, the gardens, the equipage, the retinue of all the great are objects of which the obvious conveniency strikes everybody. They do not require that their masters should point out to us wherein consists their utility. Of our own accord, we readily enter into and by sympathy enjoy and thereby applaud the satisfaction which they are fitted to afford him. But the curiosity of a toothpick, of an earpick, of a machine for cutting nails, or of any other trinket of the same kind, is not so obvious. Their conveniency may perhaps be equally great, but it is not so striking, and we do not so readily enter into the satisfaction of the man who possesses them. They are therefore less reasonable subjects of vanity than the magnificence of wealth and greatness and in this consists the sole advantage of these last. They more effectually gratify that love of distinction so natural to man. To one who was to live alone in a desolate island, it might be a matter of doubt, perhaps whether a palace or a collection of small conveniencies are commonly contained in a tweezer case, would contribute most to his happiness and enjoyment. If he is to live in society, indeed, there can be no comparison, because in this, as in all other cases, we constantly pay more regard to the sentiment of the spectator than to those of the person principally concerned and consider rather how a situation will appear to other people than how it will appear to himself. If we examine, however, why the spectator distinguishes with such admiration the condition of the rich and the great, we shall find that it is not so much upon account of the superior ease or pleasure which they are supposed to enjoy as the numberless artificial and elegant contrivances for promoting his ease 
or pleasure. He does not even imagine that they are really happier than other people, but he imagines that they possess more means of happiness, and it is the ingenuous and artful adjustment of those means to the end for which they were intended that is the principal source of his admiration. But in the languor of disease and the weariness of old age, the pleasures of vain and empty distinctions of greatness disappear. To one, in this situation, they are no longer capable of recommending those toilsome pursuits in which they had formerly engaged him. In his heart, he curses ambition and vainly regrets the ease and the indolence of youth, pleasures which are fled forever, and which he had foolishly sacrificed for what, when he has got it, can afford him no real satisfaction. In this miserable aspect, does greatness appear to every man, when reduced either by spleen or disease, to observe with attention his own situation, and to consider what it is that is really wanting to his happiness. Power and riches appear then to be what they are. Enormous and operose machines contrive to produce a few trifling conveniences to the body, consisting of springs the most nice and delicate, which must be kept in order with the most anxious attention, and which in spite of all our care are ready every moment to burst into pieces and to crush into ruins their unfortunate possessor. They are immense fabrics, which it requires the labor of a life to raise, which threaten every moment to overwhelm the person that dwells in them, and which while they stand, though they may save him from some smaller inconveniencies, can protect him of none of the severer inclemencies of the season. They keep off the summer shower, not the winter storm, but leave him always as much, and sometimes more exposed than before, to anxiety, to fear, and to sorrow, to disease, to danger, and to death. But though this splenetic philosophy, which in time of sickness or low spirits, is familiar to every man, thus entirely depreciates those great objects of human desire, when in better health and in better humor, we never fail to regard them under a more agreeable aspect. Our imagination, which in pain and sorrow seem to be confined and cooped up within our own persons, in times of ease and prosperity, expands itself to everything around us. We are then charmed with the beauty of that accommodation which reigns in the palaces and economy of the great, and admire how everything is adapted to promote their ease, to prevent their wants, to gratify their wishes, and to amuse and entertain their most frivolous desires. If we consider the real satisfaction which all these things are capable of affording, by itself and separated from the beauty of that arrangement which is fitted to promote it, it will always appear in the highest degree contemptible and trifling. But we rarely view it in this abstract and philosophical light. We naturally confound it in our imagination with the order, the regular and harmonious movement of the system, the machine or economy by means of which it is produced, the pleasures of wealth and greatness when considered in this complex view strike the imagination as something grand and beautiful and noble, of which the attainment is well worth all the toil and anxiety which we are so apt to bestow upon it. And it is well that nature imposes upon us in this manner. It is the deception which rouses and keeps in continual motion the industry of mankind. It is this which first prompted them to cultivate the ground, to build houses, to found cities and commonwealths and to invent and improve all the sciences and arts which ennoble and embellish human life, which have entirely changed the whole face of the globe, which have turned the rude forests of nature into agreeable and fertile plains, and made the trackless and barren ocean of new fund of subsidence, and the great high road of communication to the different nations of the earth. The earth, by these labors of mankind, has been obliged to redouble her natural fertility and to maintain a greater multitude of inhabitants. It is to no purpose that the proud and unfeeling landlord views his extensive fields, and without a thought for the want of his brethren, in imagination consumes himself the whole harvest that grows upon them. The homely and vulgar proverb, that the eye is larger than the belly, never was more fully verified than with regard to him. The capacity of his stomach bears no proportion to the immensity of his desires and will receive no more than that of the meanest peasant. The rest he is obliged to distribute among those who prepare in the nicest manner that little which he himself makes use of, among those who fit up the palace in which this little is to be consumed, among those who provide and keep in order all the different baubles and trinkets which are employed in the economy of greatness, all of whom thus derive from his luxury 
and caprice that share of necessaries of life which they would in vain have expected from his humanity or his justice. The produce of the soil maintains at all times nearly that number of inhabitants which is capable of maintaining. The rich only select from the heap what is most precious and agreeable. They consume little more than the poor, and in spite of their natural selfishness and rapacity, though they mean only their own conveniency, though the sole end which they propose from the labors of all those thousands whom they employ be the gratification of their own vain and insatiable desires, they divide with the poor the produce of all their improvements. They are led by an invisible hand to make nearly the same distribution of the necessaries of life which would have been made had the earth been divided into equal portions among all its inhabitants, and thus, without intending it, without knowing it, advance the interests of society and afford means to the multiplication of the species. When Providence divided the earth among a few lordly masters, it neither forgot nor abandoned those who seemed to have been left out in the partition. These last, too, enjoy their share of all that it produces. In what constitutes the real happiness of human life, they are in no respect inferior to those who it seems so much above them. In ease of body and peace of mind, all the different ranks of life are nearly upon a level and the beggar who suns himself by the side of the highway possesses that security which kings are fighting for. The same principle, the same love of system, the same regard to the beauty of order, of art and contrivance, frequently serves to recommend those institutions which tend to promote the public welfare. When a patriot exerts himself for the improvement of any part of the public police, his conduct does not always arise from pure sympathy with the happiness of those who are to reap the benefit of it. It is not commonly from the fellow feeling with carriers and wagoners that a public spirited man encourages the mending of high roads. When the legislature establishes premiums and other encouragements to advance the linen or woolen manufacturers, its conduct seldom proceeds from pure sympathy with the wearer of cheap or fine cloth, and much less from that with the manufacturer or merchant. The perfection of police, the extension of trade and manufacturers, are noble and magnificent objects. The contemplation of them pleases us, and we are interested in whatever can tend to advance them. They make part of the great system of government, and the wheels of the political machine seem to move with more harmony and ease by the means of them. We take pleasure in beholding the perfection of so beautiful and grand a system, and we are uneasy till we remove any obstruction that can in the least disturb or encumber the regularity of its motions. All constitutions of government however, are valued only in proportion as they tend to promote the happiness of those who live under them. This is their sole use and end. From a certain spirit of system, however, from a certain love of art and contrivance, we sometimes seem to value the means more than the end, and to be eager to promote the happiness of our fellow creatures rather from a view to perfect and improve a certain beauty and orderly system than from any immediate sense or feeling of what they either suffer or enjoy. There have been men of the greatest public spirit who have shown themselves in other respects, not very sensible to the feelings of humanity, and on the contrary there have been men of the greatest humanity who seem to have been entirely devoid of public spirit. Every man may find in the circles of his acquaintance instances both of the one kind and the other. Who had ever less humanity or public spirit than the celebrated legislator of Muscovy? The social and well-natured James I of Great Britain seems, on the contrary, to have had scarce any passion either for the glory or the interest of his country. Would you awaken the industry of the man who seems almost dead to ambition? It will often be to no purpose to describe to him the happiness of the rich and great, to tell him that they are generally sheltered from the sun and the rain, that they are seldom hungry, that they are seldom cold, and that they are rarely exposed to weariness or to want of any kind. The most eloquent exhortation of this kind will have little effect upon him. If you would hope to succeed, you must describe to him the conveniency and arrangement of the different apartments in their palaces. You must explain to him the propriety of their equipages, and point out to him the number, the order, and the different offices of all their attendants. If anything is capable of making an impression upon him, this will. Yet all these things tend only to keep off the sun and the rain, to save them from hunger and cold, from want and weariness. In the same manner, if you would implant public virtue, 
in the breast of him who seems heedless of the interests of his country, it will often be to no purpose to tell him what superior advantages the subjects of a well-governed state enjoy, that they are better lodged, that they are better clothed, and that they are better fed. These considerations will commonly make no great impression, and you must be more likely to persuade if you describe the great system of public police which procures these advantages, if you explain the connections and dependencies of its several parts, their mutual subordination to one another, and their general subserviency to the happiness of the society. If you show how this system might be introduced into his own country, what it is that hinders it from taking place there at present, how those obstructions might be removed, and all the several wheels of the machine of government to be made to move with more harmony and smoothness without grading upon one another or mutually retarding one another's motions. It is scarce possible that a man should listen to a discourse of this kind and not feel himself animated to some degree of public spirit. He will, at least for the moment, feel some desire to remove those obstructions and to put into motion so beautiful and so orderly a machine. Nothing tends so much to promote public spirit as the study of politics, of the several systems of civil government, their advantages and disadvantages, of the constitution of our own country, its situation and interest with regard to foreign nations, its commerce, its defense, the disadvantages it labors under, the danger to which it might be exposed, how to remove the one and how to guard against the other. Upon this account, political disquisitions, if just and reasonable and practical, are of all the works of speculation the most useful. Even the weakest and the worst of them are not altogether without their utility. They serve at least to animate the public passions of men and rouse them to seek out the means of promoting the happiness of the society. Chapter 2 Of the beauty which the appearance of utility bestows upon the characters and actions of men, and how far the perception of this beauty may be regarded as one of their original principles of approbation. The characters of men, as well as the contrivances of art, or the institutions of civil government, may be fitted either to promote or to disturb the happiness both of the individual and of the society. The prudent, the equitable, the active, resolute, and sober character promises prosperity and satisfaction both to the person himself and to everyone connected with him. The rash, the insolent, the slothful, effeminate, and voluptuous, on the contrary, forebodes ruin to the individual and misfortune to all who have anything to do with him. The first turn of mind has at least all the beauty which can belong to the most perfect machine that was ever invented for promoting the most agreeable purpose, and the second, all the deformity of the most awkward and clumsy contrivance. What institution of government contends so much to promote the happiness of mankind? as the general prevalence of wisdom and virtue. All government is but an imperfect remedy for the deficiency of these. Whatever beauty, therefore, can belong to civil government upon account of its utility must in a far superior degree belong to these. On the contrary, what civil policy can be so ruinous and so destructive as the vices of men? The fatal effects of bad government arise from nothing but that it does not sufficiently guard against the mischiefs which human wickedness gives occasion to. This beauty and deformity, which characters appear to derive from their usefulness or inconveniency, are apt to strike, in a peculiar manner, those who consider in an abstract and philosophical light the actions and conduct of mankind when a philosopher goes to examine why humanity is approved of, or cruelty condemned, he does not always form to himself in a very clear and distinct manner, the conception of any one particular action, either of cruelty or of humanity. But is calmly contended with the vague and indeterminate idea which the general names of those qualities suggest to him. But it is in particular instances only that the propriety or impropriety, the merit or demerit of actions, is very obvious and discernible. It is only when particular examples are given that we perceive distinctly either the concord or disagreement between our own affections and those of the agent, or feel a social gratitude arise towards him in the one case, or sympathetic resentment in the other. When we consider virtue and vice in an abstract and general manner, the qualities by which they excite these several sentiments seem in a great measure to disappear, and the sentiments themselves become less obvious and discernible. 
On the contrary, the happy effects of the one and the fatal consequences of the other seem then to rise up to the view and as it were to stand out and distinguish themselves from all other qualities of either. The same ingenious and agreeable author who first explained why utility pleases has been so struck with this view of things as to resolve our whole approbation of virtue into a perception of this species of beauty as to resolve our whole approbation of virtue into a perception of this species of beauty which results from the appearance of utility no qualities of the mind he observes are as approved of or righteous but such as are useful or agreeable either to the person himself or to others and no other qualities are disapproved of as vicious but such as have contrary tendency and nature indeed seems to have so happily adjusted our sentiments of approbation and disapprobation to the conveniency both of the individual and of the society that after the strictest examination it will be found i believe that this is universally the case but still i affirm that it is not the view of this utility or hurtfulness which is either the first or principal source of our approbation and disapprobation these sentiments are no doubt enhanced and enlivened by the perception of the beauty or deformity which results from this utility or hurtfulness but still i say they are originally and essentially different from this perception for first of all it seems impossible that the approbation of virtue should be a sentiment of the same kind with that by which we approve of a convenient and well-contrived building or that we should have no other reason for praising a man than that for which we commend a chest of drawers and secondly it will be found upon examination that the usefulness of any disposition of mind is seldom the first ground of our approbation and that the sentiment of approbation always involves in the sense of the propriety quite distinct from the perception of utility we may observe this with regard to all the qualities which are approved of as virtuous both those which according to this system are originally valued as useful to ourselves as well as those which are esteemed on account of their usefulness to others the qualities most useful to ourselves are first of all superior reason and understanding by which we are capable of discerning the remote consequences of all our actions and of foreseeing the advantage or detriment which is likely to result from them and secondly self-command by which we are enabled to abstain from present pleasure or to endure present pain in order to obtain a greater pleasure or to avoid a greater pain in some future time in the union of those two qualities consists the virtue of prudence of all the virtues that which is most useful to the individual with regard to the first of those qualities it has been observed on a former occasion that superior reason and understanding are originally approved of as just and right and accurate and not merely as useful or advantageous it is in the abstruser sciences particularly in the high parts of mathematics that the great and most admired exertions of human reason have been displayed but the utility of those sciences either to the individual or to the public is not very obvious and to prove it requires a discussion which is not always very easily comprehended it was not therefore their utility which first recommended them to the public admiration this quality was but little insisted upon till it became necessary to make some reply to the reproaches of those who having themselves no taste for such sublime discoveries endeavor to depreciate them as useless that self-command in the same manner by which we restrain our present appetites in order to gratify them more fully upon another occasion is approved of as much under the aspect of propriety as under that of utility when we act in this manner the sentiments which influence our conduct seem exactly to coincide with those of the spectator the spectator does not feel the solicitations of our present appetites to him the pleasure which we are to enjoy a week hence or a year hence is just as interesting as that which we are to enjoy this moment when for the sake of the present therefore we sacrifice the future our conduct appears to him absurd and extravagant in the highest degree and he cannot enter into the principles which influence it on the contrary when we abstain from present pleasure in order to secure greater pleasure to come when we act as if the remote object interested us as much as that which immediately presses upon the senses as our own affections exactly correspond with his own we cannot fail to approve of our behavior and he knows from experience how few are capable of this self-command he looks upon our conduct with a considerable degree of wonder and admiration 
Hence arises that eminent esteem with which all men naturally regard a steady perseverance in the practice of frugality, industry, and application, though directed to no other purpose than the acquisition of fortune. The resolute firmness of the person who acts in this manner, and in order to obtain a great though remote advantage, not only gives up all present pleasures, but endures the greatest labor, both of mind and body, necessarily commands our approbation. That view of his interest and happiness, which appears to regulate his conduct, exactly tallies with the idea which we naturally form of it. There is the most perfect correspondence between his sentiments and our own, and at the same time from our experience of the common weakness of human nature. It is a correspondence which we could not reasonably have expected. We not only approve, therefore, but in some measure admire his conduct, and think it worthy of a considerable degree of applause. It is the consciousness and the merited approbation and esteem which is alone capable of supporting the agent in this tenor of conduct. The pleasure which we are to enjoy ten years hence interests us so little in comparison with that which they may enjoy today. The passion which first excites is naturally so weak in comparison with that violent emotion which the second is apt to give occasion to, that the one could never be any balance to the other unless it was supported by the sense of propriety, by the consciousness that we merited the esteem and approbation of everybody, by acting in one way, and that we became the proper objects of their contempt and derision, by behaving in the other. Humanity, justice, generosity, and public spirit are the qualities most useful to others, wherein consists the propriety of humanity and justice has been explained upon a former occasion, where it was shown how much our esteem and approbation of those qualities depended upon the concord between the affections of the agent and those of the spectators. The propriety of generosity and public spirit is founded upon the same principle with that of justice. Generosity is different from humanity. Those two qualities, which at first sight seem so nearly allied, do not always belong to the same person. Humanity is the virtue of a woman, generosity of a man, the fair sex, who have commonly much more tenderness than ours, have seldom so much generosity that the woman rarely makes considerable donations, is an observation of the civil law. Humanity consists merely in the exquisite fellow feeling which the spectator entertains with the sentiments of the person principally concerned, as so to grieve for their sufferings, to resent their injuries, and to rejoice at their good fortune. The most humane actions require no self-denial, no self-command, and no self-exertion of the sense of propriety. They consist only in doing what this exquisite sympathy would, of its own accord, prompt us to do. But it is otherwise with generosity. We never are generous except when, in some respect, we prefer some other person to ourselves, and sacrifice some great and important interest of our own to an equal interest of a friend or of a superior. The man who gives up his pretensions to an office that was the great object of his ambition, because he imagines that the services of another are better entitled to it, the man who exposes his life to defend that of a friend, which he judges to be of more importance, neither of them act from humanity, or because they feel more exquisitely what concerns that other person than what concerns themselves. They both consider those opposite interests, not in the light in which they naturally appear to themselves, but in that in which they appear to others. To every bystander, the success or preservation of this other person may justly be more interesting than their own, but it cannot be so to themselves. When to the interests of this other person, therefore, they sacrifice their own, they accommodate themselves to the sentiments of the spectator, and by an effort of magnanimity, act according to those views of things which, they feel, must naturally occur to any third person. The soldier who throws away his life in order to defend that of his officer would perhaps be but little affected by the death of that officer, if it should happen without any fault of his own, and a very small disaster which had befallen himself might excite a much more lively sorrow. But when he endeavours to act so as to deserve applause, and to make the impartial spectator enter into the principles of his conduct, he feels that to everybody but himself his own life is a trifle compared to that of his officer, and that when he sacrifices the one to the other, he acts quite properly and agreeably to what would be the natural apprehensions of every impartial bystander. It is the same case with the greater exertions of public spirit, when a young officer exposes his life to acquire some inconsiderable addition 
to the dominions of his sovereign. It is not because the acquisition of the new territory is, to himself, an object more desirable than the preservation of his own life. To him, his own life is of more infinitely more value than the conquest of a whole kingdom for the state of which he serves. But when he compares those two objects with one another, he does not view them in the same light in which they naturally appear to himself, but in that in which they appear to the nation he fights for. To them, the success of war is of the highest importance, the life of a private person of scarce any consequence when he puts himself in their situation, he immediately feels that he cannot be too prodigal of his blood, if, by shedding it, he can promote so valuable a purpose. In thus thwarting, from a sense of duty and propriety, the strongest of all natural propensities, consists the heroism of his conduct. There is many an honest Englishman who, in his private station, would be more seriously disturbed by the loss of a guinea than by the national loss of Menorca, who yet had it been in his power to defend that fortress, would have sacrificed his life a thousand times rather than, through his fault, have let it fall into the hands of the enemy. When the first Brutus led forth his own sons to a capital punishment because they had conspired against the rising liberty of Rome, he sacrificed what, if he had consulted his own breast only, would appear to be the stronger to the weaker affection. Brutus ought naturally to have felt much more for the death of his own sons than for all that probably Rome could have suffered from the want of so great an example, but he viewed them, not with the eyes of a father, but with those of a Roman citizen. He entered so thoroughly into the sentiments of this last character, that he paid no regard to that tie by which he himself was connected with them, and to a Roman citizen the sons even of Brutus seemed contemptible when put into the balance with the smallest interest of Rome. In these and all other cases of this kind, our admiration is not so much founded upon the utility as upon the unexpected and on that account the great the noble and exalted propriety of such actions this utility when we come to view it bestows upon them undoubtedly a new beauty and upon that account still further recommends them to our approbation this beauty however is chiefly perceived by men of reflection and speculation and is by no means the quality which first recommends such actions to the natural sentiments of the bulk of mankind it is to be observed that so far as the sentiment of approbation arises from the perception of this beauty of utility, it has no preference of any kind to the sentiments of others. If it was possible, therefore, that a person should grow up to manhood without any communication with society, his own actions might, notwithstanding, be agreeable or disagreeable to him on account of their tendency to his happiness or disadvantage. He might perceive a beauty of this kind in prudence, temperance, and good conduct, and a deformity in the opposite behavior. He might view his own temper and character with that sort of satisfaction with which we consider a well-contrived machine, in the one case, or with that sort of distaste and dissatisfaction with which we regard a very awkward and clumsy contrivance in the other, as these perceptions, however, are merely a matter of taste, and have all the feebleness and delicacy of that species of perceptions upon the justness of which what is properly called taste is founded they probably would not be much attended to by one in this solitary and miserable condition. Even though they should occur to him, they should by no means have the same effect upon him. Antecedent to his connection with society, they would have in consequence of that connection. He would not be cast down with inward shame at the thought of this deformity, nor would he be elevated with secret triumph of mind from the consciousness of that contrary beauty. He would not exult from the notion of deserving reward in the one case, nor tremble at the suspicion of meriting punishment in the other. All such sentiments suppose the idea of some other being, who is the natural judge of the person that feels them, and is only by sympathy with the decisions of this arbiter, of his conduct, that he can conceive either the triumph of self-applause or the shame of self-condemnation. Part 5. Of the influence of custom and fashion upon the sentiments of moral approbation and disapprobation. Chapter 1. Of the influence of custom and fashion upon the notions of beauty and deformity. There are other principles besides those already enumerated, which have a considerable influence upon the moral sentiments of mankind, and are the chief causes of the many irregular and discordant opinions which prevail in different ages and nations concerning what is blamable or praiseworthy. These principles are custom and fashion, 
principles which extend their dominion over our judgments concerning beauty of every kind. When two objects have frequently been seen together, the imagination acquires a habit of passing easily from the one to the other. If the first appear, we lay our account that the second is to follow. Of their own accord, they put us in mind of one another, and the attention glides easily along them. Though independent of custom, there should be no real beauty in their union. Yet when custom has thus concentrated them together, we feel an impropriety in their separation. The one we think is awkward when it appears without its usual companion. We miss something which we expected to find, and the habitual arrangements of our ideas is disturbed by the disappointment. A suit of clothes, for example, seems to want something if they are without the most insignificant ornament which usually accompanies them, and we find a meanness or awkwardness in the absence even of a haunch button. When there is any natural propriety in the union, custom increases our sense of it, and makes a different arrangement appear still more disagreeable than it would otherwise seem to be. Those who have been accustomed to see things in a good taste are more disgusted by whatever is clumsy or awkward. Where their conjunction is improper, custom either diminishes or takes away altogether our sense of impropriety. Those who have been accustomed to slovenly disorder lose all sense of neatness or elegance. The modes of furniture or dress which seems ridiculous to strangers gives no offense to the people who are used to them. Fashion is different from custom, or rather is a particular species of it. That is not the fashion which everybody wears, but which those wear who are of a high rank or character. The graceful, the easy, and commanding manners of the great, joined to the usual richness and magnificence of their dress, give a grace to the very form which they happen to bestow upon it. As long as they continue to use this form, it is connected in our imaginations with the idea of something that is genteel and magnificent, and though in itself it should be indifferent and seems on account of this relation to have something about it that is genteel and magnificent too. As soon as they drop it, it loses all the grace which it had appeared to possess before, and being now used only by the inferior ranks of people, seems to have something of their meanness and awkwardness. Dress and furniture are allowed by all the world to be entirely under the dominion of custom and fashion. The influence of those principles, however, is by no means confined to so narrow a sphere, but extends itself to whatever, in any respect, the object of taste, to music, to poetry, to architecture. The modes of dress and furniture are continually changing, and that fashion appearing ridiculous today, which was admired five years ago, we are experimentally convinced that it owed its vogue chiefly or entirely to custom and fashion. Clothes and furniture are not made of very durable materials. A well-fancied coat is done in a twelve-month, and cannot continue longer to propagate, as the fashion that from according to which it was made. The modes of furniture change less rapidly than those of dress, because furniture is commonly more durable. In five or six years, however, it generally undergoes an entire revolution, and every man in his own time sees the fashion in this respect change many different ways. The productions of the other arts are much more lasting, and when happily imagined, may continue to propagate the fashion of their make for a much longer time. A well-contrived building may endure many centuries, a beautiful air may be delivered down by a sort of tradition. Through many successive generations, a well-written poem may last as long as the world, and all of them continue for ages together, to give the vogue to that particular style, to that particular taste or manner, according to which each of them was composed. Few men have an opportunity of seeing, in their own times, the fashion in any of these arts change very considerably. Few men have so much experience and acquaintance with the different modes which have been obtained in remote ages and nations as to be thoroughly reconciled to them, or to judge with impartiality between them, and what takes place in their own age and country. Few men, therefore, are willing to allow that custom or fashion have much influence upon their judgments concerning what is beautiful, or otherwise, in the productions of any of those arts but imagine that all the rules which they think ought to be observed in each of them are confounded upon reason and nature, not upon habit or prejudice. A very little attention, however, may convince them of the contrary, 
and satisfy them that the influence of custom and fashion over dress and furniture is not more absolute than over architecture, poetry, and music. Can any reason, for example, be assigned why the Doric capital should be appropriated to a pillar whose height is equal to eight diameters, the Ionic volute to one of nine, and the Corinthian foliage to one of ten? The propriety of each of those appropriations can be founded upon nothing but habit and custom, the eye having been used to see a particular proportion connected with a particular ornament would be offended if they were not joined together each of the five orders has its peculiar ornaments which could not be changed for any other without giving offence to all those who know anything of the rule of architecture according to some architects indeed such is the exquisite judgment with which the ancients have assigned to each order its proper ornaments that no others can be found which are equally suitable. It seems, however, a little difficult to be conceived that these forms, though no doubt extremely agreeable, should be the only forms which can suit the proportions, or that there should not be five hundred others which, antecedent to established custom, would have fitted them equally well. When custom, however, has established particular rules of building, provided they are not absolutely unreasonable, it is absurd to think of altering them for others which are only equally good or even for others which, in point of elegance and beauty, have naturally some little advantage over them. A man would be ridiculous who should appear in public with a suit of clothes quite different from those which are now commonly worn. Though the new dress should in itself be ever so graceful or convenient, and there seems to be an absurdity of the same kind in ornamenting a house after a quite different manner from that which custom and fashion have prescribed. Though the new ornaments should in themselves be somewhat superior to the common ones. According to the ancient rhetoricians, a certain measure of verse was by nature appropriated to each particular species of writing, as being naturally expressive of that character, sentiment, or passion which ought to be predominant in it. One verse, they said, was fit for grave and another for gay works, which could not, they thought, be interchanged without the greatest impropriety. The experience of modern times, however, seems to contradict this principle, though in itself it would appear to be extremely probable. What is the burlesque verse in English is the heroic verse in French. The tragedies of Racine and Henriette of Voltaire are nearly in the same verse with, let me have your advice in a weighty affair. The burlesque verse in French, on the contrary, is pretty much the same with the heroic verse of ten syllables in English. Custom has made the one nation associate the ideas of gravity, sublimity, and seriousness to that measure which the other has connected with whatever is gay, flippant, and ludicrous. Nothing would appear more absurd in English than a tragedy written in the Alexandrian verses of the French, or in French than a work of the same kind in verses of ten syllables. An eminent artist will bring about a considerable change in the established modes of each of those arts and introduce a new fashion of writing, music, or architecture, as the dress of an agreeable man of high rank recommends itself, and how peculiar and fantastical soever comes soon to be admired and imitated. So the excellencies of an eminent master recommends his peculiarities, and his manner becomes the fashionable style in the art which he practices. The taste of the Italians in music and architecture has, within these fifty years, undergone a considerable change from imitating the peculiarities of some eminent masters in each of those arts. Seneca is accused by Quintilian of having corrupted the taste of the Romans and of having introduced a frivolous prettiness in the room of majestic reason and masculine eloquence. Sallust and Tacitus have by others been charged with the same accusation, though in a different manner. They gave reputation, it is pretended, to a style which though in the highest degree concise, eloquent, expressive, and even poetical, wanted, however, ease, simplicity, and nature, and was evidently the production of the most labored and studied affectation. How many great qualities must that writer possess? Who can thus render his very faults agreeable? After the praise of refining the taste of a nation, the highest eulogy, perhaps, which can be bestowed upon any author, is to say that he corrupted it. In our own language, Mr. Pope and Dr. Swift have each of them introduced a manner different from what was practiced before into all works that are written in rhyme, and one in long verses, the other in short, 
the quaintness of Butler has given place to the plainness of Swift, the rambling freedom of Dryden, and the correct but often tedious and prosaic languor of Addison are no longer the objects of imitation, but all long verses are now written after the manner of the nervous precision of Mr. Pope. Neither is it only over the productions of the arts that custom and fashion exert their dominion. They influence our judgments in the same manner with regard to the beauty of natural objects. What various and opposite forms are deemed beautiful in different species of things. The proportions which are admired in one animal are altogether different from those which are esteemed in another. Every class of things has its own peculiar conformation which is approved of and has a beauty of its own distinct from that of every other species. It is upon this account that a learned Jesuit, Father Buffier, has determined that the beauty of every object consists in that form and color which is most usual among things of that particular sort to which it belongs. Thus, in the human form, the beauty of each feature lies in a certain middle, equally removed from a variety of other forms that are ugly. A beautiful nose, for example, is one that is neither very long nor very short, very straight nor very crooked, but a sort of middle among all these extremes, and less different from any one of them than all of them are from one another. It is the form which nature seems to have aimed at in the mall, which, however, she deviates from in a great variety of ways and very seldom hits exactly, but to which all those deviations still bear a very strong resemblance. When a number of drawings are made after one pattern, though they may all miss it in some respects, yet they will all resemble it more than they resemble one another. The general character of the pattern will run through them all. The most singular and odd will be those which are most wide of it, and though very few will copy it exactly, yet the most accurate delineations will bear a greater resemblance to the most careless than the careless ones will bear to one another. In the same manner, in each species of creatures, what is most beautiful bears the strongest characters of the general fabric of the species, and has the strongest resemblance to the greatest part of the individuals with which it is classed. Monsters, on the contrary, or what is perfectly deformed, are always most singular and odd, and have the least resemblance to the generality of that species to which they belong. And thus the beauty of each species, though in one sense the rarest of all things, because few individuals hit this middle form exactly, yet in another it is the most common, because all the deviations from it resemble it more than they resemble one another. The most customary form, therefore, is in each species of things, according to him, the most beautiful, and hence it is that a certain practice and experience in contemplating each species of objects is requisite before we can judge of its beauty or know wherein the middle and most usual form consists. The nicest judgment concerning the beauty of the human species will not help us to judge of that of flowers or horses or any other species of things. It is for the same reason that in different climates and where different customs and ways of living take place, as the generality of any species receives a different conformation from those circumstances, so different ideas of its beauty prevail. The beauty of a Moorish is not exactly the same with that of an English horse. What different ideas are formed in different nations concerning the beauty of the human shape and countenance? A fair complexion is a shocking deformity upon the coast of Guinea. Thick lips and a flat nose are a beauty. In some nations, long ears that hang down upon the shoulders are the objects of universal admiration. In China, if a lady's foot is so large as to be fit to walk upon, she is regarded as a monster of ugliness. Some of the savage nations in North America tie four boards round the heads of their children and thus squeeze them, while the bones are tender and grisly, into a form that is almost perfectly square. Europeans are astonished at the absurd barbarity of this practice to which some missionaries have imputed the singular stupidity of those nations among whom it prevails. But when they condemn those savages, they do not reflect that the ladies in Europe had, till within these very few years, been endeavouring for near a century past to squeeze the beautiful roundness of their natural shape into a square form of the same kind, and that, notwithstanding the many distortions and diseases which this practice was known to occasion, custom had rendered it agreeable among some of the most civilized nations which perhaps the world ever beheld. 
such is the system of this learned and ingenuous father concerning the nature of beauty of which the whole charm according to him would thus seem to arise from its falling in with the habits which custom had impressed upon the imagination with regard to things of each particular kind i cannot however be induced to believe that our sense even of external beauty is founded altogether on custom the utility of any form its fitness for the useful purpose for which it was intended evidently recommends it and renders it agreeable to us independent of custom certain colors are more agreeable than others and give more delight to the eye the first time it ever beholds them a smooth surface is more agreeable than a rough one variety is more pleasing than a tedious undiversified uniformity connected variety in which each new appearance seems to be introduced by what went before it and in which all the adjoining parts seem to have some natural relation to one another is more agreeable than a disjointed and disorderly assemblage of unconnected objects but though i cannot admit that custom is the sole principle of beauty yet i can so far allow the truth of this ingenuous system as to grant that there is scarce any one external form so beautiful as to please if quite contrary to custom and unlike whatever we have been used to in that sort of particular species of things or so deformed as not to be agreeable if custom uniformity supports it and habituates us to see it in every single individual of the kind chapter two of the influence of custom and fashion upon moral sentiments since our sentiments concerning beauty of every kind are so much influenced by custom and fashion it cannot be expected that those concerning the beauty of conduct should be entirely exempted from the dominion of those principles their influence here however seems to be much less than everywhere else there is perhaps no form of external objects how absurd and fantastical soever to which our custom will not reconcile us or which fashion will not render even agreeable but the characteristics and conduct of a nero or a claudius are what no custom will ever reconcile us to what no fashion will ever render agreeable but the one will always be the object of dread and hatred the other of scorn and derision the principles of the imagination upon which our sense of beauty depends are of a very nice and delicate nature and may easily be altered by habit and education but the sentiments of moral approbation and disapprobation are founded on the strongest and most vigorous passions of human nature and though they may be somewhat warped cannot be entirely perverted but though the influence of custom and fashion upon moral sentiments is not altogether so great it is however perfectly similar to what it is everywhere else when custom and fashion coincide with the natural principles of right and wrong they heighten the delicacy of our sentiments and increase our abhorrence for everything which approaches to evil those who have been educated in what is really good company not in what is commonly called such who have been accustomed to see nothing in the persons whom they esteemed and lived with but justice modesty humanity and good order are more shocked with whatever seems to be inconsistent with the rules which those virtues prescribe those on the contrary who have had the misfortune to be brought up amidst violence licentiousness falsehood and injustice lose though not all sense of the impropriety of such conduct yet all sense of its dreadful enormity or of the vengeance and punishment due to it they have been familiarized with it from their infancy custom has rendered it habitual to them and they are very apt to regard it as what is called the way of the world something which either may or must be practiced to hinder us from being the dupes of our own integrity fashion too will sometimes give reputation to a certain degree of disorder and on the contrary discountenance qualities which deserve esteem in the reign of charles the second a degree of licentiousness was deemed the characteristic of a liberal education it was connected according to the notions of those times with generosity sincerity magnanimity loyalty and proved that the person who acted in this manner was a gentleman and not a puritan severity of manners and regularity of conduct on the other hand were altogether unfashionable and were connected in the imagination of that age with cant cunning hypocrisy and low manners to superficial minds the vices of the great seem at all times agreeable 
They connect them, not only with the splendor of fortune, but with the many superior virtues, which they ascribe to their superiors. With the spirit of freedom and independency, with frankness, generosity, humanity, and politeness. The virtue of the inferior ranks of people, on the contrary, their parsimonious frugality, their painful industry, and rigid adherence to rules, seem to them mean and disagreeable. They connect them, both with the meanness of the station, to which those qualities commonly belong, and with many great vices, which they suppose, usually accompany them, such as an abject, cowardly, ill-natured, lying, pilfering disposition. The objects with which men in different professions and states of life are conversant, being very different and habituating them to very different passions, naturally form in them very different characters and manners. We expect each rank and profession a degree of those manners which experience has taught us belong to it. But in each species of things we are particularly pleased with the middle confirmation, which in every part and feature agrees most exactly with the general standard which nature seems to have established for things of that kind. So in each rank, if I may say so, in each species of men, we are particularly pleased if they have neither too much nor too little of the character which usually accompanies a particular condition and situation. A man, we say, should look like his trade and profession. Yet the pedantry of every profession is disagreeable. The different periods of life have, for the same reason, different manners assigned to them. We expect in old age that gravity and sedateness, which its infirmities, its long experience, and its worn-out sensibility, seem to render both natural and respectable, and we lay our account to find in youth that sensibility, that gaiety and sprightly vivacity, which experience teaches us to expect from the lively impressions that all interesting objects are apt to make upon the tender and unpractised senses of that early period of life. Each of those two ages, however, may easily have too much of the peculiarities which belong to it. The flirting levity of youth and the immovable insensibility of old age are equally disagreeable. The young, according to the common saying, are most agreeable when their behavior is something of the manner of the old, and the old when they retain something of the gaiety of the young. Either of them, however, may easily have too much of the manners of the other. The extreme coldness and dual formality which are pardoned in old age make youth ridiculous. The levity, the carelessness, and the vanity which are indulged in youth render old age contemptible. The peculiar character and manners which we are led by custom to appropriate to each rank and profession have sometimes perhaps a propriety independent of custom and are what we should approve of for their own sakes if we took into consideration all the different circumstances which naturally affect those in each different state of life. The propriety of a person's behavior depends not upon its suitableness to any one circumstance of his station, but to all the circumstances which, when we bring his case home to ourselves, we feel should naturally call upon his attention. If he appears to be so much occupied by any one of them as entirely to neglect the rest, we disapprove of his conduct as something which we cannot entirely go along with, because not properly adjusted to all the circumstances of his situation, yet perhaps the emotion he expresses for the object which principally interests him does not exceed what we should entirely sympathize with and approve of, in one whose attention was not required by any other thing. A parent in private life might, upon the loss of an only son, express without blame a degree of grief and tenderness which would be unpardonable in a general at the head of an army, when glory and the public safety demanded so great a part of his attention, as different objects ought, upon common occasions, to occupy the attention of men of different professions, so different passions ought naturally to become habitual to them, and when we bring home to ourselves their situation in this particular respect, we must be sensible that every occurrence should naturally affect them more or less according as the emotion which it excites coincides or disagrees with that fixed habit and temper of their minds. We cannot expect the same sensibility to the gay pleasures and amusements of the life in a clergyman, which we lay our account with in an officer. The man whose peculiar occupation it is to keep the world in mind of that awful futurity 
which awaits them, who is to announce what may be the fatal consequences of every deviation from the rules of duty, and who is himself to set the example of the most exact conformity, seems to be the messenger of tidings, which cannot, in propriety, be delivered either with levity or indifference. His mind is supposed to be continually occupied with what is too grand and solemn, to leave any room for the impressions of those frivolous objects which fill up the attention of the dissipated and the gay. We readily feel, therefore, that independent of custom, there is a propriety in the manners which custom has allotted to this profession, and that nothing can be more suitable to the character of a clergyman than the grave, that austere and abstracted severity which we are habituated to expect in his behavior. These reflections are so very obvious that there is scarce any man so inconsiderate as not, at some time, to have made them, and to have accounted to himself in this manner for his approbation of the usual character of this order. The foundation of the customary character of some other professions is not so obvious, and our approbation of it is founded entirely in habit, without being either confirmed or enlivened by any reflections of this kind. We are led by custom, for example, to annex the character of gaiety, levity, and sprightly freedom, as well as some degree of dissipation, to the military profession. Yet if we were to consider what mood or tone of temper would be most suitable to this, we should be apt to determine, perhaps, that the most serious and thoughtful turn of mind would best become those whose lives are continually exposed to uncommon danger, and who should, therefore, be more constantly occupied with the thoughts of death and its consequences than other men. It is this very circumstance, however, which is not improbably the occasion why the contrary turn of mind prevails so much among men of this profession. It requires so great an effort to conquer the fear of death when we survey it with steadiness and attention that those who are constantly exposed to it find it easier to turn away their thoughts from it altogether, to wrap themselves up in careless security and indifference, and to plunge themselves for this purpose into every sort of amusement and dissipation. A camp is not the element of a thoughtful or a melancholy man. Persons of that caste, indeed, are often abundantly determined and are capable, by a great effort, of going on with inflexible resolution to the most unavoidable death. But to be exposed to continual, though less imminent danger, to be obliged to exert for a long time a degree of this effort, exhausts and depresses the mind, and renders it incapable of all happiness and enjoyment. The gay and careless, who have occasion to make no effort at all, who fairly resolve never to look before them, but to lose in continual pleasures and amusements all anxiety about their situation, more easily support such circumstances, whenever by any peculiar circumstances an officer has no reason to lay his account with being exposed to any uncommon danger, he is very apt to lose the gaiety and dissipated thoughtlessness of his character. The captain of a city guard is commonly as sober, careful, and penurious an animal as the rest of his fellow citizens. A long peace is, for the same reason, very apt to diminish the difference between the civil and the military character. The ordinary situation, however, of men of this profession renders gaiety and a degree of dissipation. So much their usual character and custom has, in our imagination, so strongly connected this character with this state of life, that we are very apt to despise any man whose peculiar humour or situation renders him incapable of acquiring it. We laugh at the grave and careful faces of a city guard which so little resemble those of their profession. They themselves seem often to be ashamed of the regularity of their own manners, and not to be out of the fashion of their trade, are fond of affecting that levity which is by no means natural to them. Whatever is the deportment which we have been accustomed to see in a respectable order of men, it comes to be associated in our imagination with that order that whenever we see the one, we lay our account that we are to meet the other, and when disappointed, miss something which we are expected to find. We are embarrassed and put to a stand, and know not how to address ourselves to a character which plainly affects to be of a different species from those which we should have been disposed to class it. The different situations of different ages and countries are apt, in the same manner, to give different characters to the generality of those who live in them, and their sentiments concerning the particular degree of each quality, 
that is either blamable or praiseworthy, according to that degree which is usual in their own country and in their own times, that degree of politeness which would be highly esteemed, perhaps would be thought effeminate adulation in Russia, would be regarded as rudeness and barbarism at the court of France, that degree of order and frugality which, in a Polish nobleman, would be considered as excessive parsimony, would be regarded as extravagance in a citizen of Amsterdam. Every age and country look upon that degree of each quality which is commonly to be met in those who are esteemed among themselves as the golden mean of that particular talent or virtue, and as this varies according as their different circumstances render different qualities more or less habitual to them, their sentiments concerning that exact propriety of character and behavior vary accordingly. Among civilized nations, the virtues which are founded upon humanity are more cultivated than those which are founded upon self-denial and the command of the passions. Among rude and barbarous nations, it is quite otherwise. The virtues of self-denial are more cultivated than those of humanity. The general security and happiness which prevail in ages of civility and politeness afford little exercise to the contempt of danger, to patience in enduring labor, hunger, and pain. Poverty may be easily avoided, and the contempt therefore almost ceases to be a virtue. The abstinence from pleasure becomes less necessary, and the mind is more at liberty to unbend itself, and to indulge its natural inclinations in all those particular respects. Among savages and barbarians it is quite otherwise. Every savage undergoes a sort of Spartan discipline, and by the necessity of his situation is inured to every sort of hardship. He is in continual danger. He is often exposed to the greatest extremities of hunger and frequently dies of pure want. His circumstances not only habituate him to every sort of distress, but teach him to give way to none of the passions which that distress is apt to excite. He can expect from his countrymen no sympathy or indulgence for such weakness. Before we can feel much for others, we must in some measure be at ease ourselves. If our own misery pinches us very severely, we have no leisure to attend to that of our neighbor, and all savages are too much occupied with their own wants and necessities to give much attention to those of another person. A savage, therefore, whatever be the nature of his distress, expects no sympathy from those about him, and disdains, upon that account, to expose himself, by allowing the least weakness to escape him. His passions, how furious and violent soever, are never permitted to disturb the serenity of his countenance or the composure of his conduct and behavior. The savages in North America, we are told, assume upon all occasions the greatest indifference, and would think themselves degraded if they should ever appear in any respect to be overcome either by love or grief or resentment. Their magnanimity and self-command in this respect are almost beyond the conception of Europeans. In a country in which all men or upon a level, with regard to rank and fortune, it might be expected that the mutual inclinations of the two parties should be the only thing considered in marriages, and should be indulged without any sort of control. This, however, is the country in which all marriages, without exception, are made up by the parents, and which a young man would think himself disgraced forever, if he showed the least preference of one woman above another, or did not express the most complete indifference both about the time when and the person to whom he was to be married. The weakness of love, which is so much indulged in ages of humanity and politeness, is regarded among savages as the most unpardonable effeminacy. Even after the marriage, the two parties seem to be ashamed of a connection which is founded upon so sordid a necessity. They do not live together. They see one another by stealth only. They continue to dwell in the houses of their respective fathers, and the open cohabitation of the two sexes, which is permitted without blame in the other countries, is here considered as the most indecent and unmanly sensuality. Nor is it only over this agreeable passion that they exert this absolute self-command. They often bear in the sight of all their countrymen with injuries, reproach, and the grossest insults, with the appearance of the greatest insensibility, and without expressing the smallest resentment. When a savage is made prisoner of war, and receives, as is usual, the sentence of death from his conquerors, he hears it without expressing any emotion, and afterwards submits to the most dreadful torments, without ever bemoaning himself, or discovering any other passion but contempt of his enemies. 
while he is hung by the shoulders over a slow fire, he derides his tormentors, and tells them how much more ingenuity he himself had tormented such of their countrymen as had befallen into his hands, after he has been scorched and burnt and lacerated in all the most tender and sensible parts of his body for several hours together, he is often allowed, in order to prolong his misery, a short respite, and is taken down from the stake. He employs his interval in talking upon all indifferent subjects, inquires after the news of the country, and seems indifferent about nothing but his own situation. The spectators express the same insensibility. The sight of so horrid an object seems to make no impression upon them. They scarce look at the prisoner, except when they lend a hand to torment him. At other times they smoke tobacco and amuse themselves with any common object, as if no such matter was going on. Every savage is said to prepare himself, from his earliest youth, for this dreadful end. He composes, for this purpose, what they call the Song of Death, a song which he is to sing when he has fallen into the hands of his enemies, and is expiring under the tortures which they inflict upon him. It consists of insults upon his tormentors, and expresses the highest contempt of pain and death. He sings this song upon all extraordinary occasions when he goes out to war, when he meets his enemies in the field, or whenever he has a mind to show that he has familiarized his imagination to the most dreadful misfortunes, and that no human event can daunt his resolution or alter his purpose. The same contempt of death and torture prevails among all other savage nations. There is not a negro from the coast of Africa who does not, in this respect, possesses a degree of magnanimity which the soul of his sordid master is too often scarce capable of conceiving. Fortune never exerted more cruelly her empire over mankind than when she subjected those nations of heroes to the refuse of the jails of Europe, to wretches who possess the virtue neither the countries which they come from, nor of those which they go to, and whose levity, brutality, and baseness so justly expose them to contempt of the vanquished. This heroic and unconquerable firmness, which the custom and education of his country demanded of every savage, is not required of those who are brought up to live in civilized societies. If these last complain when they are in pain, if they grieve when they are in distress, if they allow themselves either to be overcome by love or to be discomposed by anger, they are easily pardoned. Such weaknesses are not apprehended to affect the essential parts of their character, as long as they do not allow themselves to be transported to do anything contrary to justice or humanity, they lose but little reputation, though the serenity of their countenance or the composure of their discourse and behavior should be somewhat ruffled and disturbed. A humane and polished people who have more sensibility to the passions of others can readily enter into an animated and passionate behavior and can more easily pardon some little excess. The person principally concerned is sensible of this and being assured of the equity of his judges, indulges himself in stronger expressions of passion, and is less afraid of exposing himself to their contempt by the violence of his emotions. We can venture to express more emotion in the presence of a friend than in that of a stranger, because we expect more indulgence from that one than from the other. And in the same manner, the rules of decorum among civilized nations admit a more animated behavior than is approved among barbarians. The first converse together with the openness of friends. The second is the reverse of strangers. The emotions and vivacity with which the French and the Italians, the two most polished nations upon the continent, express themselves on all occasions that are at all interesting, surprise at first those strangers who happen to be traveling among them, and who, have been educated among a people of duller sensibility, cannot enter into this passionate behavior of which they had never seen any example of their own country. A young French nobleman will weep in the presence of the whole court upon being refused a regiment. An Italian, says the abbot de Boss, expresses more emotion on being condemned in a fine of twenty shillings than an Englishman on receiving the sentence of death. Cicero, in the times of the highest Roman politeness, could, without degrading himself, weep with all the bitterness of sorrow in the sight of the whole senate and the whole people, as it is evident he must have done in the end of almost every oration. The orators of the earlier and ruder ages of Rome could not probably, consistent with the manners of the times, have expressed themselves with such emotion. It would have been regarded, I suppose, as a violation of nature and propriety in the Scipios, in the Leliusus, and in the elder Cato, to have exposed so much tenderness 
to the view of the public. Those ancient warriors could express themselves with order, gravity, and good judgment, but are said to have been strangers to that sublime and passionate eloquence which was first introduced into Rome, not many years before the birth of Cicero, by the two Gracchi, by Crassus and Sulpitius. This animated eloquence, which has been long practiced, with or without success, both in France and Italy, is but just beginning to be introduced into England. So wide is the difference between the degrees of self-command which are required in civilized and barbarous nations, and by such different standards do they nudge of the propriety of behavior. This difference gives occasion to many others that are not essential, a polished people being accustomed to give way in some measure to the movements of nature, become frank, open, and sincere. Barbarians, on the contrary, being obliged to smother and conceal the appearance of every passion, necessarily acquires the habits of falsehood and dissimulation. It is observed by all those who have been conversant with savage nations, whether in Asia, Africa, or America, that they are all equally impenetrable, and that, when they have a mind to conceal the truth, no examination is capable of drawing it from them. They cannot be trepanned by the most artful questions. The torture itself is incapable of making them confess anything which they have no mind to tell. The passions of a savage, too, though they never express themselves by any outward emotion, but lie concealed in the breast of the sufferer, are, notwithstanding, all mounted of the highest pitch of fury. Though he seldom shows any symptoms of anger, yet his vengeance, when he comes to give way to it, is always sanguinary and dreadful. The least affront drives him to despair. His countenance and disclosure, indeed, are still sober and composed, and express nothing but the most perfect tranquillity of mind. But his actions are often the most frivolous and violent. Among the North Americans, it is not uncommon for persons of the tenderest age and more fearful sex to drown themselves upon receiving only a slight reprimand from their mothers, and this too without expressing any passion or saying anything, except you shall no longer have a daughter. In civilized nations, the passions of men are not commonly so furious or so desperate. They are often clamorous and noisy, but are seldom very hurtful, and seem frequently to aim at no other satisfaction but that of convincing the spectator that they are in the right to be so much more moved, and of procuring his sympathy and approbation. All these effects of custom and fashion, however, upon the moral sentiments of mankind, are inconsiderable in comparison of those which they give occasion to in some other cases, and in not concerning the general style of character and behavior that those principles produce the greatest perversion of judgment, but concerning the propriety or impropriety of particular usages, the different manners which custom teaches us to approve of in the different professions and states of life do not concern things of the greatest importance. We expect truth and justice from an old man as well as from a young, from a clergyman as well as from an officer, and it is in matters of small moment only that we look for the distinguishing marks of their respective characters. With regard to these two, there is often some unobserved circumstance which, if it was attended to, would show us that, independent of custom, there was a propriety in the character which custom had taught us to allot to each profession. We cannot complain, therefore, in this case, that the perversion of natural sentiment is very great, though the manners of different nations require different degrees of the same quality in the character which they think worthy of esteem. Yet the worst that can be said to happen even here is that the duties of one virtue are sometimes extended so as to encroach a little upon the precincts of some other. The rustic hospitality that in fashion among the Poles encroaches perhaps a little upon economy and good order, and the frugality that is esteemed in Holland upon generosity and good fellowship, the hardiness demanded of savages diminishes their humanity and perhaps the delicate sensibility required in civilized nations sometimes destroys the masculine firmness of the character. In general, the style of manners which takes place in any nation may commonly upon the whole be said to be that which is most suitable to its situation. Hardiness is the character most suitable to the circumstances of a savage, sensibility to those of one who lives in a very civilized society. Even here, therefore, we cannot complain that the moral sentiments of men are very grossly perverted. It is not, therefore, in the general style of conduct or behavior that custom authorizes the widest departure from what is the natural propriety of action. 
with regard to particular usages, its influence is often much more destructive of good morals and is capable of establishing as lawful and blameless particular actions which shock the plainest principles of right and wrong. Can there be greater barbarity, for example, than to hurt an infant? Its helplessness, its innocence, its amiableness call forth the compassion, even of an enemy, and not to spare that tender age is regarded as the most furious effort of an enraged and cruel conqueror. What then should we imagine must be the heart of a parent who could injure that weakness, which even a furious enemy is afraid to violate? Yet the exposition, that is, the murder of newborn infants, was a practice allowed in almost all the states of Greece, even among the polite and civilized Athenians, and whenever the circumstances of the parent rendered it inconvenient to bring up the child, to abandon it to hunger, or to wild beasts, was regarded without blame or censure. This practice had probably begun in times of the most savage barbarity, the imaginations of men had been first made familiar with it in that earliest period of society, and the uniform continuance of the custom had hindered them afterwards from perceiving its enormity. We find at this day that this practice prevails among all savage nations, and in that rudest and lowest state of society it is undoubtedly more pardonable than in any other. The extreme indigence of a savage is often such that he himself is frequently exposed to the greatest extremity of hunger. He often dies of pure want, and is frequently impossible for him to support both himself and his child. We cannot wonder, therefore, that in this case he should abandon it. One who, in flying from an enemy, who it is impossible to resist, should throw down his infant because it retarded his flight, would surely be excusable, since by attempting to save it, he could only hope for the consolation of dying with it. That in this state of society, therefore, a parent should be allowed to judge whether he can bring up his child ought not to surprise us so greatly. In the latter ages of Greece, however, the same thing was permitted from views of remote interest or conveniency, which could by no means excuse it. Uninterrupted custom had by this time so thoroughly authorized the practice that not only the loose maxims of the world tolerated this barbarous prerogative, but even the doctrine of philosophers, which ought to have been more just and accurate, was led away by the established custom, and upon this, as upon many other occasions, instead of censuring, supported the horrible abuse by far-fetched considerations of public utility. Aristotle talks of it as of what the magistrate ought upon many occasions to encourage. The humane Plato is of the same opinion, and with all that love of mankind, which seems to animate all his writings, nowhere marks this practice with disapprobation. When custom can give sanction to so dreadful a violation of humanity, we may well imagine that there is scarce any particular practice so gross which it cannot authorize. Such a thing we hear men every day saying is commonly done, and they seem to think this is a sufficient apology for what, in itself, is the most unjust and unreasonable conduct. There is an obvious reason why custom should never pervert our senses with regard to the general style and character of conduct and behavior, in the same degree as with regard to the propriety or unlawfulness of particular usages. There never can be any such custom. No society could subsist a moment in the usual strain of men's conduct and behavior was of a piece with the horrible practice I have just now mentioned. Part 6. Of the Character of Virtue Introduction. When we consider the character of any individual, we naturally view it under two different aspects. First, as it may affect his own happiness, and secondly, as it may affect that of other people. Section 1. Of the character of the individual, so far as it affects his own happiness or of prudence. The preservation and the healthful state of the body seems to be the object which nature first recommends to the care of every individual. The appetites of hunger and thirst, the agreeable or disagreeable sensations of pleasure and pain, of heat and cold, etc., may be considered as lessons delivered by the voice of nature herself, directing man at what he ought to choose and what he ought to avoid. For this purpose, the first lesson which he is taught by those to whom his childhood is entrusted tend the greater part of them to the same purpose. Their principal object is to teach him how to keep out of harm's way. As he grows up, he soon learns that some care and foresight are necessary for providing the means of gratifying those natural appetites 
of procuring pleasure and avoiding pain, of procuring the agreeable and avoiding the disagreeable temperature of heat and cold. In the proper direction of this care and foresight consists the art of preserving and increasing what is called his external fortune. Though it is in order to supply the necessities and conveniencies of the body that the advantages of external fortune are originally recommended to us, yet we cannot live long in the world without perceiving that the respects of our equals, our credit, and rank in the society we live in depend very much upon the degree in which we possess, or are supposed to possess those advantages. The desire of becoming the proper objects of this respect, of deserving and obtaining this credit, and rank among our equals, is perhaps the strongest of all our desires, and our anxiety to obtain the advantages of fortune is accordingly much more excited and irritated by this desire than by that of supplying all the necessities and conveniencies of the body, which are always very easily supplied. Our rank and credit among our equals, too, depend very much upon what perhaps a virtuous man would wish them to depend entirely our character and conduct, or upon the confidence, esteem, and good will which these naturally excite in the people we live with. The care of the health, of the fortune, and the rank and reputation of the individual, the objects upon which his comfort and happiness in this life are supposed principally to depend, is considered as the proper business of that virtue which is commonly called prudence. We suffer more, it has already been observed, when we fall from a better to a worse situation than we ever enjoy when we rise from a worse to a better. Security, therefore, is the first and the principal object of prudence. It is averse to expose our health, our fortune, our rank, or reputation to any sort of hazard. It is rather cautious than enterprising, and more anxious to preserve the advantages which we already possess, than for to prompt us to the acquisition of still greater advantages. The methods of improving our fortune, which it principally recommends to us, are those which exposes no loss or hazard. Real knowledge and skill in our trade or profession, assiduity and industry in the exercise of it, frugality and even some degree of parsimony in all our expenses. The prudent man always studies seriously and earnestly to understand whatever he professes to understand, and not merely to persuade other people that he understands it. And though his talents may not always be very brilliant, they are always perfectly genuine. He neither endeavors to impose upon you by the cunning devices of an artful impostor, nor by the arrogant airs of an assuming pedant, nor by the confident assertions of a superficial and imprudent pretender. He is not ostentatious, even of the abilities which he really possesses. His conversation is simple and modest, and he is averse to all the quackish arts by which other people so frequently thrust themselves into public notice and reputation. For reputation in his profession, he is naturally disposed to rely a good deal upon the solidity of his knowledge and abilities, and he does not always think of cultivating the favor of those little clubs and cabals, who, in the superior arts and sciences, so often erect themselves in the supreme judges of merit, and who make it their business to celebrate the talents and virtues of one another, and to decry whatever can come into competition with them. If he ever connects himself with any society of this kind, it is merely in self-defense, not with a view to impose upon the public, but to hinder the public from being imposed upon to his disadvantage by the clamors, the whispers, or the intrigues, either of that particular society or of some other of the same kind. The prudent man is always sincere, and feels horror at the very thought of exposing himself to the disgrace which attends upon the detection of falsehood. But though always sincere, he is not always frank and open, and though he never tells anything but the truth, he does not always think himself bound, when not properly called upon to tell the whole truth. As he is cautious in his actions, so is he reserved in his speech, and never rashly or unnecessarily obtrudes his opinion concerning either things or persons. The prudent man, not always distinguished by the most exquisite sensibility, is always very capable of friendship, but his friendship is not that ardent and passionate, but too often transitory affection, which appears so delicious to the generosity of youth and inexperience. It is a sedate, but steady and faithful attachment to a few well-tried and well-chosen companions, in the choice of whom he is not guided by the giddy admiration of shining accomplishments, but by the sober esteem of modesty, discretion, and good conduct. But though capable of friendship, he is not always much disposed to general sociality. He rarely frequents, 
and more rarely figures in those convivial societies which are distinguished for the jollity and gaiety of their conversation. Their way of life might too often interfere with the regularity of his temperance, might interrupt the steadiness of his industry, or break in upon the strictness of his frugality. But though his conversation may not always be very sprightly or diverting, it is always perfectly inoffensive. He hates the thought of being guilty of any petulance or rudeness. He never assumes impertinently over anybody, and, upon all common occasions, is willing to place himself rather below than above his equals. Both in his conduct and conversation, he is an exact observer of decency, and respects with an and respects with an almost religious scrupulosity all the established decorums and ceremonials of society, and in this respect he sets a much better example than has frequently been done by men of much more splendid talents and virtues, who in all ages, from that of Socrates and Aristippus down to that of Dr. Swift and Voltaire, and from that of Philip and Alexander the Great, down to that of the great Tsar Peter of Moscovy, have too often distinguished themselves by the most improper and even insolent contempt of all the ordinary decorums of life and conversation, and who have, thereby, set the most pernicious example to those who wish to resemble them, and who too often content themselves with imitating their follies, without even attempting to attain their perfections. In the steadiness of his industry and frugality, in his steadily sacrificing the ease and enjoyment of the present moment for the probable expectation of the still greater ease and enjoyment of a more distant but more lasting period of time. The prudent man is always both supported and rewarded by the entire approbation of the impartial spectator and of the representative of the impartial spectator, the man within the breast. The impartial spectator does not feel himself worn out by the present labor of those whose conduct he surveys, nor does he feel himself solicited by the importunate calls of their present appetites. To him their present and what is likely to be their future situation are very nearly the same. He sees them nearly at the same distance and is affected by them very nearly in the same manner. He knows, however, that to the persons principally concerned, they are very far from being the same and that they naturally affect them in a very different manner. He cannot therefore but approve and even applaud that proper exertion of self-command which enables them to act as if their present and future situation affected them nearly in the same manner in which they affect him. The man who lives within his income is naturally contented with this situation, which by continual, though small accumulations, is growing better and better every day. He is enabled gradually to relax, both in the rigor of his parsimony and in the severity of his application, and he feels with double satisfaction this gradual increase of ease and enjoyment from having felt before the hardship which attended the want of them. He has no anxiety to change so comfortable a situation, and does not go in quest of new enterprises and adventures, which might endanger, but could not well increase the secure tranquility which he actually enjoys. If he enters into any new projects or enterprises, they are likely to be well concerted and well prepared. He can never be hurried or drove into them by any necessity, but has always time and leisure to deliberate soberly and coolly concerning what are likely to be their consequences. The prudent man is not willing to subject himself to any responsibility which his duty does not impose upon him. He is not a bustler in business where he has no concern, is not a meddler in other people's affairs, is not a professed counsellor or advisor who obtrudes his advice where nobody is asking it. He confines himself, as much as his duty will permit, to his own affairs and has no taste for that foolish importance which many people wish to derive from appearing to have some influence in the management of those other people. He is averse to enter into any party disputes, hates faction, and is not always very forward to listen to the voice even of noble and great ambition. When distinctly called upon, he will not decline the service of his country, but he will knock a ball in order to force himself into it and would be much better pleased that the public business were well managed by some other person than that he himself should have the trouble and incur the responsibility of managing it. In the bottom of his heart, he would prefer the undisturbed enjoyment of secure tranquility, not only to all the vain splendor of successful ambition, but to the real and solid glory of performing the greatest and most magnanimous actions. Prudence, in short, when directed merely to the care of the health of the fortune 
and of the rank and reputation of the individual, though it is regarded as most respectable, and even in some degree, as an amiable and agreeable quality, yet it never is considered as one, either of the most endearing or the most ennobling of the virtues. It commands a certain cold esteem, but seems not entitled to any very ardent love or admiration. Wise and judicious conduct, when directed to greater and nobler purposes than the care of the health, the fortune, the rank and reputation of the individual, is frequently and very properly called prudence. We talk of the prudence of the great general, of the great statesman, of the great legislator. Prudence is, in all these cases, combined with the many greater and more splendid virtues with valor, with extensive and strong benevolence, with a sacred regard to the rules of justice, and all these supported by a proper degree of self-command. This superior prudence, when carried to the highest degree of perfection, necessarily supposes the art, the talent, and the habit or disposition of acting with the most perfect propriety in every possible circumstance and situation. It necessarily supposes the utmost perfection of all the intellectual and all the moral virtues. It is the best head joined to the best heart. It is the most perfect wisdom combined with the most perfect virtue. It constitutes very nearly the character of the academical or peripatetic sage, as the inferior prudence does of that epicurean. Mere imprudence, or the mere want of the capacity to take care of oneself, is, with the generous and humane, the object of compassion, with those of less delicate sentiments, of neglect, or, at worst, of contempt, but never of hatred or indignation. When combined with other vices, however, it aggravates, in the highest degree, the infamy and disgrace which would otherwise attend them. The artful knave, whose dexterity and address exempt him, though not from the strong suspicions, yet from punishment or distinct detection, is too often received in the world with an indulgence which he by no means deserves. The awkward and foolish one, who, for want of this dexterity and address, is convicted and brought to punishment, is the object of universal hatred, contempt, and derision. In countries where great crimes frequently pass unpunished, the most atrocious actions become almost familiar, and cease to impress the people with that horror which is universally felt in countries where an exact administration of justice takes place. The injustice is the same in both countries, but the imprudence is often very different. In the latter, great crimes are evidently great follies. In the former, they are not always considered as such. In Italy, during the greater part of the 16th century, assassinations, murders, and even murders under trust seem to have been almost familiar among the superior ranks of people. Caesar Borgia invited four of the little princes in his neighborhood who all possessed little sovereignties and commanded little armies of their own to a friendly conference at Senegaglia, where as soon as they arrived, he put them all to death. This infamous action, though certainly not approved of even in that age of crimes, seems to have contributed very little to the discredit and not in the least to the ruin of the perpetrator. That ruin happened a few years after from causes altogether disconnected with this crime. Machiavelli, not indeed a man of the nicest morality, even for his own times, was resident as minister from the Republic of Florence at the court of Caesar Borgia when the crime was committed. He gives a very particular account of it, and in that pure, elegant, and simple language which distinguishes all his writings, he talks of it very coolly, is pleased with the address, while Caesar Borgia conducted it, has much contempt for the dubbery and weakness of the sufferers, but no compassion for their miserable and untimely death and no sort of indignation at the cruelty and falsehood of their murderer. The violence and injustice of great conquerors are often regarded with foolish wonder and admiration. Those of petty thieves, robbers, and murderers, with contempt, hatred, and even horror, upon all occasions. The former, though they are a hundred times more mischievous and destructive, yet when successful, they often pass for deeds of the most heroic magnanimity, the latter are always viewed with hatred and aversion, as the follies as well as the crimes of the lowest and most worthless of mankind. The injustice of the former is certainly, at least, as great as that of the latter. But the folly and imprudence are not near so great. A wicked and worthless man of parts often goes through the world with much more credit than he deserves. A wicked and worthless fool appears always, of all mortals, the most hateful as well as the most contemptible. As prudence combined with other virtues constitutes the noblest, so imprudence 
combined with other vices, constitutes the vilest of characters. Section 2. Of the character of the individual, so far as it can affect the happiness of other people. Introduction. The character of every individual, so far as it can affect the happiness of other people, must do so by its disposition either to hurt or to benefit them. Proper resentment for injustice attempted, or actually committed, is the only motive which, in the eyes of the impartial spectator, can justify our hurting or disturbing in any respect the happiness of our neighbor. To do so from any other motive is itself a violation of the laws of justice, which force ought to be employed either to restrain or to punish. The wisdom of every state or commonwealth endeavors as well as it can to employ the force of the society to restrain those who are subject to its authority from hurting or distributing the happiness to one another. The rules which it establishes for this purpose constitute the civil and criminal law of each particular state or country. The principles upon which those rules either are or ought to be founded are the subject of a particular science, of all sciences by far the most important, but hitherto, perhaps, the least cultivated, that of natural jurisprudence, concerning which it belongs not to our present subject to enter into any detail. A sacred and religious regard, not to hurt or disturb in any respect the happiness of our neighbor, even in those cases where no law can properly protect him, constitutes the character of the perfectly innocent and just man. A character which, when carried to a certain delicacy of attention, is always highly respectable and even vulnerable for its own sake, and can scarce ever fail to be accompanied with many other virtues, with feeling great for other people, with great humanity and great benevolence. It is a character sufficiently understood and requires no further explanation. In the present section, I shall only endeavor to explain the foundation of that order which nature seems to have traced out for the distribution of our good offices, or for the direction and employment of our very limited powers of beneficence, first towards individuals and second towards societies. The same unerring wisdom, it will be found, which regulates every other part of her conduct, directs in this respect too the order of her recommendations which are always stronger or weaker in proportion as our beneficence is more or less necessary or can be more or less useful. Chapter 1. Of the order in which individuals are recommended by nature to our care and attention. Every man, as the Stoics used to say, is first and principally recommended to his own care, and every man is certainly, in every respect, fitter and abler to take care of himself than any other person. Every man feels his own pleasures and his own pains more sensibly than that of other people. The former are the original sensations, the latter the reflected or sympathetic images of those sensations. The former may be said to be the substance, the latter the shadow. After himself, the members of his own family, those who usually live in the same house with him, his parents, his children, his brothers and sisters, are naturally the objects of his warmest affections. They are naturally and usually the persons upon whose happiness or misery his conduct must have the greatest influence. He is more habituated to sympathize with them. He knows better how everything is likely to affect them, and his sympathy with them is more precise and determinate than it can be with the greater part of other people. It approaches nearer, in short, to what he feels for himself. This sympathy too, and the affections which are founded on it, are, by nature, more strongly directed towards his children than towards his parents, and his tenderness for the former seems generally a more active principle than his reverence and gratitude towards the latter. In the natural state of things, it has already been observed the existence of the child, for sometimes after it comes into the world, depends altogether upon the care of the parent, that of the parent does not naturally depend upon the care of the child. In the eye of nature, it would seem, a child is more important object than an old man. It excites a much more lively, as well as a much more universal sympathy. It ought to do so. Everything may be expected, or at least hoped, from the child. In ordinary cases, very little can be either expected or hoped from from the old man. The weakness of childhood interests, the affections of the most brutal and hard-hearted. It is only the virtuous and humane that the infirmities of old age are not objects of contempt and aversion. In ordinary cases, an old man dies without being much regretted by anybody. Scarce a child can die without rendering asunder the heart of somebody. 
The earliest friendships, the friendships which are naturally contracted when the heart is most susceptible of that feeling, are those among brothers and sisters. Their good agreement, while they remain in the same family, is necessary for its tranquility and happiness. They are capable of giving more pleasure or pain to one another than to the greater part of other people. Their situation renders the mutual sympathy of the utmost importance to their common happiness, and by the wisdom of nature, the same situation, by obliging them to accommodate to one another, renders that sympathy more habitual and thereby more lively, more distinct, and more determinate. The children of brothers and sisters are naturally connected by the friendship which, after separating into different families, continues to take place between their parents. Their good agreement improves the enjoyment of that friendship. Their discord would disturb it. As they seldom live in the same family, however, though of more importance to one another than to the greater part of other people, they are of much less brothers and sisters. As their mutual sympathy is less necessary, so it is less habitual, and therefore proportionably weaker. The children of cousins, being still less connected, are of still less importance to one another, and the affection gradually diminishes as the relation grows more and more remote. What is called affection is in reality nothing but habitual sympathy, our concern in the happiness or misery of those who are the objects of what we call our affections, our desire to promote the one and to prevent the other, are either the actual feeling of the habitual sympathy or the necessary consequences of that feeling, relations being usually placed in situations which naturally create this habitual sympathy. It is expected that this suitable degree of affection should take place among them. We generally find that it actually does not take place. We therefore naturally expect that it should, and we are, upon that account, more shocked when upon any occasion we find that it does not. The general rule is established that persons related to one another in a certain degree ought always to be affected toward one another in a certain manner, and that there is always the highest impropriety and sometimes even a sort of impiety in their being affected in a different manner. A parent without parental tenderness, a child devoid of all filial reverence, appear monsters, the objects not of hatred only, but of horror. Though in a particular instance, the circumstances which usually produce those natural affections, as they are called, may by some accident not have taken place, yet respect for the general rule will frequently, in some measure, supply their place, and produce something which, though not altogether the same, may bear, however, a very considerable resemblance to those affections. A father is apt to be less attached to a child who, by some accident, has been separated from him in its infancy, and who does not return to him till it is grown up to manhood. The father is apt to feel less paternal tenderness for the child, the child less filial reverence for the father. Brothers and sisters, when they have been educated in distant countries, are apt to feel a similar diminution of affection. With the dutiful and virtuous, however, respect for the general rule will frequently produce something which, though by no means the same, yet may very much resemble those natural affections. Even during the separation, the father and the child, the brother or the sisters, are by no means indifferent to one another. They all consider one another as persons, to and from whom certain affections are due, and they live in the hopes of being some time or another in a situation to enjoy that friendship which ought naturally to have taken place among persons so nearly connected. Till they meet, the absent son, the absent brother, are frequently the favorite son, the favorite brother. They have never offended, nor if they have, it is so long ago that the offense is forgotten, as some childish trick not worth the remembering. Every account they have heard of one another, if conveyed by people of any tolerable good nature, has been, in the highest degree, flattering and favorable. The absent son, the absent brother, is not like the ordinary sons and brothers, but an all-perfect son, an all-perfect brother. And the most romantic hopes are entertained of the happiness to be enjoyed in the friendship and conversation of such persons. When they meet, it is often with so strong a disposition to conceive that habitual sympathy which constitutes the family affection, that they are very apt to fancy they have actually conceived it, and to behave to one another as if they had. Time and experience, however, I am afraid, too frequently undeceive them. Upon a more familiar acquaintance, they frequently discover in one another habits, humors, and inclinations, different from what they expected, to which, from want of habitual sympathy, 
from want of the real principle and foundation of what is properly called family affection. They cannot now easily accommodate themselves. They have never lived in the situation which almost necessarily forces that easy accommodation. And though they may now be sincerely desirous to assume it, they have really become incapable of doing so. Their familiar conversation and intercourse soon become less pleasing to them, and upon that account less frequent. They may continue to live with one another in the mutual exchange of essential good offices, and with every other external appearance of decent regard, but that cordial satisfaction, that delicious sympathy, that confidential openness and ease, which naturally take place in the conversation of those who have lived long and familiarly with one another, it seldom happens that they can completely enjoy. It is only, however, with the dutiful and the virtuous that the general rule has even this slender authority. With the dissipated, the profligate, and the vain, it is entirely disregarded. They are so far from respecting it that they seldom talk of it, but with the most indecent derision, and an early and long separation of this kind never fails to estrange them most completely from one another. With such persons, respect for the general rule can at best produce only a cold and affected civility, a very slender semblance of real regard. And even this, the slightest offense, the smallest opposition of interest, commonly puts an end to altogether. The education of boys at distant great schools, of young men at distant colleges, of young ladies in distant nunneries and boarding schools, seems in the higher ranks of life to have hurt most essentially the domestic morals, and consequently the domestic happiness, both of France and England. Do you wish to educate your children to be dutiful to their parents, to be kind and affectionate to their brothers and sisters, put them under necessity of being dutiful children and being kind and affectionate brothers and sisters, educate them in your own house. From their parents' house, they may, with propriety and advantage, go out every day to attend public schools, but let their dwelling be always at home. Respect for you must always impose a very useful restraint upon their conduct, and respect for them may frequently impose no useless restraint upon your own. Surely no acquirement which can possibly be derived from what is called a public education can make any sort of compensation for what is almost certainly and necessarily lost by it. Domestic education is the institution of nature. Public education, the contrivance of man, it is surely unnecessary to say, which is likely to be the wisest. In some tragedies and romances, we meet with many beautiful and interesting scenes, founded upon what is called the force of blood, or upon the wonderful affection which near relations are supposed to conceive for one another, even before they know that they have such a connection. This force of blood, however, I am afraid, exists nowhere but in tragedies and romances. Even in tragedies and romances, it is never supposed to take place between any relations, but those who are naturally bred up in the same house, between parents and children, between brothers and sisters, to imagine any such mysterious affection between cousins or even between aunts and uncles and nephews or nieces would be too ridiculous. In pastoral countries and in all countries where the authority of law is not alone sufficient to give perfect security to every member of the state, all the different branches of the same family commonly choose to live in the neighborhood of one another. Their association is frequently necessary for their common defense. They are all, from the highest to the lowest, of the more or less importance to one another. Their concord strengthens their necessary association, their discord always weakens and might destroy it. They have more intercourse with one another than with the members of any other tribe. The remotest members of the same tribe claim some connection with one another, and, where all other circumstances are equal, expect to be treated with more distinguished attention than is due to those who have no such pretensions. It is not many years ago that in the highlands of Scotland, the chieftain used to consider the poorest man of his clan as his cousin and relation. The same extensive regard to kindred is said to take place among the Tartars, the Arabs, and the Turkmans, and, I believe, among all other nations who are nearly in the same state of society in which the Scots Highlanders were about the beginning of the present century. In commercial countries where the authority of law is always perfectly sufficient to protect the meanest man in the state, the descendants of the same family have no such motive for keeping together, naturally separate and disperse as interest or inclination may direct. 
they soon cease to be of importance to one another, and in a few generations not only lose all care about one another, but all remembrance of their common origin, and of the connection which took place among their ancestors. Regard for remote relations becomes, in every country, less and less, according as this state of civilization has been longer and more completely established. It has been longer and more completely established in England than in Scotland, and remote relations are, accordingly, more considered in the latter country than in the former, though in this respect the difference between the two countries is growing less and less every day. Great lords, indeed, are in every country proud of remembering and acknowledging their connection with one another, however remote. The remembrance of such illustrious relations flatters not a little the family pride of them all, and it is neither the affection nor from anything which resembles affection, but from the most frivolous and childish of all vanities, that this remembrance is so carefully kept up. Should some more humble, though perhaps much nearer kinsman, presume to put such great men in mind of his relation to their family, they seldom fail to tell them that they are bad genealogists, and miserably ill-informed concerning their own family history. It is not in that order, I am afraid, that we are to expect any extraordinary extension of what is called natural affection. I consider what is called natural affection as the more the effect of the moral than of the supposed physical connection between the parent and the child. A jealous husband, indeed, notwithstanding the moral connection, notwithstanding the child's having been educated in his own house, often regards with hatred and aversion that unhappy child which he supposes to be the offspring of his wife's infidelity. It is the lasting monument of a most disagreeable adventure, of his own dishonor, and of the disgrace of his family. Among well-disposed people, the necessity or conveniency of mutual accommodation, which very frequently produces a friendship, not unlike that which takes place among those who are born to live in the same family. Colleagues in office, partners in trade, call one another brothers, and frequently feel towards one another as if they really were so. Their good agreement is an advantage to all, and if they are tolerably reasonable people, they are naturally disposed to agree. We expect that they should do so, and their disagreement is a sort of small scandal. The Romans expressed this sort of attachment by the word necessitudo, which from the etymology seems to denote that it was imposed by the necessity of the situation. Even the trifling circumstances of living in the same neighborhood has some effect of the same kind. We respect the face of a man whom we see every day, provided he has never offended us. Neighbors can be very convenient and they can be very troublesome to one another. If they are good sort of people, we are naturally disposed to agree. We expect their good agreement and to be a bad neighbor is a very bad character. There are certain small good offices, accordingly, which are universally allowed to be due to a neighbor in preference to any other person who has no such connection. This natural disposition to accommodate and assimilate as much as we can our own sentiments, principles, and feelings to those which we see fixed and rooted in the persons whom we are obliged to live and converse a great deal with is a good cause of the contagious effects of both good and bad company. The man who associates chiefly with the wise and virtuous, though he may not himself become either wise or virtuous, cannot help conceiving a certain respect at least for wisdom and virtue, and the man who associates chiefly with the profligate and the dissolute, though he may not himself become profligate and dissolute, must soon lose at least all his original abhorrence of profligacy and dissolution of manners. The similarity of family characters, which we so frequently see transmitted through several successive generations, may, perhaps, be partly owing to this disposition, to assimilate ourselves to those whom we are obliged to live and converse a great deal with. The family character, however, like the family countenance, seems to be owing, not altogether to be moral, but partly too, to the physical connection. The family countenance is certainly altogether owing to the latter. But of all the attachments to an individual, that which is founded altogether upon the esteem and approbation of his good conduct and behavior, confirmed by much experience and long acquaintance, is, by far, the most respectable. Such friendships arising, not from a constrained sympathy, not from a sympathy which has been assumed and rendered habitual for the sake of conveniency and accommodation, but from a natural sympathy, from an involuntary feeling, that the persons to whom we attach ourselves are the natural and proper objects of esteem and approbation. 
can exist only among men of virtue. Men of virtue only can feel that entire confidence in the conduct and behavior of one another, which can, at all times, assure them that they can never either offend or be offended by one another. Vice is always capricious. Virtue only is regular and orderly. The attachment which is founded upon the love of virtue, as it is certainly, of all attachments, the most virtuous, so it is likewise the happiest, as well as the most permanent and secure. Such friendships need not be confined to a single person, but may safely embrace all the wise and virtuous, with whom we have been long and intimately acquainted, and upon whose wisdom and virtue we can, upon that account, entirely depend. They who would confine friendship to two persons seems to be confounded to the wise security of friendship with the jealousy and folly of love. The hasty, fond, and foolish intimacies of young people founded commonly upon some slight similarity of character altogether unconnected with good conduct, upon a taste, perhaps, for the same studies, the same amusements, the same diversions, or upon their agreement in some singular principle or opinion not commonly adopted. Those intimacies which a freak begins and which a freak puts an end to, how agreeable soever they may appear, while they last, can by no means deserve the sacred and honorable name of friendship. Of all the persons, however, whom nature points out for our peculiar beneficence, there are none to whom it seems more properly directed than to those whose beneficence we have ourselves already experienced. Nature, which formed men for that mutual kindness so necessary for their happiness, renders every man the peculiar object of kindness to the person to whom he himself has been kind. Though their gratitude should not always correspond to his beneficence, yet the sense of his merit, the sympathetic gratitude of the impartial spectator, will always correspond to it. The general indignation of other people against the baseness of their ingratitude will even sometimes increase the general sense of his merit. No benevolent man has ever lost altogether the fruits of his benevolence, if he does not always gather them from the person from whom he had ought to have gathered them. He seldom fails to gather them and with a tenfold increase from other people. Kindness is the parent of kindness, and if to be beloved by our brethren be the great object of our ambition, the surest way of obtaining it is by our conduct to show that we really love them. After the persons who are recommended to our beneficence, either by their connection with ourselves, by their personal qualities, or by their past services, come those who are pointed out, not indeed to what is called our friendship, but our benevolent attention and good offices, those who are distinguished by their extraordinary situation, the greatly fortunate and the greatly unfortunate, the rich and the powerful, the poor and the wretched, the distinction of ranks, the peace and order of the society, are in a great measure founded upon the respect which we naturally conceive for the former. The relief and consolation of human misery depend altogether upon our compassion for the latter. The peace and order of society is of more importance than even the relief of the miserable. Our respect for the great, accordingly, is most apt to offend by its excess, our fellow feeling for the miserable by its defect. Moralists exhort us to charity and compassion. They warn us against the fascination of greatness. This fascination, indeed, is so powerful that the rich and great are too often preferred to the wise and the virtuous. Nature has wisely judged that distinction of ranks the peace and order of society would rest more securely upon the plain and palpable difference of birth and fortune than upon the indivisible and often uncertain differences of wisdom and virtue. The undistinguishing eyes of the great mob of mankind can well enough perceive the former. It is with difficulty that the nice discernment of the wise and the virtuous can sometimes distinguish the latter. In the order of all those recommendations, the benevolent wisdom of nature is equally evident. It may perhaps be unnecessary to observe that the culmination of two or more of those exciting causes of kindness increases the kindness, the favor, and the partiality, which, when there is no envy in the case, we naturally bear to greatness, are much increased when it is joined with wisdom and virtue. If, notwithstanding that wisdom and virtue, the great man should fall into those misfortunes, those dangers and distresses to which the most exalted stations are often most exposed, we are much more deeply interested in his fortune than we should be in that of a person equally virtuous, but in a more humble situation. The most interesting subjects of tragedies and romances 
are the misfortunes of virtuous and magnanimous kings and princes. If by the wisdom and manhood of their exertions they should extricate themselves from those misfortunes and recover completely their former superiority and security, we cannot help viewing them with the most enthusiastic and even extravagant admiration. The grief which we felt for their distress, the joy which we feel for their prosperity, seem to combine together in enhancing that partial admiration which we naturally conceive, both for the station and the character. When those different beneficent affections happen to draw different ways, to determine by any precise rules in what cases we ought to comply with the one and what with the other, is perhaps altogether impossible. In what cases friendship ought to yield to gratitude, or gratitude to friendship? In what cases the strongest of all natural affections ought to yield a regard for the safety of those superiors upon whose safety often depends that of the whole society? And in what cases natural affection may, without impropriety, prevail over that last regard? Without impropriety, prevail over that regard, must be left altogether to the decision of the man within the breast, the supposed impartial spectator, the great judge and arbiter of our conduct. If we place ourselves completely in his situation, if we really view ourselves with his eyes, and as he views us, and listen with diligent and reverential attention to what he suggests to us, his voice will never deceive us. We shall stand in need of no casuistic rules to direct our conduct. These it is often impossible to accommodate to all the different shades and gradations of circumstance, character, and situation, to differences and distinctions, which, though not imperceptible, are, by their nicety and delicacy, often altogether undefinable. In that beautiful tragedy of Voltaire, the orphan of China, while we admire the magnanimity of Xanti, who is willing to sacrifice the life of his own child in order to preserve that of the only feeble remnant of his ancient sovereigns and masters, we not only pardon, but love the maternal tenderness of Item, who, at the risk of discovering the important secret of her husband, reclaimed her infant from the cruel hands of the Tartars, into which it had been delivered. Chapter 2. Of the order in which societies are, by nature, recommended to our beneficence. The same principles that direct the order in which individuals are recommended to our beneficence, direct that likewise in which societies are recommended to it. Those to which it is, or may be of most importance, are first and principally recommended to it. The state or sovereignty in which we have been born and educated, and under the protection of which we continue to live, is in ordinary cases the greatest society upon whose happiness or misery our good or bad conduct can have much influence. It is accordingly, by nature, most strongly recommended to us. Not only we ourselves, but all the objects of our kindest affections, our children, our parents, our relations, our friends, our benefactors, all those whom we naturally love and revere the most, are commonly comprehended within it, and their prosperity and safety depend in some measure upon its prosperity and safety. It is by nature, therefore, and dear to us, not only by all our selfish, but by all our private benevolent affections. Upon account of our own connection with it, its prosperity and glory seem to reflect some sort of honor upon ourselves. When we compare it with other societies of the same kind, we are proud of its superiority and mortified in some degree, if it appears in any respects below them. All the illustrious characters which it has produced in former times, for against those of our time, envy may sometimes prejudice us a little. Its warriors, its statesmen, its poets, its philosophers, and men of letters of all kind. We are disposed to view with the most partial admiration, and to rank them, sometimes most unjustly, above those of all other nations. The patriot who lays down his life for the safety, or even for the vain glory, of this society, appears to act with the most exact propriety. He appears to view himself in the light in which the impartial spectator naturally and necessarily views him, as but one of the multitude, in the eye of that equitable judge, of no more consequence than any other in it, but bound at all times to sacrifice and devote himself to the safety, to the service, and even to the glory of the greater number. But though this sacrifice appears to be perfectly just and proper, we know how difficult it is to make it, and how few people are capable of making it, 
His conduct, therefore, excites not only our entire approbation, but our highest wonder and admiration, and seems to merit all the applause which can be due to the most heroic virtue. The traitor, on the contrary, who, in some peculiar situation, fancies he can promote his own little interest by betraying to the public enemy that of his native country, who, regardless of the judgment of the man, within the breast prefers himself, in this respect, so shamefully and so basely, to all those with whom he has any connection, appears to be of all villains the most detestable. The love of our own nation often disposes us to view, with the most malignant jealousy and envy, the prosperity and aggrandizement of any other neighboring nation. Independent and neighboring nations have no common superior to decide their disputes, all live in continual dread and suspicion of one another. Each sovereign, expecting little justice from his neighbors, is disposed to treat them with as little as he expects from them. The regard for the laws of nations, or those rules which independent states profess or pretend to think themselves bound to observe in their dealings with one another, is often very little more than a mere pretense and profession. From the smallest interest, upon the slightest provocation, we see those rules every day, either evaded or directly violated without shame or remorse. Each nation foresees, or imagine it foresees, its own subjugation in the increasing power and aggrandizement of any of its neighbors, and the mean principle of the national prejudice is often founded upon the noble one of the love of our own country. The sentence with which the elder Cato is said to have concluded every speech which he made in the Senate, whatever might be the subject, it is my opinion, likewise, that Carthage ought to be destroyed, was the natural expression of the savage patriotism of a strong but coarse mind, enraged almost to madness against a foreign nation from which his own had suffered so much. The more humane sentence with which Scipio Nasaka is said to have concluded all his speeches, it is my opinion, likewise, that Carthage ought not to be destroyed, was the liberal expression of a more enlarged and enlightened mind, who felt no aversion to the prosperity even of an old enemy, when reduced to a state which could no longer be formidable to Rome, France and England, may each of them have some reason to dread the increase of the naval and military power of the other, but for either of them to envy the internal happiness and prosperity of the other, the cultivation of its lands, the advancement of its manufacturers, the increase of its commerce, the security and number of its ports and harbors, its proficiency in all the liberal arts and sciences is surely beneath the dignity of two such great nations. These are all real improvements of the world we live in. Mankind are benefited. Human nature is ennobled by them. In such improvements each nation ought not only to endeavor itself to excel, but from the love of mankind to promote instead of obstructing the excellence of its neighbors. These are all proper objects of national emulation not of national prejudice or envy. The love of our own country seems not to be derived from the love of mankind. The former sentiment is altogether independent of the latter, and seems sometimes even to dispose us to act inconsistently with it. France may contain, perhaps, near three times the number of inhabitants which Great Britain contains. In the great society of mankind, therefore, the prosperity of France should appear to be an object of much greater importance than that of Great Britain. The British subject, however, who upon that account should prefer upon all occasions the prosperity of the former to that of the latter country, would not be thought a good citizen of Great Britain. We do not love our country merely as a part of the great society of mankind. We love it for its own sake, and independently of any such consideration. That wisdom which contrived the system of human affections, as well as that of every other part of nature, seems to have judged that the interest of the great society of mankind would be best promoted by directing the principal attention of each individual to that particular portion of it, which was most within the sphere both of his abilities and of his understanding. National prejudices and hatreds seldom extend beyond neighboring nations. We very weakly and foolishly, perhaps, call the French our natural enemies, and they perhaps, as weakly and foolishly, consider us in the same manner. Neither they, nor we, bear any sort of envy to the prosperity of China or Japan. It rarely happens, however, that our goodwill towards such distant countries can be exerted with much effect. 
the most extensive public benevolence, which can commonly be exerted with any considerable effect, is that of the statesmen, who project and form alliances among neighboring or not very distant nations, for the preservation either of what is called the balance of power, or of the general peace and tranquility of the states within the circle of their negotiations. Such statesmen, however, who plan and execute such treaties, have seldom anything in view, but in the interests of their respective countries. Sometimes, indeed, their views are more extensive. The Count de Vaux, the plenipotentiary of France, at the Treaty of Munster, would have been willing to sacrifice his life, according to the Cardinal de Retz, a man not over credulous in the virtue of other people, in order to have restored, by that treaty, the general tranquillity of Europe. King Williams seems to have had a real zeal for the liberty and independency of the greater part of that sovereign states of Europe which perhaps might be a good deal stimulated by his particular aversion to France, the state from which, during his time, that liberty and independency were principally in danger. Some share of the same spirit seems to have descended to the first ministry of Queen Anne. Every independent state is divided into many different orders and societies, each of which has its own particular powers, privileges, and immunities. Every individual is naturally more attached to his own particular order or society than to any other. His own interest, his own vanity, the interest and vanity of many of his friends and companions are commonly a good deal connected with it. He is ambitious to extend its privileges and immunities. He is zealous to defend them against the encroachments of every other order or society upon the manner in which any state is divided into the different orders and societies which compose it and upon the particular distribution which has been made of their respective powers, privileges, and immunities, depends what is called the constitution of that particular state, upon the ability of each particular order or society to maintain its own powers, privileges, and immunities against the encroachments of every other, depends the stability of that particular constitution. That particular constitution is necessarily more or less altered. Whenever any of its subordinate parts is either raised above or depressed below whatever had been its former rank and condition. All those different orders and societies are dependent upon the state to which they owe their security and protection, that they are all subordinate to that state and established only in subserviency to its prosperity and preservation is a truth acknowledged by the most partial member of every one of them. It may often, however, be hard to convince him that the prosperity and preservation of the state require any diminution of the powers, privileges, and immunities of his own particular order or society. This partiality, though it may sometimes be unjust, may not, upon that account, be useless. It checks the spirit of the innovation, it tends to preserve whatever is the established balance among the different orders and societies into which the state is divided, and while it sometimes appears to obstruct some alterations of government which may be fashionable and popular at the time, it contributes in reality to the whole stability and permanency of the whole system. The love of our country seems in ordinary cases to involve in it two different principles. First, a certain respect and reverence for that constitution or form of government which is actually established, and secondly, an earnest desire to render the condition of our fellow citizens as safe, respectable, and happy as we can. He is not a citizen who is not disposed to respect the laws and to obey the civil magistrate, and he is certainly not a good citizen who does not wish to promote, by every means in his power, the welfare of the whole society of his fellow citizens. In peaceable and quiet times, those two principles generally coincide and lead to the same conduct. The support of the established government seems evidently the best expedient for maintaining the safe, respectable, and happy situation of our fellow citizens. When we see that this government actually maintains them in that situation, but in times of public discontent, faction, and disorder, those two different principles may draw different ways, and even a wise man may be disposed to think of some alteration necessary in that constitution or form of government, which in its actual condition appears plainly unable to maintain the public tranquility. In such cases, however, it often requires perhaps the highest effort of political wisdom to determine when a real patriot ought to support and endeavor to re-establish the authority 
of the old system, and when he ought to give way to the more daring but often dangerous spirit of innovation. Foreign war and civil faction are the two situations which afford the most splendid opportunities for the display of public spirit. The hero who serves his country successfully in foreign war gratifies the wishes of the whole nation, and is, upon that account, the object of universal gratitude and admiration. In times of civil discord, the leaders of contending parties, though they may be admired by one half of their fellow citizens, are commonly execrated by the other. Their characters and the merit of their respective services appear commonly more doubtful. The glory which is acquired by foreign war is, upon this account, almost always more pure and more splendid than that which can be acquired in civil faction. The leader of the successful party, however, if he has the authority enough to prevail upon his own friends to act with proper temper and moderation, which he frequently has not, may sometimes render to his country a service that is more essential and important than the greatest victories and the most extensive conquests. He may re-establish and improve the constitution, and from the very doubtful and ambiguous character of the leader of a party, he may assume that the greatest and noblest of all characters, that of the reformer and legislator of a great state, and by the wisdom of his institutions, secure the internal tranquility and happiness of his fellow citizens for many succeeding generations. Amidst the turbulence and disorder of faction, a certain spirit of system is apt to mix itself with that public spirit, which is founded upon the love of humanity, upon a real fellow feeling with the inconveniencies and distresses to which some of our fellow citizens may be exposed. This spirit of system commonly takes the direction of that more gentle public spirit, and always animates it, and often inflames it even to the madness of fanaticism. The leaders of the discontented party seldom fail to hold out some plausible plan for reformation, which, they pretend, will not only remove the inconveniencies and relieve the distresses immediately complained of, but will prevent in all time coming any return of the like inconveniencies and distresses. They often propose, upon this account, to new model the constitution, and to alter in some of its most essential parts that system of government under which the subjects of a great empire have enjoyed, perhaps peace, security, and even glory, during the course of several centuries together. The great body of the party are commonly intoxicated with the imaginary beauty of this ideal system, of which they have no experience, but which has been represented to them in all the most dazzling colors in which the eloquence of their leaders could paint it. Those leaders themselves, though they originally have meant nothing but their own aggrandizement, become many of them in time the dupes of their own sophistry, and are as eager for this great reformation as the weakest and foolishest of their followers, even though the leaders should have presented their own heads, as indeed they commonly do, free from this fanaticism, yet they dare not always disappoint the expectation of their followers, but are often obliged, though contrary to their principle and their conscience, to act as if they were under the common delusion. The violence of the party, refusing all palliatives, all temperaments, all reasonable accommodations, by requiring too much frequently, obtains nothing, and those inconveniencies and distresses, with a little moderation, might in a great measure have been removed and relieved, or left altogether without the hope of a remedy. The man whose public spirit is prompted altogether by humanity and benevolence will respect the established powers and privileges even of individuals, and still more those of the great orders and societies, into which the state is divided. Though he should consider some of them as in some measure abusive, he will content himself with moderating what he often cannot annihilate without great violence. When he cannot conquer the rooted prejudices of the people by reason and persuasion, he will not attempt to subdue them by force, but will religiously observe what, by Cicero, is justly called the divine maxim of Plato, never to use violence to his country no more than to his parents. He will accommodate as well as he can his public arrangements to the confirmed habits and prejudices of the people, and will remedy as well as he can the inconveniencies which may flow from the want of those regulations which the people are averse to submit to. When he cannot establish the right, he will not disdain to ameliorate the wrong, but like Solon, when he cannot establish the best system of laws, 
he will endeavor to establish the best that the people can bear. The man of system, on the contrary, is apt to be very wise in his own conceit, and is often so enamored with the supposed beauty of his own ideal plan of government, that he cannot suffer the smallest deviation from any part of it. He goes on to establish it completely and in all parts, without any regard either to the great interests or to the strong prejudices which may oppose it. He seems to imagine that he can arrange the different members of a great society with as much ease as the hand arranges the different pieces upon a chessboard. He does not consider that the pieces upon the chessboard have no other principle of motion besides that which the hand impresses upon them, but that in the great chessboard of human society every single piece has a principle of motion of its own, altogether different from that which the legislature might choose to impress upon it. If those two principles coincide and act in the same direction, the game of human society will go on easily and harmoniously, and is very likely to be happy and successful. If they are opposite or different, the game will go on miserably, and the society must be, at all times, in the highest degree of disorder. Some general and even systematical idea of the perfection of policy and law may no doubt be necessary for directing the views of the statesman, but to insist upon establishing and upon establishing all at once, and in spite of all opposition, everything which that idea may seem to require, must often be the highest degree of arrogance. It is to erect his own judgment into the supreme standard of right and wrong. It is to fancy himself the only wise and worthy man in the commonwealth, and that all his fellow citizens should accommodate themselves to him, and not he to them. It is upon this account that all political speculators Sovereign princes are by far the most dangerous. This arrogance is perfectly familiar to them. They entertain, no doubt, of the immense superiority of their own judgment. When such imperial and royal reformers, therefore, condescend to contemplate the constitution of their country, which is committed to their government, they seldom see anything so wrong in it as the obstructions which it may sometimes oppose to the execution of their own will. They hold in contempt the divine maxim of Plato, and consider the state as made for themselves, not themselves for the state. The great object of the Reformation, therefore, is to remove those obstructions, to reduce the authority of the nobility, to take away the privileges of cities and provinces, and to render both the greatest individuals and the greatest orders of the state, as incapable of opposing their commands, as the weakest and most insignificant. Chapter 3 of Universal Benevolence Though our effectual good offices can very seldom be extended to any wider society than that of our own country, our good will is circumscribed by no boundary, but may embrace the immensity of our universe. We cannot form the idea of any innocent and sensible being whose happiness we should not desire, or to whose misery, when distinctly brought home to the imagination, we should not have some degree of aversion. The idea of a mischievous, though sensible being, indeed, naturally provokes our hatred, but the ill will which, in this case, we bear to it, is really the effect of our universal benevolence. It is the effect of the sympathy which we feel with the misery and resentment of those other innocent and sensible beings, whose happiness is disturbed by its malice. This universal benevolence, how noble and generous soever, can be the source of no solid happiness to any man who is not thoroughly convinced that all the inhabitants of the universe, the meanest as well as the greatest, are under the immediate care and protection of that great benevolent and all-wise being, who directs all the movements of nature, and who is determined by his own unalterable perfections to maintain it at all times. The greatest possible quantity of happiness to this universal benevolence, on the contrary, the very suspicion of a fatherless world, must be the most melancholy of all reflections, from the thought that all the unknown regions of infinite and incomprehensible space may be filled with nothing but endless misery and wretchedness. All the splendor of the highest prosperity can never enlighten the gloom with which so dreadful an idea must necessarily overshadow the imagination, nor, in a wise and virtuous man, can all the sorrow of the most afflicting adversity ever dry up the joy which necessarily springs from the habitual and thorough conviction of the truth of the contrary system. The wise and virtuous man is at all times 
willing that his own private interest should be sacrificed to the public interest of his own particular order or society. He is at all times willing, too, that the interest of this order or society should be sacrificed to the greater interest of the state or sovereignty, of which it is only a subordinate part. He should therefore be equally willing that all those inferior interests should be sacrificed to the greater interest of the universe, to the interest of that great society of all sensible and intelligent beings, of which God himself is the immediate administrator and director, if he is deeply impressed with the habitual and thorough conviction that this benevolent and all-wise being can omit into the system of his government no partial evil, which is not necessary for the universal good, he must consider all the misfortunes which may befall himself, his friends, his society, or his country, as necessary for the prosperity of the universe, and therefore, as what he ought, not only to submit with the resignation, but as what he submits, but as what he himself, if he had known all the connections and dependencies of things, ought sincerely and devoutly to have wished for. Nor does this magnanimous resignation to the will of the great director of the universe seem in any respect beyond the reach of human nature. Good soldiers, who both love and trust their general, frequently march, with more gaiety and alacrity, to the forlorn station, from which they never expect to return, than they would to one where there was neither difficulty nor danger. In marching to the latter, they could feel no other sentiment than that of the dullness of ordinary duty. In marching to the former, they feel that they are making the noblest exertion which it is possible for man to make. They know that their general would not have ordered them upon this station had it not been necessary for the safety of the army, for the success of the war. They cheerfully sacrifice their own little systems to the prosperity of the greater system. They take an affectionate leave of their comrades, to whom they wish all happiness and success, and march out, not only with submissive obedience, but often with shouts of the most joyful exultion, to that fatal but splendid and honorable station to which they are appointed. No conductor of an army can deserve more unlimited trust, more ardent and zealous affection, than the great conductor of the universe. In the greatest public as well as private disasters, a wise man ought to consider that he himself, his friends and countrymen, have only been ordered upon the forlorn station of the universe, that had it not been necessary for the good of the whole, they would not have been so ordered. And it is their duty not only with humble resignation to submit to this allotment, but to endeavor to embrace it with alacrity and joy. A wise man should surely be capable of doing what a good soldier holds himself at all times in readiness to do. The idea of that divine being, whose benevolence and wisdom have from all eternity contrived and conducted the immense machine of the universe, so as at all times to produce the greatest possible quantity of happiness, is certainly of all the objects of human contemplation by far the most sublime. Every other thought necessarily appears mean in the comparison. The man whom we believe to be principally occupied in this sublime contemplation seldom fails to be the object of our highest veneration, and though his life should be altogether contemplative, we often regard him with a sort of religious respect much superior to that which we look upon the most active and useful servant of the commonwealth. The meditations of Marcus Antonius, which turn principally upon the subject, have contributed more, perhaps, to the general admiration of his character than all the different transactions of his just, merciful, and beneficent reign. The administration of the great system of the universe, however, the care of the universal happiness of all rational and sensible beings is the business of God and not of man. To man is allotted a much humbler department, but one much more suitable to the weakness of his powers and to the narrowness of his comprehension. The care of his own happiness, of that of his family, his friends, his country, that he is occupied in contemplating the more sublime, can never be an excuse for his neglecting the more humble department, and he must not expose himself to the charge with Avidius Cassius is said to have brought, perhaps unjustly against Marcus Antonius, that while he employed himself in philosophical speculations and contemplated the prosperity of the universe, he neglected that of the Roman Empire. The most sublime speculation of the contemplative philosopher can scarce compensate the neglect 
of the smallest act of duty. Section 3 of Self-Command The man who acts according to the rules of perfect prudence, of strict justice, and of proper benevolence, may be said to be perfectly virtuous, but the most perfect knowledge of those rules will not alone enable him to act in this manner. His own passions are very apt to mislead him, sometimes to drive him, and sometimes to seduce him, to violate all the rules which he himself, in all his sober and cool hours, approves of. The most perfect knowledge, if it is not supported by the most perfect self-command, will not always enable him to do his duty. Some of the best ancient moralists seem to have considered those passions as divided into two different classes, first into those which it requires a considerable exertion of self-command to restrain even for a single moment, and secondly, into which it is easy to restrain for a single moment or even for a short period of time, but which, by their continual and almost incessant solicitations, are, in the great course of a life, very apt to mislead into great deviations. Fear and anger, together with some other passions, which are mixed or connected with them, constitute the first class. The love of ease, of pleasure, of applause, and of many other selfish gratifications, constitute the second. Extravagant fear and furious anger it is often difficult to restrain, even for a single moment. The love of ease, pleasure, and applause, and other selfish gratifications, it is always easy to restrain for a single moment, or even for a short period of time. But by their continual solicitations, they often mislead us into many weaknesses, which we have afterwards much reason to be ashamed of. The former set of passions may often be said to derive the latter, to seduce us from our duty. The command of the former was, by the ancient moralists, above alluded to, denominated fortitude, manhood, and strength of mind, that of the latter, temperance, decency, modesty, and moderation. The command of each of those two sets of passions, independent of the beauty which it derives from its utility, from its enabling us upon all occasions to act according to the dictates of prudence, of justice, and of proper benevolence, has a beauty of its own and seems to deserve, for its own sake, a certain degree of esteem and admiration. In the one case, the strength and greatness of the exertion excites some degree of that esteem and admiration. In the other, the uniformity, the equality, and the unremitting steadiness of that exertion. The man who, in danger, in torture, upon the approach of death, preserves his tranquillity unaltered, and suffers no word, no gesture to escape him, which does not perfectly accord with the feelings of the most indifferent spectator, necessarily commands a very high degree of admiration. If he suffers in the cause of liberty and justice, for the sake of humanity, and for the love of his country, the most tender compassion for his sufferings, the strongest indignation against the injustice of his persecutors, the warmest sympathetic gratitude for his beneficent intentions, the highest sense of his merit, all join and mix themselves with the admiration of his magnanimity and often inflame that sentiment into the most enthusiastic and rapturous veneration. The heroes of ancient and modern history, who are remembered with the most peculiar favor and affection, are, many of them, those who in the cause of truth, liberty, and justice, have perished upon the scaffold, and who behaved there with that ease and dignity which became them. Had the enemies of Socrates suffered him to die quietly in his bed, the glory even of that great philosopher might possibly never have acquired that dazzling splendor in which it has been beheld in all succeeding ages. In the English history, when we look over the illustrious heads which have been engraved by Virtue and Halbregen, there is scarce anybody, I imagine, who does not feel that the axe, the emblem of having been beheaded, which is engraved under the most illustrious of them, under those of Sir Thomas More's, of the Raleigh's, the Russell's, and the Sydney's, etc., sheds a real dignity and interestingness over the characters to which it is affixed, much superior to what they can derive from all the futile ornaments of heraldry with which they are sometimes accompanied. Nor does this magnanimity give luster only to the characters of innocent and virtuous men. It draws some degree of favorable regard even upon those of the greatest criminals. And when a robber or highwayman is brought to the scaffold and behaves there with decency and firmness, Though we perfectly approve of his punishment, we often cannot help regretting that a man who possessed such great and noble powers should have been capable of such mean enormities.
War is the great school both for acquiring and exercising this species of magnanimity. Death, as we say, is the king of terrors, and the man who has conquered the fear of death is not likely to lose his presence of mind at the approach of any other natural evil. In war, men become familiar with death and are thereby cured of that superstitious horror with which it is viewed by the weak and unexperienced. They consider it merely as the loss of life, and as no further the object of aversion than as life may happen to be that of desire. They learn from experience, too, that many seemingly great dangers are not so great as they appear, and that, with courage, activity, and presence of mind, there is often a good probability of extricating themselves with honor from situations where at first they could see no hope. The dread of death is thus greatly diminished, and the confidence or hope of escaping it augmented. They learn to expose themselves to danger with less reluctance. They are less anxious to get out of it, and less apt to lose their presence of mind while they are in it. It is this habitual contempt of danger and death which ennobles the profession of a soldier, and bestows upon it, in the natural apprehensions of mankind, a rank and dignity superior to that of any other profession. The skillful and successful exercise of this profession in the service of their country seems to have constituted the most distinguishing feature in the character of the favorite heroes of all ages. Great warlike exploit, though undertaken contrary to every principle of justice and carried on without any regard to humanity, sometimes interests us and commands even some degree of a certain sort of esteem for the very worthless characters which conduct it. We are interested even in the exploits of the buccaneers, and read with some sort of esteem and admiration the history of the most worthless men, who, in pursuit of the most criminal purposes, endured greater hardships, surmounted greater difficulties, and encountered greater dangers than, perhaps, any which the ordinary course of history gives an account of. The command of anger appears upon many occasions not less generous and noble than that of fear, the proper expression of just indignation composes many of the most splendid and admired passages, both of the ancient and modern eloquence. The Philippics of Demosthenes, the Catalinarians of Cicero, derive their whole beauty from the noble propriety with which this passion is expressed. But this just indignation is nothing but anger restrained and properly attempered to what the impartial spectator can enter into. The blustering and noisy passion which goes beyond this, is always odious and offensive, and interests us not for the angry man, but for the man with whom he is angry. The noblest of pardoning appears, upon many occasions, superior even to the most perfect propriety of resenting. When either proper acknowledgments have been made by the offending party, or, even without any such acknowledgments, when the public interest requires that the most mortal enemies should unite for the discharge of some important duty, the man who can cast away all animosity and act with confidence and cordiality towards the person who had most grievously offended him seems justly to merit our highest admiration. The command of anger, however, does not always appear in such splendid colors. Fear is contrary to anger and is often the motive which restrains it, and in such cases the meanness of the motive takes away all the nobleness of the restraint. Anger prompts to attack, and the indulgence of it seems sometimes to show a sort of courage and superiority to fear. The indulgence of anger is sometimes an object of vanity, that a fear never is, vain and weak men, among their inferiors or those who dare not resist them, often affect to be ostentatiously passionate, and fancy that they show what is called spirit in being so. A bully tells many stories of his own insolence, which are not true, and imagines that he thereby renders himself if not more amiable and respectable, at least more formidable to his audience. Modern manners, which by favoring the practice of dueling, may be said in some cases to encourage private revenge, contribute perhaps to a good deal to render, in modern times, the restraint of anger by fear still more contemptible than it might otherwise appear to be. There is always something dignified in the command of fear, whatever may be the motive upon which it is founded. It is not so with the command of anger, unless it is founded altogether in the sense of decency, of dignity and propriety, and never is perfectly agreeable. 
to act according to the dictates of prudence of justice and proper beneficence seems to have no great merit where there is no temptation to do otherwise but to act with cool deliberation in the midst of the greatest dangers and difficulties to observe religiously the sacred rules of justice in spite both of the greatest interests which might tempt and the greatest injuries which might provoke us to violate them never to suffer the benevolence of our temper to be damped or discouraged by the malignity and ingratitude of the individuals towards whom it may have been exercised is the character of the most exalted wisdom and virtue self-command is not only itself a great virtue but from it all the other virtues seem to derive their principal luster the command of fear the command of anger are always great and noble powers when they are directed by justice and benevolence they are not only great virtues but increase the splendor of those other virtues they may however sometimes be directed by very different motives and in this case though still great and respectable they may be excessively dangerous the most intrepid valor may be employed in the cause of the greatest injustice amidst great provocations apparent tranquillity and good humor may sometimes conceal the most determined and cruel resolution to revenge the strength of mind requisite for such dissimulation though always and necessarily contaminated by the baseness of falsehood has however been often much admired by many people of no contemptible judgment the dissimulation of catherine of medicis is often celebrated by the profound historian de villa that of lord digby afterwards earl of bristol by the grave and conscientious lord clarendon that of the first ashley earl of shaftesbury by the judicious mr locke even cicero seems to consider this deceitful character not indeed of the highest dignity but as not unsuitable to a certain flexibility of manners which he thinks may notwithstanding be upon the whole both agreeable and respectable he exemplifies it by the characters of homer's ulysses of the athenian themistocles of the spartan lysander and of the roman marcus crassus this character of dark and deep dissimulation occurs most commonly in times of great public disorder amidst the violence of faction and civil war when law has become in great measure impotent when the most perfect innocence cannot alone ensure safety regard to self-defense obliges the greater part of men to have recourse to dexterity to address and to apparent accommodation to whatever happens to be at the moment the prevailing party this false character too is frequently accompanied with the coolest and most determined courage the proper exercise of it supposes that courage as death is commonly the certain consequence of detection it may be employed indifferently either to exasperate or to allay those furious animosities of adverse factions which impose the necessity of assuming it and though it may sometimes be useful it is at least equally liable to be excessively pernicious the command of the less violent and turbulent passions seems much less liable to be abused to any pernicious purpose temperance decency modesty and moderation are always amiable and can seldom be directed to any bad end it is from the unremitting steadiness of those gentler exertions of self-command that the amiable virtue of chastity that the respectable virtues of industry and frugality derive all that sober lustre which attends them the conduct of all those who are contented to walk in the humble paths of private and peaceable lives derives from the same principle the greater part of the beauty and grace which belong to it a beauty and grace which though much less dazzling is not always less pleasing than those which accompany the more splendid actions of the hero the statesman or the legislator after what has already been said in several different parts of this discourse concerning the nature of self-command i judge it unnecessary to enter into any further detail concerning those virtues i shall only observe at present that the point of propriety the degree of any passion which the impartial spectator approves of is differently situated in different passions in some passions the excess is less disagreeable than the defect and in such passions the point of propriety seems to stand high or nearer to the excess than to the defect in other passions the defect is less disagreeable than the excess and in such passions the point of propriety seems to stand low or near to the defect than to the excess 
The former are the passions which the spectator is most, the latter those which he is the least disposed to sympathize with. The former, too, are the passions of which the immediate feeling or sensation is agreeable to the person principally concerned, the latter those of which it is disagreeable. It may be laid down, as a general rule, that the passions which the spectator is most disposed to sympathize with, and in which upon that account the point of propriety may be said to stand high, are those of which the immediate feeling or sensation is more or less agreeable to the person principally concerned, and that, on the contrary, the passions which the spectator is least disposed to sympathize with, and in which upon that account the point of propriety may be said to stand low, are those which the immediate feeling or sensation is more or less disagreeable, or even painful, to the person principally concerned. This general rule, so far, as I have been able to observe, admits not a single exception. A few examples will at once both sufficiently explain it and demonstrate the truth of it. The disposition to the affections which tend to unite men in society, to humanity, kindness, natural affection, friendship, esteem, may sometimes be excessive. Even that excess of this disposition, however, renders a man interesting to everybody. Though we blame it, we still regard it with compassion, and even with kindness, and never with dislike. We are more sorry for it than angry at it. To the person himself, the indulgence even of such excessive affections is, upon many occasions, not only agreeable, but delicious. Upon some occasions, indeed, especially when directed, as is too often the case, towards unworthy objects, it exposes him to much real and heartfelt distress. Even upon such occasions, however, a well-disposed mind regards him with the most exquisite pity, and feels the highest indignation against those who affect to despise him for his weakness and imprudence. The defect of this disposition, on the contrary, what is called hardness of heart, while it renders a man insensible to the feelings and distresses of other people, renders other people equally insensible to his, and by excluding him from the friendship of all the world, excludes him from the best and most comfortable of all social enjoyments. The disposition to the affections which drive men from one another, and which tend, as it were, to break the bands of human society, the disposition to anger, hatred, envy, malice, revenge, is, on the contrary, much more apt to offend by its excess than by its defect. The excess renders a man wretched and miserable in his own mind, and the object of hatred, and sometimes even of horror, to other people. The defect is very seldom complained of. It may, however, be defective. The want of proper indignation is a most essential defect in the manly character, and upon many occasions renders a man incapable of protecting either himself or his friends from insult and injustice. Even that principle, in that excess and improper direction, of which consists the odious and detestable passion of envy, may be defective. Envy is that passion which views that malignant dislike the superiority of those who are already entitled to all the superiority they possess. The man, however, who, in matters of consequence, tamely suffers other people who are entitled to no much superiority to rise above him or get before him, is justly condemned as mean-spirited. This weakness is commonly founded in indolence, sometimes in good nature and in an aversion to opposition, to bustle and solicitation, and sometimes, too, in a sort of ill-judged magnanimity which fancies that it can always continue to despise the advantage which it then despises, and therefore so easily gives up. Such weakness, however, is commonly followed by much regret and repentance, and what had some appearance of magnanimity in the beginning frequently gives place to a most malignant envy in the end, and to a hatred of that superiority, which those who have once attained it may often become really entitled to it by the very circumstance of having attained it. In order to live comfortably in the world, it is, upon all occasions, as necessary to defend our dignity and rank as it is to defend our life or our fortune. Our sensibility to personal danger and distress, like that to personal provocation, is much more apt to offend by its excess than by its defect. No character is more contemptible than that of a coward. 
No character is more admired than that of the man who faces death with intrepidity, and maintains his tranquillity and presence of mind amidst the most dreadful dangers. We esteem the man who supports pain and even torture with manhood and firmness, and we have little regard for him who sinks under them and abandons himself to useless outcries and womanish lamentations. A fretful temper which feels with too much sensibility every little cross accident renders a man miserable in himself and offensive to other people. A calm one which does not allow its tranquillity to be disturbed either by the small injuries or by the little disasters incident to the usual course of human affairs, but which admits the natural and moral evils infesting the world, lays its account, and is contented to suffer a little from both, is a blessing to the man himself, and gives ease and security to all his companions. Our sensibility, however, both to our own injuries and to our own misfortunes, though generally too strong, may likewise be too weak, the man who feels little for his own misfortunes must always feel less for those of other people, and be less disposed to relieve them. The man who has little resentment for the injuries which are done to himself must always have less for those which are done to other people, and less disposed either to protect or to avenge them. A stupid insensibility to the events of human life necessarily extinguishes all that keen and earnest attention to the propriety of our own conduct which constitutes the real essence of virtue. We can feel little anxiety about the propriety of our own actions when we are indifferent about the events which may result from them. The man who feels full distress of the calamity which has befallen him, who feels the whole baseness of injustice which has been done to him, but who feels still more strongly what the dignity of his own character requires, who does not abandon himself to the guidance of the undisciplined passions which his situation might naturally inspire, but who governs his whole behavior and conduct according to those restrained and corrected emotions which the great inmate, the great demigod, within the breast prescribes and approves of, is the alone the real man of virtue, the only real and proper object of love, respect, and admiration. Insensibility and that noble firmness, that exalted self-command, which is founded in the sense of dignity and propriety are so far from being altogether the same, that in proportion as the former takes place, the merit of the latter is, in many cases, entirely taken away. But though the total want of sensibility to personal injury, to personal danger and distress, would in such situations take away the whole merit of self-command, that sensibility, however, may be very easily be too exquisite, and it frequently is so. When the sense of propriety, when the authority of the judge within the breast can control this extreme sensibility, that authority must no doubt appear very noble and very great. But the exertion of it may be too fatiguing, it may have too much to do. The individual, by a great effort, may behave perfectly well. But the contest between the two principles, the warfare within the breast, may be too violent to be at all consistent with internal tranquility and happiness. The wise man, whom nature has endowed with this too exquisite sensibility, and whose too lively feelings that have not been sufficiently blunted and hardened by early education and proper exercise, will avoid as much as duty and propriety will permit, the situation for which he is not perfectly fitted, the man whose feeble and delicate constitution renders him too sensible to pain, to hardship, and to every sort of bodily distress, should not wantonly embrace the profession of a soldier. The man of too much sensibility to injury should not rashly engage in the contest of faction, though the sense of propriety should be strong enough to command all those sensibilities. The composure of the mind must always be disturbed in the struggle. In this disorder, the judgment cannot always maintain its ordinary acuteness and precision, and though he may always mean to act properly, he may often act rashly and imprudently, and in a manner in which he himself will, in the succeeding part of his life, be forever ashamed of. A certain intrepidity, a certain firmness of nerves and hardiness of constitution, whether natural or acquired, are undoubtedly the best preparatives for all the great exertions of self-command. Though war and faction are certainly the best schools for forming every man to this hardiness and firmness of temper, though they are the best remedies for curing him of the opposite weakness, yet if the day of trial should happen to come before he has completely learned his lesson, 
before the remedy has had time to produce its proper effect, the consequences might not be agreeable. Our sensibility to the pleasures, to the amusements and enjoyments of human life, may offend in the same manner, either by its excess or by its defect. Of the two, however, the excess seems less disagreeable than the defect. Both to the spectator and to the person principally concerned, a strong propensity to joy is certainly more pleasing than a dull insensibility to the object of amusement and diversion. We are charmed with the gaiety of youth and even with the playfulness of childhood, but we soon grow weary of the flat and tasteless gravity which too frequently accompanies old age. When this propensity, indeed, is not restrained by the sense of propriety, when it is unsuitable to the time or to the place to the age or to the situation of the person, when, to indulge it, he neglects either his interest or his duty. It is justly blamed as excessive, and as hurtful both to the individual and to the society. In the greater part of such cases, however, what is chiefly to be found fault with is not so much the strength of the propensity to joy as the weakness of the sense of propriety and duty. A young man who has no relish for the diversions and amusements that are natural and suitable to his age, who talks of nothing but his book or his business, is disliked as formal and pedantic, and we give him no credit for his abstinence even from improper indulgences, to which he seems to have so little inclination. The principle of self-estimation may be too high, and it is likewise to be too low. It is so very agreeable to think highly, and so very disagreeable to think meanly of ourselves, that to the person himself it cannot well be doubted, but that some degree of excess must be less disagreeable than any degree of defect. But to the impartial spectator, it may perhaps be thought, things must appear quite differently, and that to him the defect must always be less disagreeable than the excess. And in our companions, no doubt, we much more frequently complain of the latter than of the former. When they assume upon us, or set themselves before us, their self-estimation mortifies our own. Our own pride and vanity must prompt us to accuse them of pride and vanity, and we cease to be the impartial spectators of their conduct. When the same companions, however, suffer any other man to assume over them a superiority which does not belong to him, we not only blame them, but often despise them as mean-spirited. When on the contrary, among other people, they push themselves a little more forward and scramble to an elevation disproportioned, as we think, to their merit. Though we may not perfectly approve of their conduct, we are often, upon the whole, diverted with it. And where there is no envy in the case, we are almost always much less displeased with them than we should have been, and they suffer themselves to sink below their proper station. In estimating our own merit, in judging of our own character and conduct, there are two different standards to which we naturally compare them. The one is the idea of exact propriety and perfection, so far as we are each of us capable of comprehending that idea. The other is that degree of approximation to this idea which is commonly attained in the world, and which the greater part of our friends and companions, of our rivals and competitors, may actually have arrived at. We very seldom, I am disposed to think we never, attempt to judge ourselves without giving more or less attention to both these different standards. But the attention of different men, and even of the same man at different times, is often very unequally divided between them, and is sometimes principally directed towards one and sometimes towards the other. So far as our attention is directed towards the first standard, the wisest and best of us all can, in his own character and conduct, see nothing but weakness and imperfection, can discover no ground for arrogance and presumption but a great deal for humility, regret, and repentance. So far as our attention is directed towards the second, we may be affected either in the one way or in the other, and feel ourselves either really above or really below the standard to which we compare ourselves. The wise and virtuous man directs his principal attention to the first standard, the idea of exact propriety and perfection. There exists in the mind of every man an idea of this kind, gradually formed from his observations upon the character and conduct both of himself and of other people. It is the slow, gradual, and progressive work of the great demigod within the breast, the great judge and arbiter of conduct. 
This idea is in every man more or less accurately drawn. Its colouring is more or less just. Its outlines are more or less exactly designed, according to the delicacy and acuteness of that sensibility with which those observations were made and according to the care and attention employed in making them. In the wise and virtuous man, they have been made with the most acute and delicate sensibility, and the utmost care and attention have been employed in making them. Every day some feature is improved, every day some blemish is corrected. He has studied this idea more than other people. He comprehends it more distinctly. He has formed a much more correct image of it, and is much more deeply enamored of its exquisite and divine beauty. He endeavors as well as he can to assimilate his own character to this architect of perfection, but he imitates the work of a divine artist which he can never be equaled. He feels the imperfect success of all his best endeavors, and sees with grief and affliction in how many different features the mortal copy falls short of the immortal original. He remembers, with concern and humiliation, how often, from the want of attention, from want of judgment, from want of temper, he has, both in words and actions, both in conduct and conversation, violated the exact rules of perfect propriety. He has so far departed from that model, according to which he wished to fashion his own character and conduct. When he directs his attention towards the second standard, indeed, the degree of excellence which his friends and acquaintances have commonly arrived at, he may be sensible of his own superiority. But as his principal attention is always directed towards the first standard, he is necessarily much more humbled by the one comparison than he can ever be elevated by the other. He is never so elated as to look down with insolence even upon those who are really below him. He feels so well his own imperfection. He knows so well the difficulty with which he has attained his own distant approximation to rectitude that he cannot regard with contempt the still greater imperfection of other people. Far from insulting their own inferiority, he views it with the most indulgent commiseration and, by his advice as well as an example, is at all times willing to promote their further advancement. If, in any particular qualification, they happen to be superior to him, for who is so perfect as not to have many superiors in many different qualifications? Far from envying their superiority, he, who knows how difficult it is to excel, esteems and honours their excellence, and never fails to bestow upon it the full measure of applause which it deserves. His whole mind, in short, is deeply impressed. His whole behaviour and deportment are distinctly stamped with the character of real modesty, with that of a very moderate estimation of his own merit, and at the same time a full sense of the merit of other people. In all the liberal and ingenious arts, in painting, in poetry, in music, in eloquence, in philosophy, the great artist feels always the real imperfection of his own best works, and is more sensible than any man how much they fall short of that ideal perfection of which he has formed some conception, which he imitates as well as he can, but which he despairs of ever equaling. It is the inferior artist only who is ever perfectly satisfied with his own performances. He has little conception of this ideal perfection, about which he has a little employed his thoughts, and it is chiefly to the works of other artists, of, perhaps, a still lower order, that he deigns to compare his own works. Boileau, the great French poet, in some of his works perhaps not inferior to the greatest poet of the same kind, either ancient or modern, used to say that no great man was ever completely satisfied with his own works. His acquaintance, saint Will, a writer of Latin verses, and who, on account of that schoolboy accomplishment, had the weakness to fancy himself a poet, assured him that he himself was always completely satisfied with his own. Boileau replied, with perhaps an arch ambiguity, that he certainly was the only great man that ever was so. Boileau, in judging of his own works, compared them with the standard ideal perfection, which in his own particular branch of the poetic art he had, I presume, meditated as deeply and conceived as distinctly as it is possible for a man to conceive it. saint will in judging of his own works, compared them, I suppose, chiefly to the other Latin poets of his own time, to the greater part of whom he was certainly very high from being inferior. But to support and finish off, if I may say so, 
the conduct and conversation of a whole life to some resemblance of this ideal perfection is surely more difficult than to work up to an equal resemblance of any productions of any of the ingenuous arts. The artist sits down to his work undisturbed, at leisure, in the full possession and recollection of all his skill, experience, and knowledge. The wise man must support the propriety of his own conduct in health and in sickness, in success and disappointment, in the hour of fatigue and drowsy indolence, as well as in that of the most awakened attention. The most sudden and unexpected assaults of difficulty and distress must never surprise him. The injustice of other people must never provoke him to injustice. The violence of faction must never confound him. All the hardships and hazards of war must never either dishearten him or appall him. Of the persons who, in estimating their own merit, in judging of their own character and conduct, direct by far the greater part of their attention to the second standard, to that ordinary degree of excellence which is commonly attained by other people. There are some who really and justly feel themselves very much above it, and who, by every intelligent and impartial spectator, are acknowledged to be so. The attention of such persons, however, being always principally directed, not to the standard of ideal, but to that of the ordinary perfection, they have little sense of their own weaknesses and imperfections, they have little modesty, are often assuming arrogant and presumptuous, great admirers of themselves and great condemners of other people. Though their characters are in general much less correct and their merit much inferior to that of the man of real and modest virtue, yet their excessive presumption, founded upon their own excessive self-admiration, dazzles the multitude and often imposes even upon those who are much superior to the multitude. The frequent and often wonderful success of the most ignorant quacks and impostors, both civil and religious, sufficiently demonstrate how easily the multitude are imposed upon by the most extravagant and groundless pretensions. But when these pretensions are supported by a very high degree of real and solid merit, when they are displayed with all the splendor which ostentation can bestow upon them, when they are supported by high rank and great power, when they have often been successfully exerted, and are upon that account attended by the loud acclamations of the multitude, even the man of sober judgment often abandons himself to the general admiration. The very noise of those foolish acclamations often contributes to confound his understanding, and while he sees those great men only at a certain distance, he is often disposed to worship them with a sincere admiration, superior even to that with which they appear to worship themselves. When there is no envy in the case, we all take pleasure in admiring, and are, upon that account, naturally disposed, in our own fancies, to render complete and perfect in every respect the characters which, in many respects, are so very worthy of admiration. The excessive self-admiration of those great men is well understood, perhaps even seen through, with some degree of derision, by those wise men who are much in their familiarity, and who secretly smile at those lofty pretensions, which, by people at a distance, are often regarded with reverence and almost with adoration. Such, however, have been, in all ages, the greater part of those men who have procured to themselves the most noisy fame, the most extensive reputation, a fame and reputation, too, which have often descended to the remotest posterity. Great success in the world, great authority over the sentiments and opinions of mankind, have very seldom been acquired without some degree of excessive self-admiration. The most splendid characters, the men who have performed the most illustrious actions, and who have brought about the greatest revolutions, both in the situations and opinions of mankind, the most successful warriors, the greatest statesmen and legislators, the eloquent founders and leaders of the most numerous and most successful sects and parties, have many of them not more distinguished for their very great merit than for a degree of presumption and self-admiration altogether disproportioned even to that very great merit. This presumption was perhaps necessary not only to prompt them to undertakings which a more sober mind would never have thought of, but to command the submission and obedience of their followers to support them in such undertakings. When crowned with success accordingly, this presumption has often betrayed them into a vanity that approached almost to insanity and folly. Alexander the Great appears, 
not only to have wished that other people should think him a god, but to have been at least very well disposed to fancy himself such. Upon his deathbed, the most ungodlike of all situations, he requested of his friends that, to the respectable list of deities, into which himself had long before been inserted, his old mother, Olympia, might likewise have the honor of being added, amidst the respectful admiration of his followers and disciples, amidst the universal applause of the public, after the oracle, which probably had followed the voice of that applause, had pronounced him the wisest of men. The great wisdom of Socrates, though it did not suffer him to fancy himself a god, yet was not great enough to hinder him from fancying that he had a secret and frequent intimations from some invisible and divine being. The sound head of Caesar was not so perfectly sound as to hinder him from being much pleased with his divine genealogy from the goddess Venus, and before the temple of this pretended great-grandmother, to receive, without rising from his seat, the Roman Senate, when that illustrious body came to present him with some decrees conferring upon him the most extravagant honours, this insolence, joined to some other acts of an almost childish vanity, little to be expected from an understanding at once so very acute and comprehensive, seems by exasperating the public jealousy to have emboldened his assassins and to have hastened the execution of their conspiracy. The religion and manners of modern times gives our great end little encouragement to fancy themselves either gods or even prophets. Success, however, joined to great popular favor, has often so far turned the heads of the greatest of them, as to make them ascribe to themselves both an importance and an ability much beyond what they really possessed, and by this presumption to precipitate themselves into many rash and sometimes ruinous adventures. It is a characteristic almost peculiar to the great Duke of Marlborough, that ten years of such uninterrupted and such splendid success as scarce any other general could boast of, never betrayed him in a single rash action, scarce into a single rash action, scarce into a single rash word or expression. The same temperate coolness and self-command cannot, I think, be ascribed to any other great warrior of later times, not to Prince Eugene and not the late King of Prussia, not to the great Prince of Conda, not even to Gustavus Adolphus. Turenne seems to have approached the nearest to it, but several different transactions of his life sufficiently demonstrate that it was him by no means so perfect as the great Duke of Marlborough. In the humble project of private life, as well as the ambitious and proud pursuit of high stations, great abilities and successful enterprise, in the beginning, have frequently encouraged to undertakings which necessarily led to bankruptcy and ruin in the end. The esteem and admiration which every impartial spectator conceives for the real merit of those spirited, magnanimous, and high-minded persons, as it is a just and well-founded sentiment, so it is a steady and permanent one, and altogether independent of their good or bad fortune. It is otherwise with that admiration which he is apt to conceive for their excessive self-estimation and presumption. While they are successful, indeed, he is often perfectly conquered and overborne by them. Successful covers from his eyes not only the great imprudence, but frequently the great injustice of their enterprise, and, far from blaming of this defective part of their character, he often views it with the most enthusiastic admiration. When they are unfortunate, however, things change their colors and their names. What was before heroic magnanimity resumes its proper appellation of extravagant rashness and folly, and the blackness of that avidity and injustice, which was before hid under the splendor of prosperity, comes full into view and blots the whole luster of their enterprise. Had Caesar, instead of gaining, lost the battle of Pharsalia, his character would, at this hour, have ranked a little above that of Catiline, and the weakest man would have viewed his enterprise against the laws of his country in blacker colors than, perhaps even Cato, with all the animosity of a party man, ever viewed it at that time. His real merit, the justness of the taste, the simplicity and eloquence of his writings, the propriety of his eloquence, his skill in war, his resources in distress, his cool and sedate judgment in danger, his faithful attachment to his friends, his unexampled generosity to his enemies, would all have been acknowledged as the real merit of Catiline, who had many great qualities, 
is acknowledged at this day, but the insolence and injustice of his all grasping ambition would have darkened and extinguished the glory of all that real merit. Fortune has, in this, as well as in some other respects, already mentioned great influence over the moral sentiments of mankind, and according as she is either favorable or adverse, can render the same character the object, either of general love and admiration, or of universal hatred and contempt. This great disorder in our moral sentiments is by no means, however, without its utility, and we may, on this, as well as many other occasions, admire the wisdom of God, even in the weakness and folly of man. Our admiration of success is founded upon the same principle with our respect for wealth and greatness, and is equally necessary for establishing the distinction of ranks and the order of society. By this admiration of success, we are taught to submit more easily to those superiors whom the course of human affairs may assign to us, to regard with reverence and sometimes even with a sort of respectful affection that fortunate violence which we are no longer capable of resisting, not only the violence of such splendid characters as those of a Caesar or an Alexander, but often that the most brutal and savage barbarians of Attila or Genghis or Tamerlane, to all such mighty conquerors, the great mob of mankind are naturally disposed to look up with a wondering, though no doubt, with a very weak and foolish admiration. By this admiration, however, they are taught to acquiesce with less reluctance under that government which an irresistible force imposes upon them, and from which no reluctance could deliver them. Though in prosperity, however, the man of excessive self-estimation may sometimes appear to have some advantage over the man of correct and modest virtue. Though the applause of the multitude, and those who see them, both only at a distance, is often much louder in favor of the one than it is ever in favor of the other, yet all things fairly computed, the real balance of advantage is perhaps, in all cases, greatly in favor of the latter and against the former. The man who neither ascribes to himself, nor wishes that other people should ascribe to him any other merit besides that which really belongs to him, fears no humiliation, dreads no detection, but rests contented and secure upon the genuine truth and solidity of his own character. His admirers may neither be very numerous nor very loud in their applauses, but the wisest man who sees them the nearest, and who knows him the best, admires him the most. To a real wise man, that judicious and well-weighed approbation of a single wise man gives more heartfelt satisfaction than all the noisy applauses of ten thousand ignorant, though enthusiastic, admirers. He may say with Parmenides, who, upon reading a philosophical discourse before a public assembly at Athens, and observing that except Plato, the whole company had left him, continued notwithstanding to read on, and said that Plato alone was audience sufficient for him. It is otherwise with the man of excessive self-estimation, the wise men who see him the nearest and admire him the least, amidst the intoxication of prosperity, their sober and just esteem falls so short of the extravagance of his own self-admiration that he regards it with mere malignity and envy. He suspects his best friends, the company becomes offensive to him. He drives them from his presence and often rewards their services not only with ingratitude, but with cruelty and injustice. He abandons his confidence to flatterers and traitors, who pretend to idolize his vanity and presumption, and that character which in the beginning, though in some respects defective, was upon the whole both amiable and respectable, becomes contemptible and odious in the end. Amidst the intoxication of prosperity, Alexander killed Clytus, for having preferred the exploits of his father Philip to his own put Calisthenes to death in torture for having refused to adore him in the Persian manner, and murdered the great friend of his father, the venerable Parmenio, after having upon the most groundless suspicions sent first to the torture and afterwards to the scaffold, the only remaining son of that old man, the rest having all before died in his own service. This was that Parmenio of whom Philip used to say that the Athenians were very fortunate who could find ten generals every year, while he himself in the whole course of his life, could never find one but Parmenio. It was upon the vigilance and attention of this Parmenio that he reposed at all times with confidence and security, and in his hours of mirth and jollity. 
used to say, "Let us drink, my friends; we may do it with safety, for Parmenio never drinks." It was this same Parmenio with whose presence and counsel, it has been said, Alexander had gained all his victories, and without whose presence and counsel he had never gained a single victory. The humble, admiring, and flattering friends whom Alexander left in power and authority behind him divided his empire among themselves, and after having thus robbed his family and kindred of their inheritance, put one after another, every single surviving individual of them, whether male or female, to death. We frequently not only pardon, but thoroughly enter into and sympathize with the excessive self-estimation of those splendid characters in which we observe a great and distinguished superiority above the common level of mankind. We call them spirited, magnanimous, and high-minded words, which all involve their meaning and considerable degree of praise and admiration. But we cannot enter into and sympathize with the excessive self-estimation of those characters in which we can discern no such distinguished superiority. We are disgusted and revolted by it, and it is with some difficulty that we can either pardon or suffer it. We call it pride or vanity, two words of which the latter always, and the former for the most part, involve in their meaning a considerable degree of blame. Those two vices, however, though resembling in some respects as being both modifications of excessive self-estimation, are yet, in many respects, very different from one another. The proud man is sincere, and, in the bottom of his heart, is convinced of his own superiority, though it may sometimes be difficult to guess upon what that conviction is founded, he wishes you to view him in no other light than that in which, when he places himself in your situation, he really views himself. He demands no more of you than what he thinks justice. If you appear not to respect him as he respects himself, he is more offended than mortified, and feels the same indignant resentment as if he had suffered a real injury. He does not even then, however, deign to explain the grounds of his own pretensions. He disdains to court your esteem. He affects even to despise it, and endeavors to maintain his assumed station, not so much by making you sensible of his superiority as of your own meanness. He seems to wish not so much to excite your esteem for himself as to mortify that for yourself. The vain man is not sincere, and, in the bottom of his heart, is very seldom convinced that the superiority which he wishes you to ascribe to him, he wishes you to view him in much more splendid colors than those in which, when he places himself in your situation, and supposes you know all that he knows, he can really view himself. When you appear to him, therefore, in different colors, perhaps, in the proper colors, he is more mortified than offended. The grounds of his claims to that character which he wishes you to ascribe to him he takes every opportunity of displaying both by the most ostentatious and unnecessary exhibition of the good qualities and accomplishments which he possesses in some tolerable degree and sometimes even by false pretensions to those which he either possesses in no degree or in so very slender a degree that he may well enough be said to possess them in no degree far from despising your esteem he courts it with the most anxious assiduity, far from wishing to mortify your self-estimation, he is happy to cherish it, in hopes that in return you will cherish his own. He flatters in order to be flattered, he studies to please and endeavors to bribe you into a good opinion of him by politeness and complaisance, and sometimes even by real and essential good offices, though often displayed, perhaps, with unnecessary ostentation. The vain man sees the respect which is paid to rank and fortune, and wishes to usurp this respect, as well as that for talents and virtues. His dress, his equipage, his way of living, accordingly all announce both a higher rank and a greater fortune than really belong to him. And in order to support this foolish imposition, for a few years in the beginning of his life, he often reduces himself to poverty and distress long before the end of it. As long as he can continue this expense, however, his vanity is delighted with viewing himself not in the light in which you would view him if he knew all that he knows, but in that in which he imagines he has, by his own address, induced you actually to view him. Of all the illusions of vanity, this is, perhaps, the most common. Obscure strangers who visit foreign countries, or who, from a remote province, come to visit for a short time the capital of their own country, most frequently attempt to practice it. 
The folly of the attempt, though always very great and most unworthy of a man of sense, may not be altogether so great upon such as upon most other occasions. If their stay is short, they may escape any disgraceful detection, and after indulging their vanity for a few months or a few years, they may return to their own homes, and repair, by future parsimony, the waste of their past profusion. The proud man can very seldom be accused of this folly. His sense of his own dignity renders him careful to preserve his independency, and, when his fortune happens not to be large, though he wishes to be decent, he studies to be frugal and attentive in all his expenses. The ostentatious expense of the vain man is highly offensive to him. It outshines, perhaps, his own. It provokes his indignation as an insolent assumption of a rank, which is by no means due, and he never talks of it without loading it with the harshest and severest reproaches. The proud man does not always feel himself at his ease in the company of his equals, and still less in that of his superiors. He cannot lay down his lofty pretensions and the countenance and conversation of such company overawe him so much that he dare not display them. He has recourse to humbler company, for which he has little respect, which he would not willingly choose, and which is by no means agreeable to him, that the inferiors, his flatterers, and dependents, he seldom visits his superiors, or, if he does, it is rather to show that he is entitled to live in such company than for any real satisfaction that he enjoys in it. It is as Lord Clarendon says of the Earl of Arundel that he sometimes went to court because he could there only find a greater man than himself, but that he went very seldom because he found a greater man than himself. It is quite otherwise with the vain man. He courts the company of his superiors as much as the proud man shuns it. Their splendor, he seems to think, reflects a splendor upon those who are much about them. He haunts the courts of kings and the levies of ministers, and gives himself the air of being a candidate for future and preferment when in reality he possesses the much more precious happiness, if he knew how to enjoy it, of not being one. He is fond of being admitted to the tables of the great, and is still more fond of magnifying to other people the familiarity with which he is honored there. He associates himself, as much as he can, with fashionable people, with those who are supposed to direct the public opinion, with the witty, with the learned, with the popular, and he shuns the company of his best friends, whenever the uncertain current of public favor happens to run in any respect against them. With the people to whom he wishes to recommend himself, he is not always very delicate about the means which he employs for that purpose. Unnecessary ostentation, groundless pretensions, constant assentation, frequently flattery, though for the most part a pleasant and a sprightly flattery, and very seldom the gross and fulsome flattery of a parasite. The proud man, on the contrary, never flatters, and is frequently scarce civil to anybody. Notwithstanding its groundless pretensions, however, vanity is almost always a sprightly and a gay, and very often a good-natured passion. Pride is always a grave, a sullen, and a severe one. Even the falsehoods of the vain man are all innocent falsehoods, meant to raise himself, not to lower other people. To do the proud man justice, he very seldom stoops to the baseness of falsehood. When he does, however, his falsehoods are by no means so innocent. They are all mischievous and meant to lower other people. He is full of indignation at the unjust superiority, as he thinks it, which is given to them. He views them with malignity and envy, and in talking of them, often endeavors as much as he can to accentuate and lessen whatever the grounds upon which their superiority is supposed to be founded. Whatever tales are circulated to their disadvantage, though he seldom forges them himself, yet he often takes pleasure in believing them, is by no means unwilling to repeat them, and even sometimes, with some degree of exaggeration, the worst falsehoods of vanity are all what we call white lies. Those of pride, whenever it condescends to falsehood, are all of the opposite complexion. Our dislike to pride and vanity generally disposes us to rank the persons whom we accuse of those vices rather below than above the common level. In this judgment, however, I think we are most frequently in the wrong, and that both the proud and the vain man are often, perhaps for the most part, a good deal above it. 
though not near as much as either the one really thinks himself, or as the other wishes you would think him. If we compare them with our own pretensions, they may appear the just objects of contempt, but when we compare them with what the greater part of their rivals and competitors really are, they may appear quite otherwise, and very much above the common level, where there is this real superiority, pride is frequently attended with many respectable virtues, with truth, with integrity, with a high sense of honor, and cordial and steady friendship, with the most inflexible firmness and resolution. Vanity, with many amiable ones, with humanity, with politeness, with the desire to oblige in all little matters, and sometimes with a real generosity in great ones, a generosity, however, which it often wishes to display in the most splendid colors that it can. By their rivals and enemies, the French, in the last century, were accused of vanity, the Spaniards of pride, and foreign nations were disposed to consider the one as the more amiable, the other as the more respectable people. The words vain and vanity are never taken in a good sense. We sometimes say of a man, when we are talking of him in good humor, that he is the better for his vanity, or that his vanity is more diverting than offensive, but we still consider it as a foible and a ridicule in his character. The words proud and pride, on the contrary, are sometimes taken in good sense. We frequently say of a man that he is too proud, or that he has too much noble pride ever to suffer himself to do a mean thing. Pride is, in this case, confounded with magnanimity. Aristotle, a philosopher who certainly knew the world, in drawing the character of the magnanimous man, paints him with many features, which, in the last two centuries, were commonly ascribed to the Spanish character, that he was deliberate in all his resolutions, slow and even tardy in all his actions, his voice was grave, his speech deliberate, his step and motion slow, that he appeared indolent and even slothful, not at all disposed to bustle about little matters, but to act with the most determined and vigorous resolution upon all great and illustrious occasions, that he was not a lover of danger or forward to expose himself to little dangers, but to great dangers, and that, when he exposed himself to danger, he was altogether regardless of his life. The proud man is calmly too well contented with himself to think that his character requires any amendment. The man who feels himself all perfect, naturally enough despises all further improvement. His self-sufficiency and absurd conceit of his own superiority calmly attend him from his youth to his most advanced age, and he dies, as Hamlet says, with all his sins upon his head, unanointed, unannealed. It is frequently otherwise with the vain man, the desire of the esteem and admiration of other people, when for qualities and talents, which are the natural and proper objects of esteem and admiration, is the real love of true glory, a passion which, if not the very best passion of human nature, is certainly one of the best. Vanity is very frequently no more than an attempt prematurely to usurp thy glory before it is due. Though your son, under five and twenty years of age, should be but a coxcomb, do not upon that account despair of his becoming, before he is forty, a very wise and worthy man, and a real proficient in all those talents and virtues to which, at present, he may only be an ostentatious and empty pretender. The great secret of education is to direct vanity to proper objects, never suffer him to value himself upon trivial accomplishments, but do not always discourage his pretensions to those that are of real importance. He would not pretend to them if he did not earnestly desire to possess them. Encourage this desire, afford him every means to facilitate the acquisition, and do not take too much offense, although he should sometimes assume the air of having attained it a little before the time. Such, I say, are the distinguishing characters of pride and vanity, when each of them acts according to its proper character, but the proud man is often vain, and the vain man is often proud. Nothing can be more natural than the man, who thinks much more highly of himself than he deserves, should wish that other people should think still more highly of him, or that the man, who wishes that other people should think more highly of him than he thinks of himself, should, at the same time, think much more highly of himself than he deserves. Those two vices being frequently in the same character, the characteristics both are necessarily confounded, and we sometimes find the superficial and impertinent ostentation of vanity joined to the most malignant and derisive insolence of pride. 
we are sometimes upon that account at a loss how to rank a particular character or whether to place it among the proud or among the vain men of merit considerably above the common level sometimes underrate as well as overrate themselves such characters though not very dignified are often in private society far from being disagreeable his companions all feel themselves at their ease in the society of a man so perfectly modest and unassuming if those companions however have not more disconcernment and more generosity than ordinary though they may have some kindness for him they have seldom much respect and the warmth of their kindness is very seldom sufficient to compensate the coldness of their respect men of no more than ordinary discernment never rate any person higher than he appears to rate himself he seems doubtful himself they say whether he is perfectly fit for such a situation or such an office and immediately give the preference to some impudent blockhead who entertains no doubt about his own qualifications though they should have discernment yet if they want generosity they never fail to take advantage of his simplicity and to assume over him an impertinent superiority which they are by no means entitled to his good nature may enable him to bear this for some time but he grows weary at last and frequently when it is too late and when that rank which he ought to have assumed is lost irrecoverably and usurped in consequence of his own backwardness by some of his more forward though much less meritorious companions a man of this character must have been very fortunate in the early choice of his companions if in going through the world he meets always with fair justice even from those of his own past kindness he might have some reason to consider as his best friends and a youth too unassuming and too unambitious is frequently followed by an insignificant complaining and discontented old age those unfortunate persons whom nature has formed a good deal below the common level seem sometimes to rate themselves still more below it than what they really are this humility appears sometimes to sink them into idiotism whoever has taken the trouble to examine idiots with attention will find that in many of them the faculties of the understanding are by no means weaker than in several other people who though acknowledged to be dull and stupid are not by anybody accounted idiots many idiots with no more than ordinary education have been taught to read write and account tolerably well many persons never accounted idiots notwithstanding the most careful education and notwithstanding that in their advanced age they have had spirit enough to attempt to learn what their early education had not taught them have never been able to acquire in any tolerable degree any one of those three accomplishments by an instinct of pride however they set themselves upon a level with their equals in age and situation and with courage and firmness maintain their proper station among their companions by an opposite instinct the idiot feels himself below every company into which you can introduce him ill usage to which he is extremely liable is capable of throwing him into the most violent fits of rage and fury but no good usage no kindness or indulgence can ever raise him to converse with you as your equal if you can bring him to converse with you at all however you will frequently find his answer sufficiently pertinent and even sensible but they are always stamped with a distinct consciousness of his own great inferiority he seems to shrink and as it were to retire from your look and conversation and to feel when he places himself in your situation notwithstanding your apparent condescension you cannot help considering him as immensely below you some idiots perhaps the greater part seem to be so chiefly or altogether from a certain numbness or torpidity in the faculties of the understanding but there are others and those whose faculties do not appear more torpid or benumbed than in any other people who are not accounted idiots but that instinct of pride necessary to support them upon an equality of their brethren seems totally wanting in the former and not in the latter the degree of self-estimation therefore which contributes the most to the happiness and contentment of the person himself seems likewise most agreeable to the impartial spectator the man who esteems himself as he ought and no more than he ought seldom fails to obtain from other people all the esteem that he himself thinks due he desires no more than is due to him and he rests upon it with complete satisfaction the proud and vain man on the contrary is constantly dissatisfied 
the one is tormented with indignation at the unjust superiority, as he thinks it, of other people. The other is in continual dread of the shame which he foresees, would attend upon the detection of his groundless pretensions, even the extravagant pretensions of the man of real magnanimity, though when supported by splendid abilities and virtues, and above all by good fortune, they impose upon the multitude whose applause he little regards, do not impose them upon those wise men whose approbation he can only value, and whose esteem he is most anxious to acquire. He feels that they see through, and suspects that they despise his excessive presumption, and he often suffers the cruel misfortune of becoming first the jealous and secret and at last the open, furious, and vindictive enemy of those very persons, whose friendship it would have given him the greatest happiness to enjoy with unsuspicious security. Though our dislike to the proud and the vain often disposes us to rank them rather below than above their proper station, yet unless we are provoked by some particular and personal impertinence, we very seldom venture to use them ill. In common cases, we endeavor for our own ease rather to acquiesce and as well as we can, to accommodate ourselves to their folly. But to the man who underrates himself, unless we have both more discernment and more generosity than belong to the greater part of men, we seldom fail to do, at least all the injustice which he does not himself, and frequently a great deal more. He is not only more unhappy with his own feelings than either the proud or the vain, but he is much more liable to every sort of ill usage from other people, in almost all cases, it is better to be a little too proud than, in any respect, too humble. And in the sentiment of self-estimation, some degree of excess seems both to the person and to the impartial spectator to be less disagreeable than any degree of defect. In this, therefore, as well as in every other emotion, passion and habit, the degree that is most agreeable to the impartial spectator is likewise most agreeable to the person himself, and according as either the excess or the defect is least offensive to the former, so either the one or the other is in proportion least disagreeable to the latter. Conclusion of the sixth part. Concern for our own happiness recommends to us the virtue of prudence, concern for that of other people, the virtues of justice and beneficence, of which the one restrains us from hurting, the other prompts us to promote that happiness. Independent of any regard, either to what are or to what ought to be, or to what upon a certain condition would be the sentiments of other people. The first of those three virtues is originally recommended to us by our selfish, the other two by our benevolent affections. Regard to the sentiments of other people, however, comes afterwards both to enforce and to direct the practice of all those virtues, and no man during either the whole of his life or that of any considerable part of it ever trod steadily and uniformly in the paths of prudence, of justice, or of proper beneficence, whose conduct was not principally directed by regard to the sentiments of the supposed impartial spectator, of the great inmate of the breast, the great judge and arbiter of conduct. If in the course of the day we have swerved in any respect from the rules which he prescribes to us, if we have either exceeded or relaxed our frugality, if we have either exceeded or relaxed our industry, if through passion or inadvertency we have hurt in any respect the interest or happiness of our neighbor, if we have neglected a plain and proper opportunity of promoting that interest and happiness, it is this inmate who, in the evening, calls us to an account for all those omissions and violations, and his reproaches often make us blush inwardly, both for our folly and our inattention to our own happiness, and for our still greater indifference and inattention, perhaps, to that of other people. But though the virtues of prudence, justice, and beneficence may, upon different occasions, be recommended to us almost equally by two different principles, those of self-command are, upon most occasions, principally and almost entirely recommended to us by one, by the sense of propriety, by regard to the sentiments of the supposed impartial spectator, without the restraint which this principle imposes every passion, would, upon most occasions, rush headlong and, if I may say so, to its own gratification. Anger would follow the suggestions of its own fury, fear those of its own violent agitations. Regard to no time or place would induce vanity to refrain from the loudest and most impertinent ostentation or voluptuousness, from the most open, 
indecent, and scandalous indulgence. Regard for what are, or for what ought to be, or for what upon a certain condition would be, the sentiments of other people, is the sole principle which, upon most occasions, overawes all those mutinous and turbulent passions which the tone and temper which the impartial spectator can enter into and sympathize with. Upon some occasions, indeed, those passions are restrained, not so much by a sense of their impropriety as much as their prudential considerations of the bad consequences which might follow from their indulgence. In such cases, the passions, though restrained, are not always subdued, but often remain lurking in the breast with all their original fury. The man whose anger is restrained by fear does not always lay aside his anger, but only reserves its gratification for a more safe opportunity. But the man who, in relating to some other person the injury which has been done to him, feels at once the fury of his passion, cooled and becalmed by sympathy with the more moderate sentiments of his companion, who at once adopts more moderate sentiments and comes to view that injury not in the black and atrocious colors in which he had originally beheld it, but in the much milder and fairer light in which his companion naturally views it, not only restrains, but in some measure subdues his anger. The passion becomes really less than it was before, and less capable of exciting him to the violent and bloody revenge, which at first, perhaps, he might have thought of inflicting. Those passions which are restrained by the sense of propriety are all in some degree moderated and subdued by it, but those which are restrained only by prudential considerations of any kind are on the contrary frequently inflamed by the restraint, and sometimes, long after the provocation given, and when nobody is thinking about it, burst out absurdly and unexpectedly, and with tenfold fury and violence. Anger, however, as well as every other passion, may upon many occasions be very properly restrained by prudential considerations. Some exertion of manhood and self-command is even necessary for the sort of restraint, and the impartial spectator may sometimes view it with that sort of cold esteem due to the species of conduct, which he considers as a mere matter of vulgar prudence, but never with that affectionate admiration with which he surveys the same passions, when by the sense of propriety they are moderated and subdued to what he himself can readily enter into. In the former species of restraint, he may frequently discern some degree of propriety, and, if you will, even of virtue, but it is a propriety and virtue of a much inferior order to those which he always feels with transport and admiration in the latter. The virtues of prudence, justice, and beneficence have no tendency to produce any but the most agreeable effects. Regard to those effects, as it originally recommends to the actor, so does it afterwards to the impartial spectator in our approbation of the character of the prudent man, we feel with peculiar complacency the security which he must enjoy while he walks under the safeguard of that sedate and deliberate virtue. In our approbation of the character of the just man, we feel with equal complacency the security which all those connected with him, whether in neighborhood, society, or business, must derive from his scrupulous anxiety never either to hurt or offend. In our approbation of the character of the beneficent man, we enter into the gratitude of all those who are within the sphere of his good offices and conceive with them the highest sense of his merit. In our approbation of all those virtues, our sense of their agreeable effects of their utility, either to the person who exercises them or to some other persons, joins with our sense of their propriety and constitutes a way a considerable frequently the greater part of that approbation. But in our approbation, the virtues of self-command, complacency, and their effects sometimes constitute no part, and frequently but a small part, of that approbation. Those effects may sometimes be agreeable, and sometimes disagreeable. And though our approbation is no doubt stronger in the former case, it is by no means altogether destroyed in the latter. The most heroic valor may be employed indifferently in the cause either of justice or injustice, and though it is no doubt much more loved than admired in the former case, it still appears a great and respectable quality even in the latter. In that, and in all other virtues of self-command, the splendid and dazzling quality seems always to be the greatness and steadiness of the exertion, and the strong sense of propriety which is necessary in order to make 
and to maintain that exertion. The effects are too often but too little regarded. Part 7 of the Systems of Moral Philosophy Section 1 of the questions which ought to be examined in a theory of moral sentiments. If we examine the most celebrated and remarkable of the different theories which have been given concerning the nature and origin of our moral sentiments, we shall find that almost all of them coincide with some part or other of that which I have been endeavouring to give an account of. And, if everything which has already been said be fully considered, we shall be at no loss to explain what was the view or aspect of nature which led each particular author to form his particular system. From some one or other of those principles which I have been endeavouring to unfold, every system of morality that ever had any reputation in the world has, perhaps, ultimately been derived, as they are all of them, in this respect, founded upon natural principles, they are all of them in some measure in the right. But as many of them are derived from a partial and imperfect view of nature, there are many of them, too, in some respects, in the wrong. In treating of the principles of morals, there are two questions to be considered. First, wherein does virtue consist, or what is the tone of temper and tenor of conduct, which constitutes the excellent and praiseworthy character? the character which is the natural object of esteem, honor, and approbation. And secondly, by what power or faculty in the mind is it, and this character, whatever it be, is recommended to us, or in other words, how and by what means does it come to pass that the mind prefers one tenor of conduct to another, denominates the one right and the other wrong, considers the one as the object of approbation, honor, and reward, and the other of blame, censure, and punishment. We examine the first question, whether we consider whether virtue consists in benevolence, as Dr. Hutchinson imagines, or in acting suitably to the different relations we stand in, as Dr. Clark supposes, or in the wise and prudent pursuit of our own real and solid happiness, as has been the opinion of others. We examine the second question, whether we consider whether a virtuous character, whatever it consists in, be recommended to us by self-love, which makes us perceive that this character, both in ourselves and others, tends most to promote our own private interest, or by reason, which points out to us the difference between one character and another, in the same manner as it does that between truth and falsehood, or by peculiar power of perception, called a moral sense, which this virtuous character gratifies and pleases, as the contrary disgusts and displeases it or last of all, by some other principle in human nature, such as a modification of sympathy or the like. I shall begin with considering the systems which have been formed concerning the first of these questions, and shall proceed afterwards to examine those concerning the second. Section 2 of the different accounts which have been given of the nature of virtue. Introduction the different accounts which have been given of the nature of virtue or of the temper of mind which constitutes the excellent and praiseworthy character may be reduced to three different classes. According to some, the virtuous temper of mind does not consist in any one species of affections, but in the proper government and direction of all our affections, which may be either virtuous or vicious according to the objects which they pursue and the degree of vehemence with which they pursue them. According to these authors, therefore, virtue consists in propriety. According to others, virtue consists in the judicious pursuit of our own private interest and happiness, or in the proper government and direction of those selfish affections which aim solely at this end. In the opinion of these authors, therefore, virtue consists in prudence. Another set of authors make virtue consist in those affections only which aim at the happiness of others, not in those which aim at our own. According to them, therefore, Disinterested benevolence is the only motive which can stamp upon any action the character of virtue. The character of virtue, it is evident, must either be ascribed indifferently to all our affections when under proper government and direction, or it must be confined to some one class or division of them. The great division of our affections is into the selfish and the benevolent. If the character of virtue, therefore, cannot be ascribed indifferently to all our affections, when, under the proper government and direction, it must be confined either to those which aim directly at our own private happiness, or to those which aim directly at that of others. If virtue, therefore, does not consist in propriety, 
it must consist either in prudence or in benevolence. Besides these three, it is scarce possible to imagine that any other account can be given of the nature of virtue. I shall endeavor to show hereafter how all the other accounts, which are seemingly different from any of these, coincide at bottom with some one or other of them. Chapter 1. Of those systems which make virtue consist in propriety. According to Plato, to Aristotle, and to Zeno, virtue consists in the propriety of conduct, or in that suitableness of the affection from which we act to the object which excites it. In the system of Plato, the soul is considered as something like a little state or republic, composed of three different faculties of four orders. The first is the judging faculty, the faculty which determines not only what are the proper means for attaining any end, but also what ends are fit to be pursued, and what degree of relative value we ought to put upon each. This faculty Plato called, as it is very properly called, reason, and considered it as what had a right to be the governing principle of the whole. Under this appellation, it is evident, he comprehended not only that the faculty by which we judge of truth and falsehood, but that by which we judge of their propriety or impropriety, of desires and affections. The different passions and appetites, the natural subjects of this ruling principle, but which are so apt to rebel against their master, he reduced to two different classes or orders. The first consisted of those passions which are founded in pride and resentment, or in what the schoolmen called the irascible part of the soul, ambition, animosity, the love of humor, and the dread of shame, the desire of victory, superiority, and revenge, all those passions, in short, which are supposed either to rise from or to denote what, by a metaphor, in our language we commonly call spirit or natural fire. The second consisted of those passions which are founded in the love of pleasure, or in what the schoolmen called the concusable part of the soul. It comprehended all the appetites of the body, the love of ease and security, and of all sensual gratifications. It rarely happens that we break it upon that plan of conduct which the governing principle prescribes, and which, all our cool hours, we have laid down to ourselves as what was most proper for us to pursue. But when prompted by one or other of those two different sets of passions, either by ungovernable ambition and resentment, or by the importunate solicitations of present ease and pleasure, but though these two orders of passions are so apt to mislead us, they are still considered as necessary parts of human nature, the first having been given to defend us against injuries, to assert our rank and dignity in the world, to make us aim at what is noble and honorable, and to make us distinguish those who act in the same manner, the second to provide the support and necessities of the body. In the strength, acuteness, and perfection of the governing principle was placed the essential virtue of prudence, which, according to Plato, consisted in a just and clear discernment, founded upon general and scientific ideas of the ends which were proper to be pursued and of the means which were proper for attaining them. When the first set of passions, those of the irascible part of the soul, had that degree of strength and firmness which enabled them, under the direction of reason, to despise all dangers in the pursuit of what was honorable and noble. It constituted the virtue of fortitude and magnanimity, this order of passions, according to this system, was of a more generous and noble nature than the other. They were considered upon many occasions as the auxiliaries of reason, to check and restrain the inferior and brutal appetites. We are often angry at ourselves, it was observed. We often become the objects of our own resentment and indignation. When the love of pleasure prompts to do what we disapprove of, and the irascible part of our nature is in this manner called in to assist the rational against the concupiscible. When all those three different parts of our nature were in perfect concord with one another, when neither the irascible nor concupiscible passions ever aimed at any gratification which reason did not approve of, and when reason never commanded anything but what these of their own accord were willing to perform, this happy composure, this perfect and complete harmony of soul, constituted that virtue which in their language is expressed by a word which we commonly translate temperance, but which might more properly be translated good temper, or sobriety and moderation of mind. Justice, the last and the greatest of the four cardinal virtues, took place, according to this system, 
when each of those three faculties of the mind confined itself to his proper office without attempting to encroach upon that of any other when reason directed and passion obeyed and when each passion performed its proper duty and exerted itself towards its proper object easily and without reluctance and with that degree of force and energy which was sustainable to the value of what it pursued in this consisted that complete virtue that perfect propriety of conduct which plato after some of the ancient pythagoreans denominated justice the word it is to be observed which expresses justice in the greek language has several different meanings and as the corresponding word in all other languages so far as i know has the same there must be some natural affinity among those various significations in one sense we are said to do justice to our neighbour when we abstain from doing him any positive harm and do not directly hurt him either in his person or in his estate or in his reputation this is that justice which i have treated of above the observance of which may be extorted by force and the violation of which exposes to punishment in another sense we are said not to do justice to our neighbour unless we conceive for him all that love respect and esteem which his character his situation and his connection with ourselves render suitable and proper for us to feel and unless we act accordingly it is this sense that we are said to do injustice to a man of merit who is connected with us that we abstain from hurting him in every respect if we do not exert ourselves to serve him and to place him in that situation in which the impartial spectator would be pleased to see him the first sense of the word coincides with what aristotle and the schoolmen call commutative justice and with what grotius calls eustitia expletrix which consists in abstaining from what is another's and in doing voluntarily whatever we can with propriety be forced to do the second sense of the word coincides with what some have called distributive justice and with the eustitia attributrix of grotius which consists in proper beneficence in the becoming use of what is our own and in applying it to those purposes either of charity or generosity to which the most suitable in our situation that it should be applied in this sense justice comprehends all the social virtues there is yet another sense in which the word justice is sometimes taken still more extensive than either of the former though very much akin to the last and which runs too so far as i know through all languages it is in the last sense that we are said to be unjust when we do not seem to value any particular object with that degree of esteem or to pursue it with that degree of ardor which to the impartial spectator it may appear to deserve or to be naturally fitted for exciting thus we are said to do injustice to a poem or a picture when we do not admire them enough and we are said to do them more than justice when we admire them too much in the same manner we are said to do injustice to ourselves when we appear not to give sufficient attention to any particular object of self-interest in this last sense what is called justice means the same thing with exact perfect propriety of conduct and behavior and comprehend in it not only the offices of both commutative and distributive justice but of every other virtue of prudence of fortitude of temperance it is in this last sense that plato evidently understands what he calls justice and which therefore according to him comprehends in it the perfection of every sort of virtue such is the account given by plato of the nature of virtue or of that temper of mind which is the proper object of praise and approbation it consists according to him in that state of mind in which every faculty confines itself within its proper sphere without encroaching upon that of any other and performs its proper office with that precise degree of strength and vigor which belongs to it his account it is evident coincides in every respect with what we have said above concerning the propriety of conduct virtue according to aristotle consists in the habit of mediocrity according to the right reason every particular virtue according to him lies in a kind of middle between two opposite vices of which the one offends from being too much and the other being too little affected by a particular species of objects thus the virtue of fortitude or courage lies in the middle between the opposite vices of cowardice and of presumptuous rashness of which the one offends from being too much 
and the other from being too little affected by the objects of fear. Thus, too, the virtue of frugality lies in the middle between avarice and profusion, of which the one consists in an excess and the other in a defect of the proper attention to the objects of self-interest. Magnanimity, in the same manner, lies in a middle between the excess of arrogance and the defect of pusillanimity, of which the one consists in too extravagant, the other in too weak a sentiment of our own worth and dignity. It is unnecessary to observe that this account of virtue corresponds too pretty exactly with what has been said above concerning the propriety and impropriety of conduct. According to Aristotle, indeed, virtue did not so much consist in those moderate and right affections, as in the habit of this moderation. In order to understand this, it is to be observed that virtue may be considered either as the quality of an action or as the quality of a person. Considered as the quality of an action, it consists, even according to Aristotle, in the reasonable moderation of the affection from which the action proceeds, whether this disposition be habitual to the person or not. Considered as the quality of a person, it consists in the habit of this reasonable moderation, in his having become the customary and usual disposition of the mind. Thus the action which proceeds from an occasional fit of generosity is undoubtedly a generous action, but the man who performs it is not necessarily a generous person, because it may be the single action of the kind which he ever performed. The motive and disposition of heart from which this action was performed may have been quite just and proper, but as this happy mood seems to have been the effect rather of accidental humor than of anything steady or permanent in the character, it can reflect no great honor on the performer. When we denominate a character generous or charitable or virtuous in any respect, we mean to signify that the disposition expressed by each of those appellations is the usual and customary disposition of the person, but single actions of any kind, how proper and suitable soever, are of little consequence to show that this is the case. If a single action was sufficient to stamp the character of any virtue upon the person who performed it, the most worthless of mankind might lay claim to all the virtues, since there is no man who has not, upon some occasions, acted with prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. But those single actions, how laudable soever, reflect very little praise upon the person who performs them. A single vicious action performed by one whose conduct is usually very regular greatly diminishes and sometimes destroys altogether our opinion of his virtue. A single action of this kind sufficiently shows that his habits are not perfect, and that he is less to be depended upon than from the usual train of his behavior. We might have been apt to imagine. Aristotle, too, when he made virtue to consist in practical habits, had it probably in his view to oppose the doctrine of Plato, to seems to have been of opinion that just sentiments and reasonable judgments concerning what was fit to be done or to be avoided were alone sufficient to constitute the most perfect virtue. Virtue, according to Plato, might be considered as a species of science, and no man, he thought, could see clearly and demonstratively what was right and what was wrong, and not act accordingly. Passion might make us act contrary to doubtful and uncertain opinions, not to plain and evident judgments. Aristotle, on the contrary, was of opinion that no conviction of the understanding was capable of getting the better of inveterate habits, and that good morals arose not from knowledge, but from action. According to Zeno, the founder of the Stoical doctrine, every animal was by nature recommended to its own care and was endowed with the principle of self-love, that it might endeavor to preserve not only its existence, but all the different parts of its nature in the best and most perfect state of which they were capable. The self-love of man embraced, if I may say so, his body and all its different members, his mind and all its different faculties and powers, and desired the preservation and maintenance of them all in their best and most perfect condition. Whatever tended to support this state of existence was, therefore, by nature pointed out to him as fit to be chosen, and whatever tended to destroy it as fit to be rejected. Thus health, strength, agility, and ease of body, as well as the eternal conveniencies which could promote these, wealth, power, honors, 
the respect and esteem of those we live with were naturally pointed out to us as things eligible and of which the possessions was preferable to the want on the other hand sickness infirmity unwillingness pain of body as well as the eternal inconveniencies which tend to occasion or bring on any of them poverty the want of authority the contempt or hatred of those we live with were in the same manner pointed out to us as things to be shunned and avoided in each of those two opposite classes of objects there were some which appeared to be more the objects either of choice or rejection than others in the same class thus in the first class health appeared evidently preferable to strength and strength to agility reputation to power and power to riches and thus too in the second class sickness was more to be avoided than unwieldiness of body ignominy than poverty and poverty than the loss of power virtue and the propriety of conduct consisted in choosing and rejecting all different objects and circumstances according as they were by nature rendered more or less the objects of choice or rejection in selecting always from among the several objects of choice presented to us that which was most to be chosen when we could not obtain them and in selecting too out of the several objects of rejection offered to us that which was least to be avoided when it was not in our power to avoid them all by choosing and rejecting with this just and accurate discernment by thus bestowing upon every object the precise degree of attention it deserved according to the place which it held in this natural scale of things we maintained according to the stoics that perfect rectitude of conduct which constituted the essence of virtue this was what they called to live consistently to live according to nature and to obey those laws and directions which nature or the author of nature had prescribed to our conduct so far the stoical idea of propriety and virtue is not very different from that of aristotle and the ancient peripatetics among those primary objects which nature had recommended to us as eligible was the prosperity of our family of our relations of our friends of our country of mankind and the universe in general nature too had taught us that the prosperity of two was preferable to that of one that of many or of all must be infinitely more so that we ourselves were but one and that consequently wherever our prosperity was inconsistent with that either of the whole or of any considerable part of the whole it ought even in our own choice to yield to what was so vastly preferable as all the events in this world were conducted by the providence of a wise powerful and good god we might be assured that whatever happened tended to the prosperity and perfection of the whole if we ourselves therefore were in poverty in sickness or in any other calamity we ought first of all to use our utmost endeavors so far as justice and our duty to others would allow to rescue ourselves from this disagreeable circumstance but if after all we could do we found this impossible we ought to rest satisfied that the order and perfection of the universe required that we should in the meantime continue in this situation and as the prosperity of the whole should even to us appear preferable to so insignificant a part as ourselves our situation whatever it was ought from that moment to become the object of our liking if we would maintain that complete propriety and rectitude of sentiment and conduct in which consisted the perfection of our nature if indeed any opportunity of extricating ourselves should offer it became our duty to embrace it the order of the universe it was evident no longer required our continuance in this situation and the great director of the world plainly called upon us to leave it by so clearly pointing out the road which we were to follow it was the same case with the adversity of our relations our friends our country if without violating any more sacred obligation it was in our power to prevent or put an end to their calamity it undoubtedly was our duty to do so the propriety of action the rule which jupiter had given us for the direction of our conduct evidently required this of us but if it was altogether out of our power to do either we ought then to consider this event as the most fortunate which could possibly have happened because we might be assured that it tended most to the prosperity and order of the whole 
which was what we ourselves, if we were wise and equitable, ought most of all to desire. It was our own final interest, considered as a part of that whole, of which the prosperity ought to be, not only the principal, but the sole object of our desire. In what sense, says Epictetus, are some things said to be according to our nature, and others contrary to it? It is in that sense in which we consider ourselves as separated and detached from all other things. For thus it may be said, to be according to the nature of the foot, to be always clean. But if you consider it as a foot, and not as something detached from the rest of the body, it must behove it sometimes to trample in the dirt, and sometimes to tread upon thorns, and sometimes to be cut off for the sake of the whole body. And if it refuses this, it is no longer a foot. Thus too ought we to conceive with regard to ourselves. What are you, a man, if you consider yourself as something separated and detached? It is agreeable to your nature to live to old age, to be rich, to be in health. But if you consider yourself as a man, and as a part of a whole, upon account of that whole, it will behove you sometimes to be in sickness, sometimes to be exposed to the inconveniency of a sea voyage, sometimes to be in want, and at last, perhaps, to die before your time. Why then do you complain? Do you not know that by doing so, as the foot ceases to be a foot, so you cease to be a man? A wise man never complains of the destiny of providence, nor thinks the universe in confusion when he is out of order. He does not look upon himself as a whole, separated and detached from every other part of nature, to be taken care of by itself and for itself. He regards himself in the light in which he imagines the great genius of human nature and of the world regards him. He enters, if I may say so, into the sentiments of that divine being and considers himself as an atom, a particle of an immense and infinite system, which must and ought to be disposed of, according to the conveniency of the whole. Assured of the wisdom which directs all the events of human life, whatever lot befalls him, he accepts it with joy, satisfied that if he had known all the connections and dependencies of the different parts of the universe, it is the very lot which he himself would have wished for. If it is life, he is contented to live. If it is death, as nature must have no further occasion for his presence here, he willingly goes where he is appointed. I accept, said a cynical philosopher, whose doctrines were in this respect the same as those of the Stoics. I accept, with equal joy and satisfaction, whatever fortune can befall me. Riches or poverty, pleasure or pain, health or sickness, all is alike nor would I desire that the gods should, in any respect, change my destination. If I was to ask of them anything beyond what their bounty has already bestowed, it should be that they would inform me beforehand what it is their pleasure should be done with me, that I might, of my own accord, place myself in this situation, and demonstrate the cheerfulness with which I embrace their allotment. If I am going to sail, says Epictetus, I choose the best ship and the best pilot, and I wait for the fairest weather that my circumstances and duty will allow. Prudence and propriety, the principles which the gods have given me for the direction of my conduct, require this of me, but they require no more, and if, notwithstanding, a storm arises which neither the strength of the vessel nor the skill of the pilot are likely to withstand, I give myself no trouble about the consequence. All that I had to do is done already. The directors of my conduct never command me to be miserable, to be anxious, desponding, or afraid. Whether we are to be drowned or to come to a harbor is the business of Jupiter, not mine. I leave it entirely to his determination, nor even break my rest with considering which way he is likely to decide it, but receive whatever comes with equal indifference and security. From this perfect confidence in that benevolent wisdom which governs the universe, and from this entire resignation to whatever order that wisdom might think proper to establish, it necessarily followed, to the stoical wise man, all the events of human life must be in a great measure indifferent. His happiness consisted altogether, first in the contemplation of the happiness and perfection of the great system of the universe, 
of the good government of the great republic of gods and men, of all rational and sensible beings, and, secondly, in discharging his duty, in acting properly in the affairs of this great republic, whatever little part that wisdom had assigned to him. The propriety or impropriety of his endeavors might be of great consequence to him. Their success or disappointment could be of none at all, could excite no passionate joy or sorrow, no passionate desire or aversion. If he preferred some events to others, if some situations were the objects of his choice and others his rejection, it was not because he regarded the one as in themselves in any respects better than the other, or thought that his own happiness would be more complete in what is called the fortunate than in what is regarded as the distressful situation. But because the propriety of action, the rule which the gods had given him for the direction of his conduct, required him to choose and reject in this manner. All the affections were absorbed and swallowed up in two great affections, in that for the discharge of his own duty, and in that for the greatest possible happiness of all rational and sensible beings. For the gratification of this latter affection, he rested with the most perfect security upon the wisdom and power of the great superintendent of the universe. His sole anxiety was about the gratification of the former, not about the event, but about the propriety of his own endeavors. Whatever the event might be, he trusted to a superior power and wisdom for turning it to promote that great end, which he himself was most desirous of promoting. The propriety of choosing and rejecting, though originally pointed out to us, and as it were recommended and introduced to our acquaintance, by the things, and for the sake of the things, chosen and rejected, yet when we had once become thoroughly acquainted with it, the order, the grace, the beauty, which we discerned in this conduct, the happiness which we felt resulted from it, necessarily appeared to us of much greater value than the actual obtaining of all the different objects of choice, or the actual avoiding of all those of rejection. From the observation of this propriety arose the happiness and glory from the neglect of it, the misery and the disgrace of human nature. But to a wise man, to one whose passions were brought under perfect subjection to the ruling principles of his nature, the exact observation of this propriety was equally easy upon all occasions. Was he in prosperity, he returned thanks to Jupiter for having joined him with circumstances which were easily mastered, and in which there was little temptation to do wrong. Was he in adversity, he equally returned thanks to the director of the spectacle of human life, for having opposed to him a vigorous athlete, over whom, though the contest was likely to be more violent, the victory was more glorious, and equally certain. Can there be any shame in that distress which is brought upon us without any fault of our own, and in which we behave with perfect propriety? There can, therefore, be no evil but, on the contrary, the greatest good and advantage. A brave man exults in those dangers in which, from no rashness of his own, his fortune has involved him. They afford an opportunity of exercising that heroic intrepidity whose exertion gives the exalted delight which flows from the consciousness of superior propriety and deserved admiration. One who is master of all his exercises has no aversion to measure his strength and activity with the strongest. And, in the same manner, one who is master of all his passions does not dread any circumstance in which the superintendent of the universe may think proper to place him. The bounty of that divine being has provided him with the virtues which render him superior to every situation. If it is pleasure, he has temperance to refrain from it. If it is pain, he has constancy to bear it. If it is death or danger, he has magnanimity and fortitude to despise it. The events of human life can never find him unprepared, or at a loss how to maintain that propriety of sentiment and conduct, which, in his own apprehension, constitutes at once his glory and his happiness. Human life the Stoics appear to have considered as a game of great skill, in which, however, there was a mixture of chance, or of what is vulgarly understood to be chance. In such games, the stake is commonly a trifle, and the whole pleasure of the game arises from playing well, from playing fairly, from playing skillfully. If notwithstanding all his skill, however, the good player should, by the influence of chance, 
happened to lose, the loss ought to be a matter rather of merriment than of serious sorrow. He has made no false stroke. He has done nothing which he ought to be ashamed of. He has enjoyed completely the whole pleasure of the game. If, on the contrary, the bad player, notwithstanding all his blunders, should in the same manner happen to win, his success can give him but little satisfaction. He is mortified by the remembrance of all the faults which he committed. Even during the play, he can enjoy no part of the pleasure which it is capable of affording. From ignorance of the rules of the game, fear and doubt and hesitation are the disagreeable sentiments that precede almost every stroke which he plays, and when he has played it, the mortification of finding it a gross blunder commonly completes the unpleasing circle of his sensations. Human life, with all the advantages which can possibly attend it, ought, according to the Stoics, to be regarded as a mere two-penny stake, a matter by far too insignificant to merit any anxious concern. Our only anxious concern ought to be not about the stake, but about the proper method of playing. If we placed our happiness in winning the stake, we placed it in what depended upon causes beyond our power and out of our direction. We necessarily exposed ourselves to perpetual fear and uneasiness, and frequently to grievous and mortifying disappointments. If we placed it in playing well, in playing fairly, in playing wisely and skillfully, the propriety of our own conduct in short, we placed it in what, by proper discipline, education and attention, might be altogether in our own power, and under our own direction, our happiness was perfectly secure and beyond the reach of fortune. The event of our actions, if it was out of our power, was equally out of our concern, and we could never feel either fear or anxiety about it, nor ever suffer any grievous or any serious disappointment. Human life itself, as well as every different advantage or disadvantage which can attend it, might, they said, according to different circumstances, be the proper object either of our choice or of our rejection. If, in our actual situation, there were more circumstances agreeable to nature than contrary to it, more circumstances which were the objects of choice than of rejection, life, in this case, was, upon the whole, the proper object of choice, and the propriety of conduct, and the propriety of conduct required that we should remain in it. If, on the other hand, there were, in our actual situation, without any probable hope of amendment, more circumstances contrary to nature than agreeable to it, more circumstances which were the object of rejection than of choice, life itself, in this case, became a wise man. The object of rejection, and he was not only at liberty to remove out of it, but the propriety of conduct, the rule which the gods had given him for the direction of his conduct, required him to do so. I am ordered, says Epictetus, not to dwell at Nicopolis. I do not dwell there. I am ordered not to dwell at Athens. I do not dwell at Athens. I am ordered not to dwell in Rome. I do not dwell in Rome. I am ordered to dwell in the little and rocky island of Geray. I go and dwell there, but the house smokes in Geray. If the smoke is moderate, I will bear it, and stay there. If it is excessive, I will go to a house from whence no tyrant can remove me. I keep in mind always that the door is open, that I can walk out when I please, and retire to that hospitable house, which is at all times open to all the world. For beyond my uttermost garment, beyond my body, no man living has any power over me. If your situation is upon the whole disagreeable, if your house smokes too much for you, said the Stoics, walk forth by all means, but walk forth without repenting, without murmuring or complaining. Walk forth calm, contented, rejoicing, returning thanks to the gods, who, from their infinite bounty, have opened the safe and quiet harbor of death, at all times ready to receive us from the stormy ocean of human life, who have prepared this sacred, this inviolable, this great asylum, always open, always accessible, altogether beyond the reach of human rage and injustice, and large enough to contain both all those who wish and all those who do not wish to retire to it. An asylum which takes away from every man every pretense of complaining, or even of fancying that there can be any evil in human life, except such as he may suffer from his own folly and weakness. The Stoics, 
in the few fragments of their philosophy which have come down to us sometimes talk of leaving life with a gaiety and even with a levity which were we to consider those passages by themselves might induce us to believe that they imagined we could with propriety leave it whenever we had a mind wantonly and capriciously upon the slightest disgust or uneasiness when you sup with a person says epictetus you complain of the long stories which he tells you about his misian wars now my friend says he having told you how i took possession of an eminence at such a place i will tell you how i was besieged in such another place but if you have a mind not to be troubled with his long stories do not accept of his supper if you accept of his supper you have not the least pretense to complain of his long stories it is the same case with what you call the evils of human life never complain of that of which it is at all times in your power to rid yourself notwithstanding this gaiety and even levity of expression however the alternative of leaving life or of remaining in it was according to the stoics a matter of the most serious and important deliberation we ought never to leave it till we are distinctly called upon to do so by that superintending power which had originally placed us in it but we were to consider ourselves as called upon to do so not merely at the appointed and unavoidable term of human life whenever that providence of that superintending power had rendered our condition in life upon the whole the proper object rather of rejection than of choice the great rule which he had given us for the direction of our conduct then required us to leave it we might then be said to hear the awful and benevolent voice of that divine being distinctly calling upon us to do so it was upon this account that according to the stoics it might be the duty of a wise man to remove out of life though he was perfectly happy while on the contrary it might be the duty of a weak man to remain in it though he was necessarily miserable if the situation of the wise man there were more circumstances which were the natural objects of the rejection than of choice the whole situation became the object of rejection and the rule which the gods had given him the direction of his conduct required that he should remove out of it as speedily as particular circumstances might render convenient he was however perfectly happy even during the time that he might think proper to remain in it he had placed his happiness not in obtaining the objects of his choice or in avoiding those of his rejection but in always choosing and rejecting in exact propriety not in the success but in the fitness of his endeavors and exertions if in the situation of the weak man on the contrary there were more circumstances which were the natural objects of choice than of rejection his whole situation became the proper object of choice and it was his duty to remain in it he was unhappy however from not knowing how to use those circumstances let his cards be ever so good he did not know how to play them he could not enjoy no sort of real satisfaction either in the progress or in the event of the game in whatever manner it might happen to turn out the propriety upon some occasions of voluntary death though it was perhaps more insisted upon the stoics than by any other sect of ancient philosophers was however a doctrine common to them all even to the peaceful and indolent epicureans during the age in which flourished the founders of all the principal sects of ancient philosophy during the peloponnesian war and for many years after its conclusion all the different republics of greece were at home almost always distracted by the most furious factions and abroad involved in the most sanguinary wars in which each sought not merely superiority or dominion but either completely to extirpate all its enemies or what was not less cruel to reduce them into the vilest of all states that of domestic slavery and sell them man woman and child like so many herds of cattle to the highest bidder in the market the smallness of the greatest part of those states too rendered it to each of them no very improbable event that it might itself fall into that very calamity which it had so frequently either perhaps actually inflicted or at least attempted to inflict upon some of its neighbors it is this disorderly state of things the most perfect innocence joined to both the highest rank and the greatest public services could give no security to any man that even at home and among his own relations and fellow-citizens he was not at some time or another 
from the prevalence of some hostile and furious faction to be condemned to the most cruel and ignominious punishment. If he was taken prisoner in war, or if the city in which he was a member was conquered, he was exposed, if possible, to still greater injuries and insults. But every man, naturally, or rather necessarily, familiarizes his imagination with the distresses to which he foresees that his situation may frequently expose him. It is impossible that a sailor should not frequently think of storms and shipwrecks and foundering at sea, and of how he himself is likely both to feel and to act upon such occasions. It was impossible, in the same manner, that a Grecian patriot or hero should not familiarize his imagination with all the different calamities to which he was sensible his situation must frequently or rather constantly expose him. As an American savage prepares his death song, and considers how he should act when he has fallen into the hands of his enemies, and is by them put to death in the most lingering tortures, and amidst the insults and derision of all the spectators, so a Grecian patriot or hero could not avoid frequently employing his thoughts in considering what he ought both to suffer and to do in banishment, in captivity, when reduced to slavery, when put to the torture, when brought to the scaffold. But the philosophers of all the different sects very justly represented virtue, that is, wise, just, firm, and temperate conduct, not only as the most preferable, but as the certain and infallible road to happiness even in this life. This conduct, however, could not always exempt, and might even sometimes expose the person who followed it to all the calamities which were incident to that unsettled situation of public affairs. They endeavored, therefore, to show that the happiness was either altogether or at least in a great measure independent of fortune. The Stoics, that it was so altogether, the academic and peripatetic philosophers, that it was so in a great measure. Wise, prudent, and good conduct was, in the first place, the conduct most likely to ensure success in the very species of undertaking. And secondly, though it should fail of success, yet the mind was not left without consolation. The virtuous man might still enjoy the complete approbation of his own breast, and might still feel that, how untoward soever, things might be without. All was calm and peace and concord within. He might generally comfort himself, too, with the assurance that he possessed the love and esteem of every intelligent and impartial spectator, who could not fail both to admire his conduct and to regret his misfortune. Those philosophers endeavored, at the same time, to show that the greatest misfortune to which human life was liable might be supported more easily than was commonly imagined. They endeavored to point out the comforts which a man might still enjoy when reduced to poverty, when driven into banishment, when exposed to the injustice of popular clamor, when laboring under blindness, under deafness in the extremity of old age, upon the approach of death, they pointed out, too, the considerations which might contribute to support his constancy under the agonies of pain and even of torture, in sickness and sorrow for the loss of children, for the death of friends and relations, etc. The few fragments which have come down to us of what the ancient philosophers had written upon these subjects form, perhaps, one of the most instructive as well as one of the most interesting remains of antiquity. The spirit and manhood of their doctrines make a wonderful contrast with the desponding plaintive and whining tone of some modern systems. But while those ancient philosophers endeavored in this manner to suggest every consideration which could, as Milton says, arm the abjured breast with stubborn patience, as with triple steel, they, at the same time, labored above all to convince their followers that there neither was nor could be any evil in death, and that if their situation became at any time too hard for their constancy to support, the remedy was at hand, the door was open, and they might, without fear, walk out when they pleased. If there was no world beyond the present, death, they said, could be no evil, and if there was another world, the gods must likewise be in that other, and a just man could fear no evil while under their protection. The philosophers, in short, prepared a death song, if I may say so, which the Grecian patriots and heroes might make use of upon the proper occasions and of all the different sects. The Stoics, I think, it must be acknowledged, had prepared by far the most animated and spirited song. Suicide, however, 
never seems to have been very common among the Greeks. Excepting Cleomenes, I cannot at present recollect any very illustrious either patriot or hero of Greece who died by his own hand. The death of Aristomenes is as much beyond the period of true history as that of Ajax. The common story of death of Themistocles, though within that period, bears upon its face all the marks of a most romantic fable. Of all the Greek heroes whose lives have been written by Plutarch, Cleomenes appears to have been the only one who perished in this manner. Theramenes, Socrates, and Phocion, who certainly did not want courage, suffered themselves to be sent to prison and submitted patiently to that death to which the injustice of their fellow citizens had condemned them. The brave Eumenes allowed himself to be delivered up by his own mutinous soldiers to his enemy Antigonus, and was starved to death without attempting any violence. The gallant Philippemen suffered himself to be taken prisoner by the Mezzanians, was thrown into a dungeon, and was supposed to have been privately poisoned. Several of the philosophers, indeed, are said to have died in this manner, but their lives have been so very foolishly written that very little credit is due to the greater part of the tales which are told of them. Three different accounts have been given of the death of Zeno the Stoic. One is that after enjoying for 98 years the most perfect state of health, he happened in going out of his school to fall, and though he suffered no other damage than that of breaking or dislocating one of his fingers, he struck the ground with his hand, and in the words of the Niobe Euripides said, I come, why dost thou call me? and immediately went home and hanged himself. At that great age, one should think he might have had a little more patience. Another account is that at the same age, and in consequence of that like accident, he starved himself to death. The third account is that, at seventy-two years of age, he died in the natural way, by far the most probable account of the three, and supported too by the authority of a cotemporary, who must have had every opportunity of being well informed. Of Perseus, originally the slave and afterwards the friend and disciple of Zeno, the first account is given by Apollonius of Tyre, who flourished about the time of Augustus Caesar, between two and three hundred years after the death of Zeno. I know not who was the author of this second account. Apollonius, who was himself a Stoic, had probably thought it would do honor to the founder of a sect which talked so much about voluntary death, to die in this manner by his own hand. Men of letters, though after their death, they are frequently more talked of than the greatest princes or statesmen of their time, are generally during their life so obscure and insignificant that their adventures are seldom recorded by cotemporary historians. Those of after ages, in order to satisfy the public curiosity, and having no authentic documents either to support or to contradict their narratives, seem frequently to have fashioned them according to their own fancy and almost always with a great mixture of the marvellous. In this particular case, the marvellous, though supported by no authority, seems to have prevailed over the probable, though supported by the best. Diogenes Laertius plainly gives the preference to the story of Apollonius. Lucian and Licentius appear both to have given credit to that of the great age and of the violent death. This fashion of voluntary death appears to have been much more prevalent among the proud Romans than it ever was among the lively, ingenuous, and accommodating Greeks. Even among the Romans, the fashion seems not to have been established in the early and what are called the virtuous ages of the Republic. The common story of the death of Regulus, though probably a fable, could never have been invented, and it had been supposed that any dishonor could fall upon that hero, from patiently submitting to the tortures which the Carthaginians are said to have inflicted upon him. In the later ages of the Republic, some dishonor, I apprehend, would have attended this submission. In the different civil wars which preceded the fall of the Commonwealth, many of the eminent men of all the contending parties chose rather to perish by their own hands than to fall into those of their enemies. The death of Cato, celebrated by Cicero and censured by Caesar, and become the subject of a very serious controversy between, perhaps, the most two illustrious advocates that the world had ever beheld, stamped a character of splendor upon this method of dying, which it seems to have retained for several ages after. The eloquence of Cicero was superior to that of Caesar. The admiring prevailed greatly over the censuring party, and the lovers of liberty, for many ages afterwards, 
looked up to Cato as the most venerable martyr of the Republican Party. The head of a party, the Cardinal de Retz, observes, may do what he pleases, as long as he retains the confidence of his own friends, he can never do wrong. A maxim of his eminence had himself, upon several occasions, an opportunity of experiencing the truth. Cato, it seems, joined to his other virtues that of an excellent bottle companion. His enemies accused him of drunkenness, but says Seneca, whoever objected this vice to Cato will find it much easier to prove that drunkenness is a virtue than that Cato could be addicted to any vice. Under the emperors, this method of diet seems to have been for a long time perfectly fashionable. In the epistles of Pliny, we find an account of several persons who chose to die in this manner, rather from vanity and ostentation, it would seem, than from what would appear, even to a sober and judicious Stoic, any proper or necessary reason. Even the ladies, who are seldom behind in following the fashion, seem frequently to have chosen, most unnecessarily, to die in this manner, and the ladies in Bengal, to accompany upon some occasions their husbands to the tomb. The prevalence of this fashion certainly occasioned many deaths, which would not otherwise have happened. All the havoc, however, which this perhaps the highest exertion of human vanity and impertinence could occasion, would probably at no time be very great. The principle of suicide, the principle which would teach us, upon some occasion, to consider that violent action as an object of applause and approbation, seems to be altogether a refinement of philosophy. Nature, in her sound and healthful state, seems never to prompt us to suicide. There is, indeed, a species of melancholy, a disease to which human nature, among its other calamities, is unhappily subject, which seems to be accompanied with what one may call an irresistible appetite for self-destruction, in circumstances often of the highest external prosperity, and sometimes, too, in spite of the most serious and deeply impressed sentiments of religion, this disease has frequently been known to drive its wretched victims to this fatal extremity. The unfortunate persons who perish in this miserable manner are the proper objects, not of censure, but of commiseration. To attempt to punish them when they are beyond the reach of all human punishment is not more absurd than it is unjust. That punishment can fall only on their surviving friends and relations who are always perfectly innocent, and to whom the loss of their friend in this disgraceful manner must always be alone a very heavy calamity. Nature in her sound and healthful state prompts us to avoid distress upon all occasions, upon many occasions to defend ourselves against it, though at the hazard or even the certainty of perishing in that defense. But when we have neither been able to defend ourselves from it, nor have perished in that defense, no natural principle, no regard to approbation, the supposed impartial spectator to the judgment of the man within the breast seems to call upon us to escape from it by destroying ourselves. It is only the conscientious of our own weakness, of our own incapacity to support the calamity with proper manhood and firmness, which can derive us to this resolution. I do not remember to have either read or heard of any American savage who, upon being taken prisoner by some hostile tribe, put himself to death in order to avoid being afterwards put to death in torture, and amidst the insults and mockery of his enemies. He places his glory in supporting those torments with manhood, and in retorting those insults with tenfold contempt and derision. This contempt of life and death, however, and at the same time the most entire submission to the order of providence, the most complete contentment with every event which the current of human affairs could possibly cast up, may be considered as the two fundamental doctrines upon which rested the whole fabric of stoical morality. The independent and spirited, but often harsh Epictetus, may be considered as the great apostle of the first of those doctrines, the mild, the humane, the benevolent Antonius of the second, the emancipated slave of Epaphroditus, who, in his youth, had been subjected to the insolence of a brutal master, who, in his riper years, was, by the jealousy and caprice of Domitian, banished from Rome and Athens, and obliged to dwell at Nicopolis, and who, by the same tyrant, might expect every moment to be sent to Gyre, or, perhaps, to be put to death, could preserve his tranquillity only by fostering in his mind the most sovereign contempt of human life. He never exalts so much, accordingly, his eloquence is never so animated 
as when he represents the futility and nothingness of all its pleasures and all its pains. The good-natured emperor, the absolute sovereign of the whole civilized part of the world, who certainly had no peculiar reason to complain of his own allotment, delights in expressing his contentment with the ordinary course of things, and in pointing out beauties even in those parts of it where vulgar observers are not apt to see any. There is a propriety and even an engaging grace, he observes, in old age as well as in youth, and the weakness and decrepitude of the one state are as suitable to nature as the bloom and vigor of the other. Death, too, is just as proper as termination of old age, as youth is of childhood, or manhood of youth. As we frequently say, he remarks upon another occasion, that the physician has ordered to such a man to ride on horseback, or to use a cold bath, or to walk barefooted. So ought we to say that nature, the great conductor and physician of the universe, has ordered to such a man a disease, or the amputation of a limb, or the loss of a child. By the prescriptions of ordinary physicians, the patient swallows many a bitter potion, undergoes many a painful operation, from the very uncertain hope, however, that health may be the consequence. He gladly submits to all. The harshest prescriptions of the great physician of nature, the patient may, in the same manner, hope will contribute to his own health and his own final prosperity and happiness. And he may be perfectly assured that they not only contribute but are indispensably necessary to the health, to the prosperity and happiness of the universe, to the furtherance and advancement of the great plan of Jupiter. Had they not been so, the universe would never have produced them. Its all-wise architect and conductor would never have suffered them to happen, as all, even the smallest of the coexistent part of the universe, are exactly fitted to one another, and all contribute to the compose of one immense and connected system. So all, even apparently the most insignificant of the successive events which follow one another, make parts and necessary parts of the great chain of causes and effects, which had no beginning and which will have no end, and which, as they all necessarily result from the original arrangement and contrivance of the whole, so they are all essentially necessary, not only to its prosperity, but to its continuance and preservation. Whoever does not cordially embrace whatever befalls him, whoever is sorry that it has befallen him, whoever wishes that it had not befallen him, wishes so far as in him lies, to stop the motion of the universe, to break that great chain of succession by the progress of which that system can alone be continued and preserved, and for some little conveniency of his own to disorder and discompose the whole machine of the world. O world, says he in another place, all things are suitable to me which are suitable to thee. Nothing is too early or too late to me which is seasonable for thee. All is fruit to me which thy seasons bring forth. From thee are all things, in thee are all things, for thee are all things. One man says, O beloved city of sea crops, wilt not thou say, O beloved city of God? From these very sublime doctrines, the Stoics, or at least some of the Stoics, attempted to deduce all their paradoxes. The Stoical wise man endeavored to enter into the views of the superintendent of the universe, and to see things in the same light in which that divine being beheld them. But to the great superintendent of the universe, all the different events which the course of this providence may bring forth, what to us appear the smallest and the greatest, the bursting of a bubble, as Mr. Pope says, and that of a world, for example, were perfectly equal, were equally parts of the great chain which he had predestined from all eternity, which equally the effects of the same unerring wisdom of the same universe and boundless benevolence. To the stoical man, in the same manner, all those different events were perfectly equal. In the course of the events, indeed, a liberal apartment in which he had himself some little management and direction had been assigned to him, in the department he endeavoured to act as properly as he could, and to conduct himself according to those orders which, he understood, had been prescribed to him, but he took no anxious or passionate concern, either in the success or in the disappointment of his own most faithful endeavours. The highest prosperity and the total destruction of that little department, of that little system, which had been, in some measure, committed to his charge, were perfectly indifferent to him. If those events had depended upon him, he would have chosen the one, and he would have rejected the other. But as they did not depend upon him, he trusted a superior wisdom, 
and was perfectly satisfied that the event which happened, whatever it might be, was the very event which he himself, had he known all the connections and dependencies of things, would most earnestly and devoutly have wished for. Whatever he did under the influence and direction of those principles was equally perfect, and when he stretched out his finger to give the example which they commonly made use of, he performed an action in every respect as meritorious, as worthy of praise and admiration, as when he laid down his life for the service of his country, as to the great superintendent of the universe, the greatest and the smallest exertions of his power, the formation and dissolution of a world, the formation and dissolution of a bubble, were equally easy, were equally admirable, and equally the effects of the same divine wisdom and benevolence. So to the stoical wise man, what we would call the great action required no more exertion than the little one, was equally easy, proceeded from exactly the same principles, was in no respect more meritorious, nor worthy of any higher degree of praise and admiration. As all those who had arrived at this state of perfection were equally happy, so all those who fell in the smallest degree short of it, how nearly soever they might approach to it, were equally miserable. As the man, they said, who was but an inch below the surface of the water, could no more breathe than he who was a hundred yards below it. So the man who had not completely subdued all his private, partial, and selfish passions, who had any other earnest desire but that for the universal happiness, who had not completely emerged from the abyss of misery and disorder, into which his anxiety for the gratification of those private, partial, and selfish passions had involved in him, could no more breathe the free air of liberty and independency, could no more enjoy the security and happiness of the wise man, than he who was most remote from that situation. As all the actions of the wise man were perfect and equally perfect, so all those of the man who had not arrived at this supreme wisdom were faulty, and as some Stoics pretended, equally faulty. As one truth, they said, could not be more true, nor one falsehood more false than another, so an honourable action could not be more honourable nor shameful one more shameful than another. As in shooting at a mark, the man who missed by an inch had equally missed it with him who had done so by a hundred yards. So the man who, in what to us appears the most insignificant action, had acted improperly and without a sufficient reason, was equally faulty with him who had done so in what appears to us the most important. The man who has killed the cock, for example, improperly and without a sufficient reason, with him who had murdered his father. If the first of those two paradoxes should appear sufficiently violent, the second is evidently too absurd to deserve any serious consideration. It is indeed so very absurd that one can scarce help suspecting that it must have been, in some measure, misunderstood or misrepresented. At any rate, I cannot allow myself to believe that such men as Zeno or Cleanthes, men, it is said, of the most simple as well as the most sublime eloquence, could be the authors either of these or of greater parts of the stoical paradoxes, which are in general mere impertinent quibbles, and do so little honour to their system that I shall give no further account of them. I am disposed to impute them rather to Chrysippus, the disciple and follower, indeed, of Zeno and Cleanthes, but who, from all that has been delivered down to us concerning him, seems to have been a mere dialectical pedant, without taste or elegance of any kind. He may have been the first who reduced their doctrines into a scholastic or technical system of artificial definitions, divisions and subdivisions. One of the most effectual expedients, perhaps for extinguishing whatever degree of good sense there may be in any moral or metaphysical doctrine, such a man may very easily be supported to have understood, to literally some animated expression of his masters in describing the happiness of the man of perfect virtue, and the unhappiness of whoever fell short of that character. The Stoics in general seem to have admitted that there might be a degree of proficiency in those who had not advanced to perfect virtue and happiness. They distributed those proficients into different classes according to the degree of their advancement, and they called them imperfect virtues, which they supposed them capable of exercising, not rectitudes, but proprieties, fitnesses, decent and becoming actions, for which a plausible or probable reason could be assigned. What Cicero expresses by the Latin word officia and Seneca, 
I think more exactly by that of convenientia. The doctrine of those imperfect but attainable virtues seems to have constituted what we may call the practical morality of the Stoics. It is the subject of Cicero's offices, and is said to have been that of another book written by Marcus Brutus, but which is now lost. The plan and system which nature has sketched out for our conduct seems to be altogether different from that of the Stoical philosophy. By nature, the events which immediately affect that little department in which we ourselves have some little management and direction, which immediately affect ourselves, our friends, our country, or the events which interest us the most, and which chiefly excite our desires and aversions, our hopes and our fears, our joys and sorrows, should those passions be what they are very apt to be, too vehement, nature has provided a proper remedy and correction, the real or even the imaginary presence of the impartial spectator, the authority of the man within the breast, is always at hand to overawe them into the proper tone and temper of moderation. If notwithstanding our most faithful exertions, all the events which can affect this little department should turn out the most unfortunate and disastrous, nature has by no means left us without consolation. That consolation may be drawn, not only from the complete approbation of the man within the breast, but, if possible, from a still nobler and generous principle, from a firm reliance upon and a reverential submission to that benevolent wisdom which directs all the events of human life, and which, we may be assured, would never have suffered those misfortunes to happen, had they not been indispensably necessary for the good of the whole. Nature has not prescribed to us this sublime contemplation as the great business and occupation of our lives. She only points it out to us as the consolation of our misfortunes. The Stoical philosophy prescribes it as the great business and occupation of our lives. That philosophy teaches us to interest ourselves earnestly and anxiously in no event. External to the good order of our own minds, to the propriety of our own choosing and rejecting, except in those which concern a department where we neither have nor ought to have any sort of management or direction, the department of the great superintendent of the universe. By the perfect apathy which it prescribes to us, by endeavouring not merely to moderate, but to eradicate all our private, partial, and selfish affections, by suffering us to feel for whatever can befall ourselves, our friends, our country, not even the sympathetic and reduced passions of the impartial spectator. It endeavours to render us altogether indifferent and unconcerned in the success or miscarriage of everything which nature has prescribed to us as the proper business and occupation of our lives. The reasonings of philosophy, it may be said, though they may confound and perplex the understanding, can never break down the necessary connection which nature has established between causes and their effects. The causes which naturally excite our desires and aversions, our hopes and fears, our joys and sorrows, would no doubt, notwithstanding all the reasonings of Stoicism, produce upon each individual, according to the degree of his actual sensibility, the proper and necessary effects. The judgments of the man within the breast, however, might be a good deal affected by those reasonings, and that great inmate might be taught by them to attempt to overawe all our private, partial, and selfish affections into a more or less perfect tranquillity. To direct the judgment of this inmate is the great purpose of all systems of morality that the Stoical philosophy had a very great influence upon the character and conduct of its followers, cannot be doubted, and that though it might sometimes incite them to unnecessary violence, its general tendency was to animate them to actions of the most heroic magnanimity and most extensive benevolence. Besides these ancient, there are some modern systems according to which virtue consists in propriety, or in the suitableness of the affection from which we act, to the cause or object which excites it. The system of Dr. Clark, which places virtue in acting according to the relations of things, in regulating our conduct according to the fitness or incongruity, which there may be in the application of certain actions to certain things or to certain relations, that of Mr. Wollaston, which places it in acting according to the truth of things, according to their proper nature and essence, or in treating them as what they really are, and not as what they are not. 
that of my lord Shaftesbury, which places it in maintaining the proper balance of the affections, and in allowing no passion to go beyond its proper sphere, are all of them more or less inaccurate descriptions of the same fundamental idea. None of those systems either give or even pretend to give any precise or distinct measure by which this fitness or propriety of affection can be ascertained or judged of. That precise and distinct measure can be found nowhere but in the sympathetic feelings of the impartial and well-informed spectator. The description of virtue, besides, which is either given or at least meant and intended to be given in each of those systems, for some of the modern authors are not very fortunate in their manner of expressing themselves, is no doubt quite just, so far as it goes. There is no virtue without propriety, and wherever there is propriety, some degree of approbation is due. But still this description is imperfect, for though propriety is an essential ingredient in every virtuous action, it is not always the sole ingredient. Beneficent actions have, in them, another quality, by which they appear not only to deserve approbation, but recompense. None of those systems account either easily or sufficiently for that superior degree of esteem, which seems due to such actions, or for that diversity of sentiment which they naturally excite. Neither is the description of vice more complete. For in the same manner, though impropriety is a necessary ingredient in every vicious action, it is not always the sole ingredient, and there is often the highest degree of absurdity and impropriety in very harmless and insignificant actions. Deliberate actions of the pernicious tendency to those we live with have, besides their impropriety, a peculiar quality of their own, by which they appear to deserve not only disapprobation, but punishment, and to be the objects not of dislike merely, but of resentment and revenge. And none of those systems easily and sufficiently account for that superior degree of detestation which we feel for such actions. Chapter 2 of those systems which make virtue consist in prudence. The most ancient of those systems which make virtue consist in prudence, and have which any considerable remains have come down to us, is that of Epicurus, who is said, however, to have borrowed all the leading principles of his philosophy from some of those who had gone before him, particularly from Aristippus, though it is very probable, notwithstanding this allegation of his enemies, that at least his manner of applying those principles was altogether his own. According to Epicurus, bodily pleasures and pain were the sole ultimate objects of natural desire and aversion, that they were always the natural object of those passions he thought required no proof. Pleasure might, indeed, appear sometimes to be avoided, not, however, because it was pleasure, but because, by the enjoyment of it, we should either forfeit some greater pleasure or to expose ourselves to some pain that was more to be avoided than this pleasure was to be desired. Pain, in the same manner, might appear sometimes to be eligible, not, however, because it was pain, but because by enduring it we might either avoid a still greater pain or acquire some pleasure of much more importance. That bodily pain and pleasure, therefore, were always the natural objects of desire and aversion, was, he thought, abundantly evident. Nor was it less so, he imagined, that they were the sole ultimate objects of those passions. Whatever else was desired or avoided was so, according to him, upon account of its tendency to produce one or other of those sensations. The tendency to procure pleasure rendered power and riches desirable, as the contrary tendency to produce pain made poverty and insignificancy the objects of aversion. Honor and reputation were valued, because the esteem and love of those we live with were of the greatest consequence both to procure pleasure and to defend us from pain. Ignominy and bad fame, on the contrary, were to be avoided, because the hatred, contempt, and resentment of those we lived with destroyed all security and necessarily exposed us to the greatest bodily evils. All the pleasures and pains of the mind were, according to Epicurus, ultimately derived from those of the body. The mind was happy when it thought of the past pleasures of the body and hoped for others to come, and it was miserable when it thought of the pains which the bodily had formerly endured and dreaded the same or greater thereafter. But the pleasures and pains of the mind, though ultimately derived from those of the body, were vastly greater than their originals. The body felt only the sensation of the present instant, whereas the mind felt also the past and the future. 
the one by remembrance, the other by anticipation, and consequently both suffered, and enjoyed much more. When we are under the greatest bodily pain, he observed, we shall always find, if we attend to it, that it is not the suffering of the present instant which chiefly torments us, but either the agonizing remembrance of the past, or the yet more horrible dread of the future. The pain of each instant, considered by itself, and cut off from all that goes before and all that comes after it, is a trifle, not worth the regarding. Yet this is all which the body can ever be said to suffer. In the same manner, when we enjoy the greatest pleasure, we shall always find that the bodily sensation, the sensation of the present instant, makes but a small part of our happiness, that our enjoyment chiefly arises either from the cheerful recollection of the past or the still more joyous anticipation of the future, and that the mind always contributes by the largest share of the entertainment. Since our happiness and misery, therefore, depended chiefly on the mind, if this part of our nature was well disposed, if our thoughts and opinions were as they should be, it was of little importance in what manner our body was affected. Though under great bodily pain, we might still enjoy a considerable share of happiness. If our reason and judgment maintain their superiority, we might entertain ourselves with the remembrance of the past and with the hopes of future pleasure. We might soften the rigor of our pains by recollecting what it was which even in this situation we were under any necessity of suffering. That this was merely the bodily sensation the pain of the present instant, which by itself could never be very great, that whatever agony we suffered from the dread of its continuance was the effect of an opinion of the mind, which might be corrected by juster sentiments, by considering that, if our pains were violent, they would probably be of short duration, and that if they were long continuance, they would probably be moderate, and admit of many intervals of ease, and that at any rate, Death was always at hand and within call to deliver us, which as, according to him, it put an end to all sensation, either of pain or pleasure, could not be regarded as an evil. When we are, said he, death is not, and when death is, we are not. Death, therefore, can be nothing to us. If the actual sensation of positive pain was in itself so little to be feared, that of pleasure was still less to be desired. Naturally, the sensation of pleasure was much less pungent than that of pain. If, therefore, this last could take so very little from the happiness of the well-disposed mind, the other could add scarce anything to it. When the body was free from pain, and the mind from fear and anxiety, the superrated sensation of bodily pleasure could be of very little importance, and though it might diversify, could not properly be said to increase the happiness of the situation. In ease of body, therefore, and in security or tranquility of mind, consisted, according to Epicurus, the most perfect state of human nature, the most complete happiness to which man was capable of enjoying. To obtain this great end of natural desire was the sole object of all the virtues, which, according to him, were not desirous upon their own account, but upon account of their tendency to bring about the situation. Prudence, for example, though according to this philosophy, the source and principle of all the virtues was not desirable upon its own account. Thy careful and laborious and circumspect state of mind, ever watchful and ever attentive to the most distant consequences of every action, could not be a thing pleasant or agreeable for its own sake, but upon account of its tendency to procure the greatest goods and to keep off the greatest evils. To abstain from pleasure too, to curb and restrain our natural passions for enjoyment, which was the office of temperance, could never be desirable for its own sake. The whole value of this virtue arose from its utility, from its enabling us to postpone the present enjoyment for the sake of a greater to come, or to avoid a greater pain that might ensue from it. Temperance, in short, was nothing but prudence with regard to pleasure. To support labor, to endure pain, to be exposed to danger or to death, the situations which fortitude would often lead us into, were surely still less the objects of natural desire. They were chosen only to avoid greater evils. We submitted to labor in order to avoid the greater shame and pain of poverty, and we exposed ourselves to danger and to death in defense of our liberty and property. The means and instruments of pleasure and happiness, or in defense of our country, in the safety of which our own, was necessarily comprehended. Fortitude, 
enable us to do all this cheerfully, as the best which, in our present situation, could possibly be done, and was in reality no more than prudence, good judgment, and presence of mind, in properly appreciating pain, labor, and danger, always choosing the less in order to avoid the greater. It is the same case with justice. To abstain from what is in others was not desirable on its own account, and it could not surely be better for you that I should possess what is my own than that you should possess it. You ought, however, to abstain from whatever belongs to me, because by doing otherwise you will provoke the resentment and indication of mankind. The security and tranquility of your mind will be entirely destroyed. You will be filled with fear and consternation at the thought of that punishment which you will imagine that men are at all times ready to inflict upon you, and from which no power, no art, no concealment will ever, in your own fancy, be sufficient to protect you. That other species of justice which consists in doing proper good offices to different persons according to the various relations of neighbors, kinsmen, friends, benefactors, superiors, or equals, which they may stand in to us, is recommended by the same reason. To act properly in all these different relations procures us to the esteem and love of those we live with, and to do otherwise excites their contempt and hatred. By the one we naturally secure, by the other we necessarily endanger our own ease and tranquility. The great and ultimate objects of our desires the whole virtue of justice, therefore, the most important of all the virtues, is no more than discreet and prudent conduct with regard to our neighbours. Such is the doctrine of Epicurus concerning the nature of virtue. It may seem extraordinary that this philosopher, who is described as a person of the most amiable manners, should never have observed that whatever may be the tendency of those virtues, or of the contrary vices, with regard to our bodily ease and security, the sentiments which they naturally excite in other passions are objects of a much more passionate desire or aversion than all their other consequences, that to be amiable, to be respectable, to be the proper object of esteem, is by every well-disposed mind more valued than all the ease and security which love, respect, and esteem can procure us, that on the contrary, to be odious, to be contemptible, to be the proper object of that indignation is more dreadful than all that we can suffer in our body from hatred, contempt, or indignation, and that consequently our desire of the one character and our aversion to the other cannot arise from any regard to the effects which either of them is likely to produce upon this body. This system is, no doubt, altogether inconsistent with that which I have been endeavouring to establish. It is not difficult, however, to discover from what phases, if I may say so, from what particular view or aspect of nature this account of things derives its probability. By the wise contrivance of the author of nature, virtue is upon all ordinary occasions, even with regard to this life, real wisdom, and the surest and readiest means of obtaining both safety and advantage. Our success or disappointment in our undertakings must very much depend upon a good or bad opinion which is commonly entertained of us and upon the general disposition of those we live with, either to assist or to oppose us. But the best, the surest, the easiest, and the readiest way of obtaining the advantageous and avoiding the unfavorable judgments of others is undoubtedly to render ourselves the proper objects of the former and not the latter. Do you desire, says Socrates, the reputation of a good musician? The only way of obtaining it is to become a good musician. Would you desire, in the same manner, to be thought capable of serving your country either as a general or as a statesman? The best way in this case, too, is really to acquire the art and experience of war and government, and to become really fit to be a general or a statesman. And in the same manner, if you would be reckoned sober, temperate, just, and equitable, the best way of acquiring this reputation is to become sober, temperate, just, and equitable. If you can really render yourself amiable, respectable, and the proper object of esteem, there is no fear of your not soon acquiring the love, the respect, and the esteem of those you live with. Since the practice of virtue, therefore, is in general so advantageous, and that of vice so contrary to our interest, the consideration of those opposite tendencies 
undoubtedly stamps an additional beauty and propriety upon the one and a new deformity and impropriety upon the other temperance magnanimity justice and beneficence come thus to be approved of not only under their proper characters but under the additional character of the highest wisdom and most real prudence and in the same manner the contrary vices of intemperance pusillanimity injustice and either malevolence or sordid selfishness come to be disapproved of not only under their proper characters but under the additional characters of the most short-sighted folly and weakness epicurus appears in every virtue to have attended to this species of propriety only it is that which is most apt to occur to those who are endeavouring to persuade others to regularity of conduct when men by their practice and perhaps too by their maxims manifestly show that the natural beauty of virtue is not like to have much effect upon them how is it possible to move them but by representing the folly of their conduct and how much they themselves are in the end likely to suffer by it by running up all the different virtues too to this one species of propriety epicurus indulged in propensity which is natural to all men but which philosophers in particular are apt to cultivate with a peculiar fondness as the great means of displaying their ingenuity the propensity to account for all appearances from as few principles as possible and he no doubt indulged this propensity still further when he referred all the primary objects of natural desire and aversion to the pleasures and pains of the body the great patron of the atomical philosophy who took so much pleasure in deducing all the powers and qualities of bodies from the most obvious and familiar figure motion and arrangement of the small parts of matter felt no doubt a similar satisfaction when he accounted in the same manner for all the sentiments and passions of the mind from those which are most obvious and familiar the system of epicurus agreed with those of plato aristotle and zeno in making virtue consist in acting in the most suitable manner to obtain the primary objects of the natural desire it differed from all of them in two other respects first in the account which it gave of those primary objects of the natural desire and secondly in the account which it gave of the excellence of virtue or of the reason why that quality ought to be esteemed the primary objects of natural desire consisted according to epicurus in bodily pleasure and pain and in nothing else whereas according to the other three philosophers there were many other objects such as knowledge such as the happiness of our relations of our friends of our country which were ultimately desirable for their own sakes virtue too according to epicurus did not deserve to be pursued for its own sake nor was it itself one of the ultimate objects of natural appetite but was eligible only upon account of its tendency to prevent pain and procure ease and pleasure in the opinion of the other three on the contrary it was desirable not merely as the objects of procuring the other primary objects of natural desire but as something which was in itself more valuable than them all man they thought being born for action his happiness must consist not merely in the agreeableness of his passive sensations but also in the propriety of his active exertions chapter three of those systems which make virtue consist in benevolence the system which makes virtue consist in benevolence though i think not so ancient as all of those which i have already given an account of is however of very great antiquity it seems to have been the doctrine of the great part of those philosophers who about and after the age of augustus called themselves electics who pretended to follow chiefly the opinion of plato and pythagoras and who upon that account are commonly known by the name of the latter platonists the divine nature according to these authors benevolence or love was the sole principle of action and directed by the exertion of all the other attributes the wisdom of the deity was employed in finding out the means for bringing about those ends which his goodness suggested as his infinite power was exerted to execute them benevolence however was still the supreme and governing attribute to which the others were subservient and from which the whole excellency or the whole morality if i may be allowed such an expression of the divine operations which was ultimately derived the whole perfection and virtue of the human mind consisted in some resemblance or participation of the divine perfections and consequently in being filled 
with the same principle of benevolence and love which influenced all the actions of the Deity. The actions of men which flowed from this motive were alone truly praiseworthy, or could claim any merit in the sight of the Deity. It was by the actions of charity and love only that we could imitate, as became us the conduct of God, that we could express our humble and devout admiration of his infinite perfections, that by fostering in our own minds the same divine principle, we could bring our own affections to a greater resemblance with his holy attributes, and thereby become more proper objects of his love and esteem, till at last we arrived at that immediate converse and communication with the deity, to which it was the great object of this philosophy to raise us. This system, it was much esteemed, by many ancient fathers of the Christian Church, so after the Reformation it was adopted by several divines of the most eminent piety and learning, and of the most amiable manners, particularly by Dr. Ralph Cudworth, by Dr. Henry Moore, and by Mr. John Smith of Cambridge. But of all the patrons of this system, ancient or modern, the late Dr. Hutchison was undoubtedly, beyond all comparison, the most acute, the most distinct, the most philosophical, and, what is of the greatest consequence of all, the soberest and most judicious. That virtue consists in benevolence is a notion supported by many appearances in human nature. It has been observed already that proper benevolence is the most graceful and agreeable of all the affections that it is recommended to us by a double sympathy, that as its tendency is necessarily beneficent, it is the proper object of gratitude and reward and that, upon these accounts, it appears to our natural sentiments to possess a merit superior to any other. It has been observed, too, that even the weaknesses of benevolence are not very disagreeable to us, whereas those of every other passion are always extremely disgusting. Who does not abhor excessive malice, excessive selfishness, or excessive resentment? But the most excessive indulgence, even of a partial friendship, is not so offensive. It is the benevolent passions only which can exert themselves without any regard or attention to propriety, and yet retain something about them which is engaging. There is something pleasing, even in mere instinctive goodwill, which goes on to do good offices without once reflecting whether by this conduct it is the proper object either of blame or approbation. It is not so with the other passions. The moment they are deserted, the moment they are unaccompanied by the sense of propriety, they cease to be agreeable. As benevolence bestows upon those actions, they proceed from it a beauty superior to all others, so the want of it, and much more the contrary inclination, communicates a peculiar deformity to whatever evidences such a disposition. Pernicious actions are often punishable for no other reason than because they show a want of sufficient attention to the happiness of our neighbour. Besides all this, Dr. Hutchison observed that whenever in any action supposed to proceed from benevolent affections, some other motive had been discovered. Our sense of the merit of this action was just so far diminished as this motive was believed to have influenced it. If an action supposed to proceed from gratitude should be discovered to have arisen from an expectation of some new favor, or if what was apprehended to proceed from public spirit should be found out to have taken its origin from the hope of a pecuniary reward, such a discovery would entirely destroy all notion of merit or praiseworthiness in either of these actions, since therefore the mixture of any selfish motive, like that of a baser alloy, diminished or took away altogether the merit which would otherwise have belonged to any action. It was evident, he imagined, that virtue must consist in pure and disinterested benevolence alone. When those actions, on the contrary, which are commonly supposed to proceed from a selfish motive, are discovered to have arisen from a benevolent one, it greatly enhances our sense of their merit. If we believed that any person that he endeavoured to advance his fortune from, no other view but that of doing friendly offices and making proper returns to his benefactors, we should only love and esteem him the more. And this observation seems still more to confirm the conclusion that it was benevolence only which could stamp upon any action the character of virtue. Last of all, what he imagined was an evident proof of the justness of this account of virtue. In all the disputes of casuists concerning the rectitude of conduct, 
the public good he observed was the standard to which they constantly referred thereby universally acknowledging that whatever tended to promote the happiness of mankind was right and laudable and virtuous and the contrary wrong blamable and vicious in the late debates about passive obedience and the right of resistance the sole point of controversy among men of sense was whether universal submission would probably be attended with greater evils than temporary insurrections when privileges were invaded whether what upon the whole tended most to the happiness of mankind was not also morally good was never once he said made a question since benevolence therefore was the only motive which could bestow upon any action the character of virtue the greater the benevolence which was evidenced by any action was greater the praise which must belong to it those actions which aimed at the happiness of a greater community as they demonstrated a more enlarged benevolence than those which aimed only at that of a smaller system so were they likewise proportionally the more virtuous the most virtuous of all affections therefore was that which embraced as its objects of happiness of all intelligent beings the least virtuous on the contrary of those to which the character of virtue could in any respect belong was that which aimed no further than at the happiness of an individual such as a brother a son or a friend in directing all our actions to promoting the greatest possible good in submitting all inferior affections to the desire of the general happiness of mankind in regarding one's self but as one of the many whose prosperity was to be pursued no further than it was consistent with or conductive to that of the whole consisted the perfection of virtue self-love was a principle which could never be virtuous in any degree or in any direction it was vicious whenever it obstructed the general good when it had no other effect than to make the individual take care of his own happiness it was merely innocent and though it deserved no praise neither ought it to incur any blame those benevolent actions which were performed notwithstanding some strong motive from self-interest were the more virtuous upon that account they demonstrated the strength and vigor of the benevolent principle dr hutchson was so far from allowing self-love to be in any case a motive of virtuous actions that even a regard to the pleasure of self-approbation to the comfortable applause of our own consciences according to him diminished the merit of a benevolent action this was a selfish motive he thought which so far as it contributed to any action demonstrated the weakness of that pure and disinterested benevolence which could alone stamp upon the conduct of a man the character of virtue in the common judgments of mankind however this regard to the approbation of our own minds is so far from being considered as what can in any respect diminish the virtue of any action that it is rather looked upon as the sole motive which deserves the appellation of virtuous such is the account given of the nature of virtue in this amiable system a system which has a peculiar tendency to nourish and support in the human heart the noblest and most agreeable of all affections and not only to check the injustice of self-love but in some measure to discourage that principle altogether by representing it as we could never reflect any honor upon those who were influenced by it as some of the other systems which i have already given an account of do not sufficiently explain from whence arises the peculiar excellency of the supreme virtue of beneficence so this system seems to have the contrary defect but not sufficiently explaining from whence arises our approbation of the inferior virtues of prudence vigilance circumspection temperance constancy firmness the view and aim of our affections the beneficent and hurtful effects which they tend to produce are the only qualities at all attended to in this system their propriety and impropriety their suitableness and unsuitableness to the cause which excites them are disregarded altogether regard to our own private happiness and interest too appear upon many occasions very laudable principles of action the habits of economy industry discretion attention and application of thought are generally supposed to be cultivated from self-interested motives and at the same time are apprehended to be very praiseworthy qualities which deserve the esteem and approbation of everybody the mixture of a selfish motive it is true 
seems often to scully the beauty of those actions which ought to arise from a benevolent affection. The cause of this, however, is not that self-love can never be the motive of a virtuous action, but that the benevolent principle appears in this particular case to want its due degree of strength, and to be altogether unsuitable to its object. The character, therefore, seems evidently imperfect, and upon the whole, to deserve blame rather than praise. The mixture of a benevolent motive in an action to which self-love alone ought to be sufficient to prompt us is not so apt indeed to diminish our sense of its propriety or of the virtue of the person who performs it. We are not ready to suspect any person of being defective in selfishness. This is by no means the weak side of human nature or the failing of which we are apt to be suspicious. If we could really believe, however, of any man that, was it not from a regard to his family and friends, he would not take proper care of his health, his life, or his fortune, to which self-preservation alone ought to be sufficient to prompt him. It would undoubtedly be a failing, though one of those amiable failings which render a person rather the object of pity than of contempt or hatred. It would still, however, somewhat diminish the dignity and respectableness of his character. Carelessness and want of economy are universally disapproved of, not, however, as proceeding from a want of benevolence, but want of the proper attention to the objects of self-interest. Though the standard by which the casuists frequently determine what is right or wrong in human conduct be its tendency to the welfare or disorder of society, does not follow that a regard to the welfare of society should be the sole virtuous motive of action, but only that, in any competition, it ought to cast the blame against other motives. Benevolence may, perhaps, be the sole principle of action in the deity, and there are several non-improbable arguments which tend to persuade us that it is so. It is not easy to conceive what other motive an independent and all-perfect being who stands in the needs of nothing external, and whose happiness is complete in himself, can act from. But whatever may be the case with the deity, so imperfect a creature as man, the support of whose existence requires so many things external to him, must often act from many other motives. The condition of human nature were peculiarly hard, if those affections which, by the very nature of our being, ought frequently to influence our conduct, could upon no occasion appear virtuous, or deserve esteem and commendation from anybody. Those three systems, that which places virtue in propriety, that which places it in prudence, and that which makes it consist in benevolence, are the principal amounts which have been given of the nature of virtue. To one or other of them, all the other descriptions of virtue, how different soever they may appear, are easily reducible. That system which places virtue in obedience to the will of the deity may be counted either among those which make it consist in prudence, or among those which make it consist in propriety. When it is asked why we ought to obey the will of the deity, this question which would be impious and absurd in the highest degree, if asked from any doubt that we ought to obey him, can admit but two different answers. It must either be said that we ought to obey the will of the deity because he is a being of infinite power, who will reward us eternally if we do so, and punish us eternally if we do otherwise, or it must be said that independent of any regard to our own happiness or to rewards and punishment of any kind, there is congruity and fitness that a creature should obey its creator, that a limited and imperfect being should submit to one of infinite and incomprehensible perfections. Besides one or other of these two, it is impossible to conceive that any other answer can be given to this question. If the first answer be the proper one, virtue consists in prudence, or in the proper pursuit of our own final interest and happiness. Since it is upon this account that we are obliged to obey the will of the deity, if the second answer be the proper one, virtue must consist in propriety, since the ground of our obligation to obedience is the suitableness or congruity of the sentiments of humility and submission to the superiority of the object which excites them. That system which places virtue in utility coincides too with that which makes it consist in propriety. According to this system, 
all those qualities of the mind which are agreeable or advantageous, either to the person himself or to others, are approved of as virtuous and the contrary disapproved of as vicious. But the agreeableness or utility of any affection depends upon the degree which it is allowed to subsist in. Every affection is useful when it is confined to a certain degree of moderation, and every affection is disadvantageous when it exceeds the proper bounds. According to this system, therefore, virtue consists not in any one affection, but in the proper degree of all the affections. The only difference between it and that which I have been endeavouring to establish is that it makes utility, and not sympathy or the correspondent affection of the spectator, the natural and original measure of this proper degree. Chapter 4 of Licentious Systems All those systems which I have hitherto given an account of suppose that there is a real and essential distinction between vice and virtue, whatever these qualities may consist in, there is a real and essential difference between the propriety and impropriety of any affection, between benevolence and any other principle of action, between real prudence and short-sighted folly, or precipitate rashness. In the main, too, all of them contribute to encourage the praiseworthy and to discourage the blame disposition. It may be true, perhaps, of some of them, that they tend, in some measure, to break the balance of the affections and to give the mind a particular bias to some principles of action, beyond the proportion that is due to them. The ancient systems which place virtue in propriety seem chiefly to recommend the great, the awful, and the respectable virtues. The virtues of self-government and self-command, fortitude, magnanimity, independency upon fortune, the contempt of all outward accidents, of pain, poverty, exile, and death. It is in these great exertions that the noblest propriety of conduct is displayed. The soft and amiable, the gentle virtues, all the virtues of indulgent humanity, are, in comparison, but little insisted upon, and seem, on the contrary, by the Stoics in particular, to have been often regarded as mere weaknesses, which it behoved a wise man not to harbour in his breast. The benevolent system, on the other hand, while it fosters and encourages all those milder virtues in the highest degree, seems entirely to neglect the more awful and respectable qualities of the mind. It even denies them the appellation of virtues. It calls them moral abilities and treats them as qualities which do not deserve the same sort of esteem and approbation that is due to what is properly denominated virtue. All those principles of action which aim only at our own interest, it treats, if that be possible, still worse, so far from having any merit of their own. They diminish, it pretends, the merit of benevolence when they cooperate with it, and prudence, it is asserted, when they employed only in promoting private interest, can never even be imagined a virtue. That system again, which makes virtue consist in prudence only, while it gives the highest encouragement to the habits of caution, vigilance, sobriety, and judicious moderation seems to degrade equally both the amiable and respectable virtues, and to strip the former of all their beauty and the latter of all their grandeur. But notwithstanding these defects, the general tendency of each of those three systems is to encourage the best and most laudable habits of the human mind, and it were well for society if either mankind in general, or even those who pretend to live according to any philosophical rule, were to regulate their conduct by the precepts of any one of them. We may learn from each of them something that is both valuable and peculiar. If it was possible, by precept and exhortation, to inspire the mind with fortitude and magnanimity, the ancient systems of propriety would seem sufficient to do this. Or if it was possible, by the same means, to soften it into humanity and to awaken the affections of kindness and general love towards those we live with. Some of the pictures with which the benevolent system presents us might seem capable of producing this effect. We may learn from the system of Epicurus, though undoubtedly the most imperfect of all the three, how much the practice of both the amiable and respectable virtues is conductive in our own interest, to our own ease and safety and quiet even in this life. As Epicurus placed happiness in the attainment of ease and security, he exerted himself in a particular manner to show that virtue was, not merely the best and the surest, 
but the only means of acquiring those invaluable possessions. The good effects of virtue upon our inward tranquillity and peace of mind are what other philosophers have chiefly celebrated. Epicurus, without neglecting this topic, has chiefly insisted upon the influence of that amiable quality on our outward prosperity and safety. It was upon this account that his writings were so much studied in the ancient world by men of all different philosophical parties. It is from him that Cicero, the great enemy of the Epicurean system, borrows his most agreeable proofs that virtue alone is sufficient to secure happiness. Seneca, though a Stoic, the sect most opposite to that of Epicurus, yet quotes this philosopher more frequently than any other. There is, however, another system which seems to take away altogether the distinction between vice and virtue, and of which the tendency is, upon that account, wholly pernicious. I mean the system of Dr. Mandeville. Though the notions of this author are in almost every respect erroneous, there are, however, some appearances in human nature which, when viewed in a certain manner, seem at first sight to favour them. These described and exaggerated by the lively and humorous, though coarse and rustic eloquence of Dr. Mandeville, have thrown upon his doctrines an air of truth and probability, which is very apt to impose upon the unskillful. Dr. Mandeville considers whatever is done from a sense of propriety, from a regard to what is commendable and praiseworthy, as being done from a love of praise and commendation, or as he calls it, from vanity. Man, he observes, is naturally much more interested in his own happiness than in that of others, and it is impossible that in his heart he can ever really prefer their prosperity to his own. Whenever he appears to do so, we may be assured that he imposes upon us, and that he is then acting from the same selfish motives as at all other times. Among his other selfish passions, vanity is one of the strongest, and he is always easily flattered and greatly delighted with the applause of those about him. When he appears to sacrifice his own interest to that of his companions, he knows that his conduct will be highly agreeable to their self-love, and that they will not fail to express their satisfaction by bestowing upon him the most extravagant praises. The pleasure which he expects from this overbalances, in his opinion, the interest which he abandons in order to procure it. His conduct, therefore, upon this occasion is in reality just as selfish and arises from just as mean a motive as upon any other. He is flattered, however, and he flatters himself with the belief that it is entirely disinterested, since unless this was supposed, it would not seem to merit any commendation, either in his own eyes or in those of others. All public spirit, therefore, all preference of public to private interest is, according to him, a mere cheat and imposition upon mankind, and that human virtue, which is so much boasted of, and which is the occasion of so much emulation among men, is the mere offspring of flattery begot upon pride. Whether the most generous and public-spirited actions may not, in some sense, be regarded as proceeding from self-love, I shall not, at present, examine. The decision of this question is not, I apprehend, of any importance towards establishing the reality of virtue, since self-love may frequently be a virtuous motive of action. I shall only endeavour to show that the desire of doing what is honourable and noble, of rendering ourselves the proper objects of esteem and approbation, cannot without any propriety be called vanity. Even the love of well-grounded fame and reputation, the desire of acquiring esteem by what is really estimable, does not deserve that name. The first is the love of virtue, the noblest and the best passion in human nature. The second is the love of true glory a passion inferior, no doubt, to the former, but which indignity appears to come immediately after it. He is guilty of vanity, who desires praise for qualities which are either not praiseworthy in any degree, or not in that degree in which he expects to be praised for them who sets his character upon the frivolous ornaments of dress and equipage, or upon the equally frivolous accomplishments of ordinary behavior. He is guilty of vanity, who desires praise for what indeed very well deserves it, but what he perfectly knows does not belong to him. The empty coxcomb, who gives himself airs of importance, which he has no title to, the silly liar who assumes the merit of adventures which never happened, the foolish plagiary who gives himself out for the author of what he has no pretensions to, 
are properly accused of this passion. He too is said to be guilty of vanity, who is not content with the silent sentiments of esteem and approbation, who seems to be fonder of their noisy expressions and acclamations than of the sentiments themselves, who is never satisfied but when his own praises are ringing in his ears, and who solicits with the most anxious importunity all external marks of respect, is fond of titles, of compliments, of being visited, of being attended, of being taken notice of in public places with the appearance of deference and attention. This frivolous passion is altogether different from either of the two former, and is the passion of the lowest and the least of mankind, as they are of the noblest and the greatest. But though these three passions, the desire of rendering ourselves the proper objects of honor and esteem, or of becoming what is honorable and estimable, the desire of acquiring honor and esteem by really deserving those sentiments, and the frivolous desire of praise at any rate, are widely different, though the two former are always approved of, while the latter never fails to be despised. There is, however, a certain remote affinity among them, which, exaggerated by the humors and divergent eloquence of this lively author, has enabled him to impose upon his readers. There is an affinity between vanity and the love of true glory, as both these passions aim at acquiring esteem and approbation. But they are different in this, that the one is just reasonable and equitable passion, while the other is unjust, absurd, and ridiculous. The man who desires esteem for what is really estimable desires nothing but what he is justly entitled to, and what cannot be refused him without some sort of injury. He, on the contrary, who desires it upon any other terms, demands what he has no just claim to. The first is easily satisfied, is not apt to be jealous or suspicious that we do not esteem him enough, and is seldom solicitous about receiving many external marks of our regard. The other, on the contrary, is never to be satisfied, is full of jealousy and suspicion that we do not esteem him so much as he desires because he has some secret consciousness that he desires more than he deserves. The least neglect of ceremony he considers as a moral affront and as an expression of the most determined contempt, he is restless and impatient and perpetually afraid that we have lost all respect for him and is, upon this account, always anxious to obtain new expressions of esteem and cannot be kept in temper but by continual attention and adulation. There is an affinity, too, between the desire of becoming what is honorable and estimable, and the desire of honor and esteem between the love of virtue and the love of true glory. They resemble one another not only in this respect, that both aim at really being what is honorable and noble, but even in that respect in which the love of true glory resembles what is properly called vanity some reference to the sentiments of others. The man of the greatest magnanimity who desires virtue for its own sake and is most indifferent about what actually are the opinions of mankind with regard to him is still, however, delighted with the thoughts of what they should be, the consciousness that though he may neither be honored nor applauded is still the proper object of honor and applause, and that if mankind were cool and candid and consistent with themselves and properly informed of the motives and circumstances of his conduct, they would not fail to honor and applaud him. Though he despises the opinions which are actually entertained of him, he has the highest value for those which ought to be entertained of him. That he might think himself worthy of these honorable sentiments, and whatever was the idea which other men might conceive of his character, that when he should put himself in their situation and consider not what was, but what ought to be their opinion, he should always have the highest idea of it himself, was the great and exalted motive of his conduct. As even in the love of virtue, therefore, there is still some reference, though not to what is, yet to what in reason and propriety ought to be. The opinions of others, there is even in this respect, some affinity between it, and the love of true glory. There is, however, at the same time, a very great difference between them. The man who acts solely from a regard to what is right and fit to be done, from a regard to what is the proper object of esteem and approbation, though these sentiments should never be bestowed upon him, acts from the most sublime and godlike motive, which human nature is even capable of conceiving. The man, on the other hand, who, while he desires to merit approbation, 
is at the same time anxious to obtain it. Though he, too, is laudable in the main, yet his motives have a greater mixture of human infirmity. He is in great danger of being mortified by the ignorance and injustice of mankind, and his happiness is exposed to the envy of his rivals and the folly of the public. The happiness of the other, on the contrary, is altogether secure and independent of fortune, and of the caprice of those he lives with. The contempt and hatred which may be thrown upon him by the ignorance of mankind he considers as not belonging to him, and is not at all mortified by it. Mankind despise and hate him from a false notion of his character and conduct. If they knew him better, they would esteem and love him. It is not him whom, properly speaking, they hate and despise, but another person whom they mistake him to be. Our friend, whom we should meet at a masquerade in the garb of our enemy, would be more diverted than mortified. If under that disguise we should vent our indignation against him, such are the sentiments of a man of real magnanimity when exposed to unjust censure. It seldom happens, however, that human nature arrives at this degree of firmness. Though none but the weakest and most worthless of mankind are much delighted with false glory, yet by a strange inconsistency false ignominy is often capable of mortifying those who appear the most resolute and determined. Dr. Mandeville is not satisfied with representing the frivolous motive of vanity as the source of all those actions which are commonly accounted virtuous. He endeavors to point out the imperfection of human virtue in many other respects. In every case, he pretends, it falls short of that complete self-denial which it pretends to, and, instead of a conquest, is commonly no more than a concealed indulgence of our passions. Wherever our reserve with regard to pleasure falls short of the most ascetic abstinence, he treats it as a gross luxury and sensuality. Everything, according to him, is luxury which exceeds what is absolutely necessary for the support of human nature, so that there is vice even in the use of a clean shirt or of a convenient habitation. The indulgence of the inclination to sex in the most lawful union he considers as the same sensuality with the most hurtful gratification of that passion, and derides that temperance and that chastity which can be practiced at so cheap a rate. The ingenuous sophistry of his reasoning is here, as upon many other occasions, covered by the ambiguity of language. There are some of our passions which have no other names except those which mark the disagreeable and offensive degree. The spectator is more apt to take notice of them in this degree than in any other. When they shock his own sentiments, they give him some sort of antipathy and uneasiness. He is necessarily obliged to attend to them, and is from thence naturally led to give them a name. When they fall in with the natural state of his own mind, he is very apt to overlook them altogether, and either gives them no name at all, or, if he give them any, it is one which marks rather the subjection and restraint of the passion than the degree which it still allowed to subsist in. After it is so subjected and restrained, thus the common names of the love of pleasure and of the love of sex denote a vicious and offensive degree of those passions. The words temperance and chastity, on the other hand, seem to mark rather the restraint and subjection which they are kept under, than the degree which they are still allowed to subsist in. When he can show, therefore, that they still subsist in some degree, he imagines he has entirely demolished the reality of the virtues of temperance and chastity, and show them to be mere impositions upon the inattention and simplicity of mankind. Those virtues, however, do not require an entire insensibility of the objects of the passions which they mean to govern. They aim only at restraining the violence of those passions so far as not to hurt the individual and neither disturb nor offend the society. It is the great fallacy of Dr. Mandeville's book to represent every passion as wholly vicious, which is so in any degree and in any direction. It is thus that he treats everything as vanity which has any reference either to what are or to what ought to be the sentiments of others, and it is by the means of his sophistry that he establishes his favorite conclusion, that private vices are public benefits. If the love of magnificence, a taste for the elegant arts and improvements of human life, for whatever is agreeable in dress, furniture, or equipage, for architecture, statuary, painting, and music, is to be regarded as luxury, 
sensuality, and ostentation, even in those whose situation allows without any inconveniency the indulgence of those passions. It is certain that luxury, sensuality, and ostentation are public benefits, since without qualities upon which he thinks proper to bestow such opprobrious names, the arts of refinement could never find encouragement and must languish for want of employment. Some popular ascetic doctrines which have been current before his time, and which placed virtue in the entire extirpation and annihilation of all our passions, were the real foundation of this licentious system. It was easy for Dr. Mandeville to prove, first, that this entire conquest never actually took place among men, and secondly, that if it was to take place universally, it would be pernicious to society, by putting an end to all industry and commerce, and in a manner to the whole business of human life. By the first of these propositions, he seemed to prove that there was no real virtue, and that what pretended to be such was a mere cheat and imposition upon mankind, and by the second that private vices were public benefits, since without them no society could prosper or flourish. Such is the system of Dr. Mandeville, which once made so much noise in the world, and which, though perhaps it never gave occasion to more vice than what would have been without it, at least taught that vice which arose from other causes to appear with more effrontery and to avow the corruption of its motives with a profligate audaciousness which has never been heard of before. But how destructive soever this system may appear, it could never have imposed upon so great a number of persons, nor have occasioned so general an alarm among those who are the friends of better principles, had it not in some respects bordered upon the truth. A system of natural philosophy may appear very plausible, and be for a long time very generally received in the world, and yet have no foundation in nature, nor any sort of resemblance in the truth. The vortices of Descartes were regarded by a very ingenuous nation, for near a century together, as a most satisfactory account of the revolutions of the heavenly bodies. Yet it has been demonstrated to the conviction of all mankind that these pretended causes of those wonderful effects not only do not actually exist, but are utterly impossible, and if they did exist, could produce no such effects as are ascribed to them. But it is otherwise with systems of moral philosophy and an author who pretends to account for the origin of our moral sentiments cannot deceive us so grossly, nor depart so very far from all resemblance to the truth. When a traveller gives an account of some distant country, he may impose upon our credulity the most groundless and absurd fictions as the most certain matters of fact, but when a person pretends to inform us of what passes in our neighbourhood and of the affairs of the very parish which we live in, though here too, if we are so careless as not to examine things with our own eyes, he may deceive us in many respects, yet the greatest falsehoods which he imposes upon us must bear some resemblance to the truth, and must even have a considerable mixture of truth in them. An author who treats the natural philosophy and pretends to assign the causes of the great phenomena of the universe, pretends to give an account of the affairs of a very distant country, concerning which he may tell us what he pleases, and as long as his narration keeps within the bounds of seemingly possibility, he need not despair of gaining our belief. But when he proposes to explain the origin of our desires and affections, of our sentiments and approbation and disapprobation, he pretends to give an account, not only of the affairs of the very parish that we live in, but of our own domestic concerns. Though here too, like indolent masters, who put their trust in a steward who deceives them, we are very liable to be imposed upon, yet we are incapable of passing any account which does not preserve some little regard to the truth. Some of the articles, at least, must be just, and even those which are most overcharged must have some foundation, otherwise the fraud would be detected, even by that careless inspection which we are disposed to give. The author who should assign, as the cause of any natural sentiment, some principle which neither had any connection with it, nor resembled any other principle which had some such connection, would appear absurd and ridiculous to the most injudicious and unexperienced reader. Section 3. Of the different systems which have been formed concerning the principle of approbation. Introduction. After the inquiry concerning the nature of virtue, the next question of importance in moral philosophy is concerning the principle of approbation. 
concerning the power or faculty of the mind which renders certain characters agreeable or disagreeable to us, makes us prefer one tenor of conduct to another, denominate the one right and the other wrong, and consider the one as the object of approbation, honor, and reward, and the other as that of blame, censure, and punishment. Three different accounts have been given of this principle of approbation. According to some, we approve and disapprove, both of our own actions and of those of others, from self-love only, or from some view of their tendency to our own happiness or disadvantage. According to others, reason, the same faculty by which we distinguish between truth and falsehood, enables us to distinguish between what is fit and unfit, both in actions and affections. According to others, this distinction is altogether the effect of immediate sentiment and feeling, and arises from the satisfaction or disgust with which the view of certain actions or affections inspires us. Self-love, reason, and sentiment, therefore, are the three different sources which have been assigned for the principle of approbation. Before I proceed to give an account of those different systems, I must observe that the determination of the second question, though the greatest importance in speculation, is of none in practice. The question concerning the nature of virtue necessarily has some influence upon our notions of right and wrong in many particular cases. That concerning the principle of approbation can possibly have no such effect. To examine from what contrivance or mechanism within those different notions or sentiments arise is a mere matter of philosophical curiosity. Chapter 1. Of those systems which deduce the principle of approbation from self-love. Those who account for the principle of approbation from self-love do not all account for it in the same manner, and there is a good deal of confusion and inaccuracy in all their different systems. According to Mr. Hobbes and many of his followers, man is driven to take refuge in society, not by any natural love which he bears to his own kind, but because without the assistance of others he is incapable of subsisting with ease or safety. Society upon this account becomes necessary to him, and whatever tends to its support and welfare he considers as having a remote tendency to his own interest, and on the contrary, whatever is likely to disturb or destroy it, he regards as in some measure hurtful or pernicious to himself. Virtue is the great support, and vice the great disturber of human society. The former, therefore, is agreeable, and the latter offensive to every man, as from the one he foresees the prosperity, and from the other the ruin and disorder of what is so necessary for the comfort and security of his existence. That tendency of virtue to promote and of vice to disturb the order of society, when we consider it coolly and philosophically, reflects a very great beauty upon the one and a very great deformity upon the other cannot, as I have observed upon a former occasion, be called into question. Human society, when we contemplate it in a certain abstract and philosophical light, appears like a great and immense machine whose regular and harmonious movements produce a thousand agreeable effects, as in any other beautiful and noble machine that was a production of human art. Whatever tended to render its movements more smooth and easily would derive a beauty from this effect, and, on the contrary, whatever tended to obstruct them would displease upon that account. So virtue, which is, as it were, the fine polish to the wheels of society, necessarily pleases, while vice, like rust, which makes them jar and grate upon one another, is as necessarily offensive. This account, therefore, of the origin of approbation and disapprobation, so far as it derives them from a regard to the order of society, runs into that principle which gives beauty to utility, and which I have explained upon a former occasion, and it is from thence that this system derives all that appearance of probability which it possesses. When those authors describe the innumerable advantages of a cultivated and social, above a savage and solitary life, when they expatiate upon the necessity of virtue and good order for the maintenance of the one and demonstrate how infallibly the prevalence of the vice and disobedience to the law tends to bring back the other. The reader is charged with the novelty and grandeur of those views which they open to him, and sees plainly a new beauty in virtue, and a new deformity in vice, which he had never taken notice of before, and is commonly so delighted with the discovery that he seldom takes time to reflect, 
that this political view, having never occurred to him in his life before, cannot possibly be the ground of that approbation and disapprobation with which he has always been accustomed to consider those different qualities. When those authors, on the other hand, deduce from self-love the interest which we take in the welfare of society and the esteem which upon that account we bestow upon virtue, they do not mean that when we are in this age applaud the virtue of Cato and detest the villainy of Catiline, our sentiments are influenced by the notion of any benefit we receive from the one or of any detriment we suffer from the other. It was not because of the prosperity or subversion of society in those remote ages and nations it was apprehended to have any influence upon our happiness or misery in the present times that according to those philosophers we esteemed the virtuous and blamed the disorderly characters. They never imagined that our sentiments were influenced by any benefit or damage which we supposed actually to redound to us from either, but by that which might have redounded to us had we lived in those distant ages and countries, or by that which still redound to us, if in our own times we should meet with characters of the same kind. The idea, in short, which those authors were groping about, but which they were never able to unfold distinctly, was that indirect sympathy which we feel with the gratitude or resentment of those who received the benefits or suffered the damage resulting from the opposite characters, and it was this which they were instinctively pointing at when they said that it was not the thought of what we had gained or suffered which prompted our applause or indignation, but the conception or imagination of what we might gain or suffer if we were to act in society with such associations. Sympathy, however, cannot in any sense be regarded as a selfish principle. When I sympathize with your sorrow or your indignation, it may be pretended indeed that my emotion is founded in self-love because it arises from bringing your case home to myself, from putting myself in your situation and thence conceiving what I should feel in the like circumstances. But though sympathy is very properly said to arise from an imaginary change of situations with the person principally concerned, yet this imaginary change is not supposed to happen to me in my own person and character, but in that of the person with whom I sympathize. When I condole with you for the loss of your only son, in order to enter into your grief, I do not consider what I, a person of such character and profession, should suffer if I had a son, and if that son was unfortunately to die. But I consider what I should suffer if I was really you, and not only change circumstances with you, but I change persons and characters. My grief, therefore, is entirely upon your account, and not in the least upon my own. It is not, therefore, in the least selfish. How can that be regarded as a selfish passion, which does not arise even from the imagination of anything that has befallen? or that relates to myself, in my own proper person and character, but which entirely occupied about what relates to you. A man may sympathize with a woman in childbed, though it is impossible that he should conceive himself as suffering her pains in his own proper person and character. That whole account of human nature, however, which deduces all sentiments and affections from self-love, which has made so much noise in the world, but which, so far as I know, has never yet been fully and distinctly explained, seems to me to have arisen from some confused misapprehension of the system of sympathy. Chapter 2. Of those systems which make reason the principle of approbation. It is well known to have been the doctrine of Mr. Hobbes that a state of nature is a state of war, and that antecedent to the institution of civil government there could be no safe or peaceable society among men. To preserve the society, therefore, according to him, was to support civil government and to destroy civil government was the same thing as to put an end to society. But the existence of civil government depends upon the obedience that is paid to the supreme magistrate. The moment he loses his authority, all government is at an end. As self-preservation, therefore, teaches men to applaud whatever tends to promote the welfare of society and to blame whatever is likely to hurt it, so the same principle, if they would think and speak consistently, ought to teach them to applaud upon all occasions obedience to the civil magistrate, and to blame all disobedience and rebellion. The very ideas of laudable and blamable ought to be the same with those of obedience and disobedience. The laws of a civil magistrate, therefore, 
ought to be regarded as the sole ultimate standards of what was just and unjust, of what was right and wrong. It was the avowed intentions of Mr. Hobbes, by propagating these notions, to subject the consciences of men immediately to the civil, and not to the ecclesiastical powers, whose turbulence and ambition he had been taught by the same of his own times to regard as the principal source of the disorder of society. His doctrine upon this account was peculiarly offensive to theologians, who, accordingly, did not fail to vent their indignation against him with great asperity and bitterness. It was likewise offensive to all sound moralists, as it supposed that there was no natural distinction between right and wrong, that these were mutable and changeable, and depended upon the mere arbitrary will of civil magistrate. The account of things, therefore, was attacked from all quarters and by all sorts of weapons, by sober reason as well as by furious declamation. In order to confute so odious a doctrine, it was necessary to prove that antecedent to all law or positive institution, the mind was naturally endowed with a faculty, by which it distinguished in certain actions and affections the qualities of right, laudable, and virtuous, and in others those of wrong, blamable, and vicious. Law, it was justly observed by Dr. Cudworth, could not be the original source of those distinctions, since upon the supposition of such a law it must either be right to obey it, and wrong to disobey it, or indifferent whether we obeyed it or disobeyed it. That law which it was indifferent whether we obeyed or disobeyed could not, it was evident, be the source of those distinctions, neither could that which it was right to obey and wrong to disobey, since even this still supposed the antecedent notions or ideas of right and wrong, and that obedience to the law was conformable to the idea of right and disobedience to that of wrong. Since the mind, therefore, had a notion of those distinctions antecedent to all law, it seemed necessarily to follow that it derived this notion from reason, which pointed out the difference between right and wrong, in the same manner in which it did that between truth and falsehood, and this conclusion, which, though true in some respects, is rather hasty in others, was more easily received at a time when the abstract science of human nature was but in its infancy, and before the distinct offices and powers of the different faculties of the human mind had been carefully examined and distinguished from one another. When this controversy with Mr. Hobbes was carried on with the greatest warmth and keenness, no other faculties had been thought of from which any such ideas could possibly be supposed to arise. It became at this point, therefore, the popular doctrine that the essence of virtue and vice did not consist in the conformity or disagreement of human actions with the law of a superior, but in this conformity or disagreement with reason, which was thus considered as the original source and principle of approbation and disapprobation. That virtue consists in conformity to reason, is true in some respects, and this faculty may very justly be considered as, in some sense, the source and principle of approbation and disapprobation, and of all solid judgments concerning right and wrong. It is by reason that we discover those general rules of justice by which we ought to regulate our actions, and it is by the same faculty that we form those more vague and indeterminate ideas of what is prudent, of what is decent, of what is generous or noble, which we carry constantly about with us, and according to which we endeavor, as well as we can, to model the tenor of our conduct. The general maxims of morality are formed like all other general maxims from experience and induction. We observe in a great variety of particular cases what pleases or displeases our moral faculties, what these approve or disapprove of, and, by induction from this experience, we establish those general rules. But induction is always regarded as one of the operations of reason. From reason, therefore, we are very properly said to derive all those general maxims and ideas. It is by these, however, that we regulate the greater part of our moral judgments, which would be extremely uncertain and precarious if they depended altogether upon what is liable to so many variations as immediate sentiment and feeling, which the different states of health and humour are capable of altering so essentially. As our most solid judgments, therefore, with regard to right and wrong, are regulated by maxims, ideas, virtues from an induction of reason, Virtue may very properly be said 
to consist in a conformity to reason, and so far this faculty may be considered as the source and principle of approbation and disapprobation. But though reason is undoubtedly the source of the general rules of morality, and the moral judgments which we form by the means of them, it is altogether absurd and unintelligible to suppose that the first perceptions of the right and wrong can be derived from reason, even in those particular cases upon the experience of which the general rules are formed. These first perceptions, as well as all other experiments upon which any general rules are founded, cannot be the object of reason, but of immediate sense and feeling. It is by finding in a vast variety of instances that one tenor of conduct constantly pleases in a certain manner, and that another as constantly displeases the mind, that we form the general rules of morality. But reason cannot render any particular object either agreeable or disagreeable to the mind for its own sake. Reason may show that this object is the means of obtaining some other, which is naturally either pleasing or displeasing, and in this manner may render it either agreeable or disagreeable for the sake of something else. But nothing can be agreeable or disagreeable for its own sake, which is not rendered such by immediate sense and feeling. If virtue, therefore, in every particular instance, necessarily pleases for its own sake, and if vice as certainly displeases the mind, it cannot be reason, but immediate sense and feeling, which in this manner reconciles us to the one, and alienates us from the other. Pleasure and pain are the great objects of desire and aversion, but these are distinguished not by reason, but by immediate sense and feeling. If virtue, therefore, be desirable for its own sake, and if vice be, in the same manner, the object of aversion, it cannot be reason which originally distinguishes those different qualities, but immediate sense and feeling. As reason, however, in a certain sense, may justly be considered as the principle of approbation and disapprobation, these sentiments were, through inattention, long regarded as originally flowing from the operations of this faculty. Dr. Hutchinson had the merit of being the first who distinguished with any degree of precision in what respect all moral distinctions may be said to arise from reason, and in what respect they are founded upon immediate sense and feeling. In his illustrations upon the moral sense, he has explained this so fully, and, in my opinion, so unanswerably, that if any controversy is still kept up about this subject, I can impute it to nothing, but either to inattention to what that gentleman has written, or to a superstitious attachment to certain forms of expression, a weakness not very uncommon among the learned, especially in subjects so deeply interesting as the present, in which a man of virtue is often loath to abandon even the propriety of a single phrase which he has been accustomed to. Chapter 3. Of those systems which make sentiment the principle of approbation. Those systems which make sentiment the principle of approbation may be divided into two different classes. According to some, the principle of approbation is founded upon a sentiment of peculiar nature, upon a peculiar power of perception exerted by the mind at the view of certain actions or affections, some of which affecting this faculty in an agreeable or others in a disagreeable manner. The former are stamped with the characters of right, laudable, and virtuous, the latter with those of wrong, blamable, and vicious. This sentiment, being of a peculiar nature, distinct from every other, and the effect of a particular power of perception, they give it a particular name and call it a moral sense. According to others, in order to account for the principle of approbation, there is no occasion for supposing any new power of perception which had never been heard of before. Nature, they imagine, acts here, as in all other cases, with the strictest economy and produces a multitude of effects from one and the same cause. And sympathy, a power which has always been taken notice of, and with which the mind is manifestly endowed, is, they think, sufficient to account for all the effects ascribed to this peculiar faculty. Dr. Hutchison has been at great pains to prove that the principle of self-approbation was not founded on self-love. He had demonstrated, too, that it could not arise from any operation of reason. Nothing remained, he thought, but to suppose it a faculty of peculiar kind with which nature had endowed the human mind in order to produce this one particular an important effect. 
when self-love and reason were both excluded, it did not occur to him that there was any other known faculty of the mind which could in any respect answer this purpose. This new power of perception he called a moral sense and supposed it to be somewhat analogous to the external senses, as the bodies around us, by affecting these in a certain manner, appear to possess the different qualities of sound, taste, odor, color. So the various affections of the human mind, by touching this particular faculty in a certain manner, appear to possess the different qualities of amiable and odious, of virtuous and vicious, of right and wrong. The various senses or powers of perception from which the human mind derives all its simple ideas were, according to this system, of two different kinds, of which the one were called the direct or antecedent, the other the reflex or consequent senses. The direct senses were those faculties from which the mind derived the perception of such species of things as did not presuppose the antecedent perception of any other. Thus sounds and colors were objects of the direct senses. To hear a sound or to see a color does not presuppose the antecedent perception of any other quality or object. The reflect or consequent senses, on the other hand, were those faculties from which the mind derived the perception of such species of things as presupposed the antecedent perception of some other. Thus harmony and beauty were the objects of the reflex senses. In order to perceive the harmony of a sound or the beauty of a color, we must first perceive the sound or the color. The moral sense was considered as a faculty of this kind, that faculty which Mr. Locke calls reflection, and from which he derived the simple ideas of the different passions and emotions of the human mind, was, according to Dr. Hutchison, a direct internal sense, that faculty, again, by which we perceive the beauty or deformity, the virtue or vice, of those different passions and emotions, was a reflex internal sense. Dr. Hutchison endeavored still further to support this doctrine by showing that it was agreeable to the analogy of nature and that the mind was endowed with a variety of other reflex senses exactly similar to the moral sense, such as a sense of beauty and deformity in external objects, a public sense by which we sympathize with the happiness or misery of our fellow creatures, a sense of shame and honor, and a sense of ridicule. But notwithstanding all the pains which this ingenious philosopher has taken to prove that principle of approbation is founded in a peculiar power of perception, somewhat analogous to the external senses, there are some consequences which he acknowledges to follow from this doctrine, that will, perhaps, be regarded by many as a sufficient confutation of it. The qualities he allows, which belong to the objects of any sense, cannot, without the greatest absurdity, be ascribed to the sense itself. Whoever thought of calling the sense of seeing black or white, the sense of hearing loud or low, or the sense of tasting sweet or bitter, and, according to him, it is equally absurd to call our moral faculties virtuous or vicious, morally good or evil. These qualities belong to the objects of those faculties, not to the faculties themselves. If any man, therefore, was so absurdly constituted as to approve of cruelty and injustice as the highest virtues, and to disapprove the equity and humanity as the most pitiful vices, such a constitution of mind might indeed be regarded as inconvenient both to the individual and to the society, and likewise as strange, surprising, and unnatural in itself. But it could not, without the greatest absurdity, be denominated vicious or morally evil. Yet if we saw any man shouting with admiration and applause at a barbarous and unmerited execution, which some insolent tyrant had ordered, we should not think we were guilty of any great absurdity in denominating this behavior vicious and morally evil in the highest degree. Though it expressed nothing but depraved moral faculties or an absurd approbation of this horrid action, as of what was noble, magnanimous, and great, our heart, I imagine, at the sight of such a spectator, would forget for a while its sympathy with the sufferer and feel nothing but horror and detestation at the thought of so execrable a wretch. We should abominate him even more than that tyrant who might be goaded on by the strong passions of jealousy, fear, and resentment, and upon that account of more excusable. But the sentiments of the spectator would appear altogether without cause or motive, and therefore 
most perfectly and completely detestable. There is no perversion of sentiment or affection which our heart would be more averse to enter into, or which it would reject with greater hatred and indignation than one of this kind. And so far from regarding such a constitution of mind as being merely something strange or inconvenient, and not in any respect vicious or morally evil, we should rather consider it as the very last and most dreadful stage of moral depravity. Correct moral sentiments, on the contrary, naturally appear in some degree laudable and morally good. The man whose censure and applause are upon all occasions suited with the greatest accuracy to the value or unworthiness of the object seems to deserve a degree even of moral approbation. We admire the delicate precision of his moral sentiments. They lead our own judgments and upon account of their uncommon and surprising justness they even excite our wonder and applause. We cannot, indeed, be always sure that the conduct of such a person would be in any respect correspondent to the precision and accuracy of his judgments concerning the conduct of others. Virtue requires habit and resolution of mind, as well as delicacy of sentiment, and, unfortunately, the former qualities are sometimes wanting, where the latter is in the greatest perfection. This disposition of mind, however, though it may sometimes be attended with imperfections, is incompatible with anything that is grossly criminal, and is the happiest foundation upon which the superstructure of perfect virtue can be built. There are many men who will mean very well, and seriously purpose to do what they think their duty, who, notwithstanding, are disagreeable on account of the coarseness of their moral sentiments. It may be said, perhaps, that though principle of approbation is not founded upon any power of perception that is in any respect analogous to the external senses, it may still be founded upon a peculiar sentiment which answers as one particular purpose and no other. Approbation and disapprobation, it may be pretended, are certain feelings or emotions which arise in the mind upon the view of different characters and actions. And as resentment might be called a sense of injuries or gratitude, a sense of benefits, so these may very properly receive the name of a sense of right and wrong, or of a moral sense. But this account of things, though it may not be liable to the same objects with the foregoing, is exposed to others, which are equally unanswerable. First of all, whatever variations in particular emotion may undergo, it still preserves the general features which distinguish it to be an emotion of such a kind, and these general features are always more striking and remarkable than any variation which it may undergo in particular cases. Thus anger is an emotion of a particular kind, and accordingly its general features are always more distinguishable than all the variations it undergoes in particular cases. Anger against a man is no doubt somewhat different from anger against a woman, and that again from anger against a child. In each of those three cases, the general passion of anger receives a different modification from the particular characters of its object, as may easily be observed by the attentive. But still the general features of the passion predominate in all the cases. To distinguish these requires no nice observation. A very delicate attention, on the contrary, is necessary to discover their variations. Everybody takes notice of the former. Scarce anybody observes the latter. If approbation and disapprobation, therefore, were, like gratitude and resentment, emotions of a particular kind, distinct from every other, we should expect that in all variations which either of them might undergo, it would still retain the general features which mark it to be an emotion of such a particular kind, clear, plain, and easily distinguishable. But in fact it happens quite otherwise if we attend to what we really feel when upon different occasions we either approve or disapprove. We shall find that our emotion in one case is often totally different from that in another, and that no common features can possibly be discovered between them. Thus the approbation with which we view a tender, delicate, and humane sentiment is quite different from that which we are struck by, one that appears great, daring, and magnanimous. Our approbation of both may upon different occasions be perfect and entire, but we are softened by the one and we are elevated by the other, and there is no sort of resemblance between the emotions which they excite in us. But according to that system, which I have been endeavouring to establish, 
this must necessarily be the case, as the emotions of the person whom we approve of are in those two cases quite opposite to one another, and as our approbation arises from sympathy with those opposite emotions, what we feel upon the one occasion can have no sort of resemblance to what we feel upon the other. But this could not happen if approbation consisted in a peculiar emotion which had nothing in common with the sentiments we approved of, but which arose at the view of those sentiments, like any other passion at the view of its proper object. The same thing holds true with regard to disapprobation. Our horror for cruelty has no sort of resemblance to our contempt for mean-spiritedness. It is quite a different species of discord, which we feel at the time of those two different vices between our own minds and those of the person whose sentiments and behavior we consider. Secondly, I have already observed that not only the different passions or affections of the human mind, which are approved or disapproved of, appear morally good or evil, but that proper and improper approbation appear, to our natural senses, to be stamped with the same characters. I would ask, therefore, how it is, that according to this system, we approve or disapprove of proper or improper approbation. To this question there is, I imagine, but one reasonable answer, which can possibly be given. It must be said, that when the approbation which our neighbor regards the conduct of a third person coincides with our own, we approve of his approbation and consider it as, in some measure, morally good, and that, on the contrary, when it does not coincide with our own sentiments, we disapprove of it, and consider it as, in some measure, morally evil. It must be allowed, therefore, that at least in this one case the coincidence or opposition of sentiments between the observer and the person observed constitutes moral approbation or disapprobation. And if it does so, in this one case, I would ask, why not in every other? Or, to what purpose imagine a new power of perception in order to account for those sentiments? Against every account of the principle of approbation, which makes it depend upon a peculiar sentiment distinct from every other, I would object that it is strange that this sentiment which providence undoubtedly intended to be the governing principle of human nature, should hitherto have been so little taken notice of, as not to have got a name in any language. The word moral sense is of very late formation, and cannot yet be considered as making part of the English tongue. The word approbation has but within these few years been appropriated to denote peculiarly anything of this kind. In propriety of language, we approve of whatever is entirely to our satisfaction, of the form of a building, of the contrivance of a machine, of the flavor of a dish of meat. The word conscience does not immediately denote any moral faculty by which we approve or disapprove. Conscience supposes, indeed, the existence of some such faculty, and properly signifies our consciousness of having acted agreeably or contrary to its directions. When love hatred, joy, sorrow, gratitude, resentment, with so many other passions, which are all supposed to be the subjects of this principle, have made themselves considerable enough to get titles to know them by. It is not surprising that the sovereign of them all should hitherto have been so little heeded, that a few philosophers excepted, nobody has yet thought it worth while to bestow a name upon it. When we approve of any character or action, the sentiment which we feel are according to the foregoing system, derived from four sources, which are in some respects different from one another. First, we sympathize with the motives of the agent. Secondly, we enter into the gratitude of those who receive the benefit of his actions. Thirdly, we observe that his conduct has been agreeable to the general rules by which those two sympathies generally act. And last of all, when we consider such actions as making a part of a system of behavior which tends to promote the happiness either of the individual or of the society. They appear to derive a beauty from this utility, not unlike that which we ascribe to any well-contrived machine. After deducting, in any one particular case, all that must be acknowledged to proceed from some one or other of these four principles, I should be glad to know what remains, and I shall freely allow this overplus to be ascribed to a moral sense or to any other peculiar faculty, provided anybody will ascertain precisely what this overplus is. It might be expected, perhaps, that if there was any such peculiar principle 
such as this moral sense, is supposed to be, we should feel it, in some particular cases, separated and detached from every other, as we often feel joy, sorrow, hope, and fear, pure and unmixed with any other emotion. This, however, I imagine, cannot even be pretended. I have never heard any instance alleged in which this principle could be said to exert itself alone and unmixed with sympathy or antipathy, with gratitude or resentment, with the perception of the agreement or disagreement of any action to an established rule, or last of all, with that general taste for beauty and order, which is excited by inanimated as well as by animated objects. There is another system which attempts to account for the origin of our moral sentiments from sympathy, distinct from that which I have been endeavouring to establish. It is that which places virtue in utility, and accounts for the pleasure with which the spectator surveys the utility of any quality from sympathy with the happiness of those who are affected by it. This sympathy is different both from that by which we enter into the motives of the agent, and from which by that we go along with the gratitude of the persons who are benefited by his actions. It is the same principle with that by which we approve of a well-contrived machine, but no machine can be the object of either of those two last-mentioned sympathies. I have already, in the fourth part of this discourse, given some account of this system. Section 4. Of the manner in which different authors have treated of the practical rules of morality. It was observed in the third part of this discourse that the rules of justice are the only rules of morality which are precise and accurate, that those of all other virtues are loose, vague, and indeterminate, that the first may be compared to the rules of grammar, the others to those which critics lay down for the attainment of what is sublime and elegant in composition, and which, and which, and which present and which present us, rather, with a general idea of the perfection we ought to aim at, that afford us any certain and infallible directions for acquiring it. As the different rules of morality admit such different degrees of accuracy, those authors who have endeavored to collect and digest them into systems have done it in two different manners, and one set has followed through the whole that loose method to which they were naturally directed by the consideration of one species of virtues while another has universally endeavoured to introduce into their precepts that sort of accuracy of which only some of them are susceptible. The first have wrote like critics, the second like grammarians. The first among whom we may count all the ancient moralists have contented themselves with describing in a general manner the different vices and virtues, and with pointing out the deformity and misery of the one disposition as well as the propriety and happiness of the other, but have not affected to lay down many precise rules that are to hold good unexceptionably in all particular cases. They have only endeavoured to ascertain as far as language is capable of ascertaining. First, wherein consists the sentiment of the heart, upon which each particular virtue is founded, what sort of internal feeling or emotion it is which constitutes the essence of friendship, of humanity, of generosity, of justice, of magnanimity, and of all the other virtues, as well as that of vices, which are opposed to them. And secondly, what is the general way of acting, the ordinary tone and tenor of conduct, to which each of those sentiments would direct us? Or how it is that a friendly, a generous, a brave, a just, and a humane man would, upon ordinary occasions, choose to act? To characterize the sentiment of the heart, upon which each particular virtue is founded, Though it requires both a delicate and accurate pencil, is a task, however, which may be executed with some degree of exactness. It is impossible, indeed, to express all the variations which each sentiment either does or ought to undergo, according to every possible variation of circumstances. They are endless, and language wants names to mark them by. The sentiment of friendship, for example, which we feel for an old man, is different from that which we feel for a young. That which we entertain for an austere man different from that which we feel for one of softer and gentler manners, and that again from what we feel for one of gay vivacity and spirit. The friendship which we conceive for a man is different from that which a woman affects us, even where there is no mixture of any grosser passion. What author could enumerate and ascertain 
these and all other infinite varieties which this sentiment is capable of undergoing but still the general sentiment of friendship and familiar attachment which is common to them all may be ascertained with a sufficient degree of accuracy the picture which is drawn of it though it will always be in many respects incomplete may however have such a resemblance as to make us know the original when we meet with it and even distinguish it from other sentiments to which it has a considerable resemblance such as goodwill respect esteem and admiration to describe in a general manner what is the ordinary way of acting to which each virtue would prompt us is still more easy it is indeed scarce possible to describe the internal sentiment or emotion upon which it is founded without doing something of this kind it is impossible by language to express if i may say so the invisible features of all the different modifications of passion as they show themselves within there is no other way of marking and distinguishing them from one another but by describing the effects which they produce without the alterations which they occasion in the countenance in the air and eternal behavior the resolutions they suggest the actions they prompt to it is thus that cicero in the first book of his offices endeavors to direct us to that practice of the four cardinal virtues and that aristotle in the practical parts of his ethics points out to us the different habits by which he would have had us regulate our behavior such as liberality magnificence magnanimity and even jocularity and good humor qualities which that indulgent philosopher has thought worthy of a place in the catalogue of the virtues though the lightness of that approbation which we naturally bestow upon them should not seem to entitle them to so honorable a name such works present us with agreeable and lively pictures of manners by the vivacity of their description they inflame our natural love of virtue and increase our abhorrence of vice by the justness as well as the delicacy of their observations they may often help both to correct and to ascertain our natural sentiments with regard to the propriety of conduct and suggesting many nice and delicate attentions form us to a more exact justness of behavior than what without such instructions we should have been apt to think of in treating of the rules of morality in this manner consists of science which is properly called ethics a science which though like criticism it does not admit of the most accurate precision is however both highly useful and agreeable it is of all others the most susceptible to the embellishments of eloquence and by the means of them of bestowing if that be possible a new importance upon the smallest rules of duty its precepts when thus dressed and adorned are capable of producing upon the flexibility of youth the noblest and most lasting impressions and as they fall in with the natural magnanimity of that generous age they are able to inspire for a time at least the most heroic resolutions and thus tend both to establish and confirm the best and most useful habits of which the mind of man is susceptible whatever precept and exhortation can do to animate us to the practice of virtue is done by this science delivered in this manner the second set of moralists among whom we may account all the casuists of the middle and latter ages of the christian church as well as all those who in this and the preceding century have treated of what is called natural jurisprudence do not content themselves with characterizing in this general manner that tenor of conduct which they would recommend to us but endeavor to lay down exact and precise rules for the direction of every circumstance of our behavior as justice is the only virtue with regard to which such exact rules can properly be given it is this virtue that has chiefly befallen under the consideration of those two different sets of writers they treat of it however in a very different manner those who write upon the principles of jurisprudence consider only what the person to whom the obligation is due ought to think himself entitled to exact by force what every impartial spectator would approve of him for exacting or what a judge or arbiter to whom he had submitted his case and who had undertaken to do him justice ought to oblige the other person to suffer or to perform the casuists on the other hand do not so much examine what it is that might properly be exacted by force as what it is that the person who owes the obligation ought to think himself bound to perform 
from the most sacred and scrupulous regard to the general rules of justice, and from the most conscientious dread, either of wronging his neighbor or of violating the integrity of his own character. It is the end of jurisprudence to prescribe rules for the decisions of judges and arbiters. It is the end of casuistry to prescribe rules for the conduct of a good man. By observing all the rules of jurisprudence, supposing them ever so perfect, we should deserve nothing but to be free from external punishment. By observing those of casuistry, supposing them such as they ought to be, we should be entitled to considerable praise by the exactness and scrupulous delicacy of our behavior. It may frequently happen that a good man ought to think himself bound, from a sacred and conscientious regard to the general rules of justice, to perform many things which would be the highest injustice to extort from him, or for any judge or arbiter to impose upon him by force. To give a trite example, a highwayman, by the fear of death, obliges a traveller to promise him a certain sum of money. Whether such a promise, extorted in this manner, by unjust force, ought to be regarded as obligatory, is a question that has been very much debated. If we consider it merely as a question of jurisprudence, the decision can admit of no doubt. It would be absurd to suppose that the highwayman can be entitled to use force to constrain the other to perform. To extort the promise was a crime which deserved the highest punishment, and to extort the performance would only be adding a new crime to the former. He can complain of no injury who has been only deceived by the person by whom he might justly have been killed. To suppose that a judge ought to enforce the obligation of such promises, or that the magistrate ought to allow them to sustain action at law, would be the most ridiculous of all absurdities. If we consider this question, therefore, as a question of jurisprudence, we can be at no loss about the decision. But if we consider it as a question of casuistry, it will not be so easily determined whether a good man from a conscientious regard to that most sacred rule of justice, which commands the observance of all serious promises, would not think himself bound to perform, is at least much more doubtful, that no regard is due to the disappointment of the wretch who brings him into this situation, that no injury is done to the robber, and consequently that nothing can be extorted by force, will admit of no sort of dispute. But whether some regard is not, in this case, due to his own dignity and honour, to the inviolable sacredness of that part of his character which makes him reverence the law of truth and abhor everything that approaches to treachery and falsehood, may, perhaps, be more reasonably be made a question. The casuists, accordingly, are greatly divided about it. One party, with whom we may count Cicero, among the ancients, among the moderns, Puffendorf, Barbeyrac, his commentator, and, above all, the late Dr. Hutchison, one who in most cases was by no means a loose casuist, determined without any hesitation that no sort of regard is due to any such promise, and that to think otherwise is mere weakness and superstition. Another party among whom we may reckon some of the ancient fathers of the church, as well as some very eminent modern casuists, have been of another opinion, and have judged all such promises obligatory. If we consider the matter according to the common sentiments of mankind, we shall find that some regard would be thought due even to a promise of this kind, but that it is impossible to determine how much, by any general rule, that will apply to all cases without exception. The man who was quite frank and easy in making promises of this kind, and who violated them with as little ceremony, we should not choose for our friend and companion. A gentleman who should promise a highwayman five pounds and not perform, would incur some blame. If the sum promised, however, was very great, it might be more doubtful what was proper to be done. If it was such, for example, that the payment of it would entirely ruin the family of the promiser, if it was so great as to be sufficient for promoting the most useful purposes, it would appear in some measure criminal, at least extremely improper to throw it for the sake of a punctilio into such worthless hands. The man who should beggar himself, or who should throw away a hundred thousand pounds, though he could afford that vast sum for the sake of observing such a parole with a thief, would appear the common sense of mankind, absurd and extravagant in the highest degree. 
Such profusion would seem inconsistent with his duty, with what he owed both to himself and others, and what, therefore, regard to a promise extorted in this manner could by no means authorize. To fix, however, by any precise rule, what degree of regard ought to be paid to it, or what might be the greatest sum which could be due from it, is evidently impossible. This would vary according to the characters of the persons, according to their circumstances, according to the solemnity of the promise, and even according to the incidents of the rencounter. And if the promiser had been treated with a great deal of that sort of gallantry, which is sometimes to be met with the persons of the most abandoned characters, more would seem due than upon other occasions. It may be said in general that exact propriety requires the observance of all such promises, wherever it is not inconsistent with some other duties that are more sacred, such as regard to the public interest, to those whom gratitude, whom natural affection, or whom the laws of proper beneficence should prompt us to provide for. But as was formerly taken notice of, we have no precise rules to determine what external actions are due from a regard to such motives, nor consequently when it is that those virtues are inconsistent with the observance of such promises. It is to be observed, however, that whenever such promises are violated, though for the most necessary reasons it is always with some degree of dishonor to the person who made them. After they are made, we may be convinced of the impropriety of observing them, but still there is some fault in having made them. It is at least a departure from the highest and noblest maxims of magnanimity and honor. A brave man ought to die rather than make a promise which he can neither keep without folly nor violate without ignominy. For some degree of ignominy always attends a situation of this kind. Treachery and falsehood are vices so dangerous, so dreadful, and at the same time such as may so easily and upon many occasions so safely be indulged that we are more jealous of them than of almost any other. Our imagination, therefore, attaches the idea of shame to all violations of faith, in every circumstance and in every situation. They resemble in this respect the violations of chastity in the fair sex, a virtue of which, for the like reasons, we are excessively jealous, and our sentiments are not more delicate with regard to the one than with regard to the other, Breach of chastity dishonors irretrievably. No circumstances, no solicitation can excuse it. No sorrow, no repentance atone for it. We are so nice in this respect that even a rape dishonors, and the innocence of the mind cannot, in our imagination, wash out the pollution of the body. It is the same case with the violation of faith, when it has been solemnly pledged even to the most worthless of mankind. Fidelity is so necessary a virtue that we apprehend it, in general, to be due even to those to whom nothing else is due, and whom we think it lawful to kill and destroy. It is to no purpose that the person who has been guilty of the breach of it urges that he promised in order to save his life, and that he broke his promise because it was inconsistent with some other respectable duty to keep it. These circumstances may alleviate, but cannot entirely wipe out his dishonor. He appears to have been guilty of an action with which, in the imaginations of men, some degree of shame is inseparably connected. He has broke a promise which he has solemnly averred he would maintain, and his character, if not irretrievably stained and polluted, has at least ridicule affixed to it, which it will be very difficult entirely to efface, and no man, I imagine, who had gone through an adventure of this kind would be fond of telling the story. This instance may serve to show wherein consists the difference between casuistry and jurisprudence, even when both of them consider the obligations of the general rules of justice. But though this difference be real and essential, though those two sciences propose quite different ends, the sameness of the subject has made such similarity between them, that the greater part of authors whose professed design was to treat of jurisprudence have determined the different questions they examine, sometimes according to the principles that science, and sometimes according to those of casuistry, without distinguishing, and perhaps without being themselves, aware when they did the one and when the other. The doctrine of casuists, however, 
is by no means confined to the consideration of what a conscientious regard to the general rules of justice would demand of us. It embraces many other parts of Christian and moral duty. What seems principally to have given occasion to the cultivation of this species of science was the custom of auricular confession, introduced by the Roman Catholic superstition, in times of barbarism and ignorance. By that institution, the most secret actions, and even the thoughts of every person, which could be suspected of receding, in the smallest degree, from the rules of Christian purity, were to be revealed to the confessor. The confessor informed his penitents, whether and in what respect they had violated their duty, and what penance it behoved them to undergo, before he could absolve them in the name of the offended deity. The consciousness or even the suspicion of having done wrong is a load upon every mind, and is accompanied with anxiety and terror in all those who are not hardened by the long habits of iniquity. Men in this, as in all other distresses, are naturally eager to disburden themselves of the oppression which they feel upon their thoughts. By unbosoming the agony of their mind to some person whose secrecy and discretion they can confide in, the shame which they suffer from this acknowledgement is fully compensated by that deviation of their uneasiness which the sympathy of their confidant seldom fails to occasion. It relieves them to find that they are not altogether unworthy of regard, and that however their past conduct may be censured, their present disposition is at least approved of, and is perhaps sufficient to compensate the other, at least to maintain them in some degree of esteem with their friend. A numerous and artful clergy had, in those times of superstition, insinuated themselves into the confidence of almost every private family. They possessed all the little learnings which the times could afford, and their manners, though in many respects rude and disorderly, were polished and regular compared with those of the age they lived in. They were regarded, therefore, not only as the great directors of all religious, but of all moral duties. The familiarity gave reputation to whoever was so happy as to possess it, and every mark of their disapprobation stamped the deepest ignominy upon all who had the misfortune to fall under it. Being considered as the great judges of right and wrong, they were naturally consulted about all scruples that occurred, and it was reputable for any person to have it known that he made those holy men the confidence of all such secrets, and took no important or delicate step in his conduct without their advice and approbation. It was not difficult for the clergy, therefore, to get it established as a general rule that they should be entrusted with what it had already become fashionable to entrust them, and with what they generally would have been entrusted though no such rule had been established. To qualify themselves for confessors became thus a necessary part of the study of churchmen and divines, and they were thence led to collect what are called cases of conscience, nice and delicate situations in which it is hard to determine whereabouts the propriety of conduct may lie. Such works, they imagined, might be of use both to the directors of consciences and to those who were to be directed, and hence the origin of books of casuistry. The moral duties which fell under the consideration of the casuists were chiefly those which can in some measure at least be circumscribed with general rules, and which of the violation is naturally attended with some degree of remorse and some dread of suffering punishment. The design of that institution which gave occasion to their works was to appease those terrors of conscience which attend upon the infringement of such duties, but it is not every virtue of which the defect is accompanied with any very severe compunctions of this kind, and no man applies to his confessor for absolution, because he did not perform the most generous, the most friendly, or the most magnanimous action which, in his circumstances, it is possible to perform. In failures of this kind, the rule that is violated is commonly not very determinate, and is generally of such a nature too that though the observance of it might entitle to honour and reward, the violation seems to expose to no positive blame, censure, or punishment. The exercise of such virtues, the casuists seem to have regarded as a sort of works of supererogation, which could not be very strictly exacted, and which it was therefore unnecessary for them to treat of. The breaches of moral duty, therefore, which came before the tribunal of the confessor 
and upon that account fell under the cognizance of the casuists, were chiefly of three different kinds. First and principally, breaches of the rules of justice. The rules here are all express and positive, and the violation of them is naturally attended with the consciousness of deserving, and the dread of suffering punishment from both God and man. Secondly, breaches of the rules of chastity. These, in all grosser instances, are real breaches of the rules of justice, and no person can be guilty of them without doing the most unpardonable injury to some other. In small instances, when they amount only to the violation of those exact decorums which ought to be observed in the conversation of the two sexes, they cannot indeed justly be considered as violations of the rules of justice. They are generally, however, violations of a pretty plain rule, and at least in one of the sexes tend to bring ignominy upon the person who has been guilty of them, and consequently to be attended in the scrupulous with some degree of shame and contrition of mind. Thirdly, breaches of the rules of veracity. The violation of truth, it is to be observed, is not always a breach of justice, though it is so upon many occasions, and consequently cannot always expose to any external punishment. The vice of common lying, though a most miserable meanness, may frequently do hurt to nobody, and in this case no claim of vengeance or satisfaction can be due either to the persons imposed upon or to others. But though the violation of truth is not always a breach of justice, it is always a breach of a very plain rule, and what naturally tends to cover with shame the person who has been guilty of it. There seems to be in young children an instinctive disposition to believe whatever they are told. Nature seems to have judged it necessary for their preservation that they should, for some time at least, put implicit confidence in those whom the care of their childhood and of the earliest and most necessary parts of their education is entrusted. Their credulity, accordingly, is excessive, and it requires long and much experience of the falsehood of mankind to reduce them to a reasonable degree of diffidence and distrust. In grown-up people, the degrees of credulity are no doubt very different. The wisest and most experienced are generally the least credulous, but the man scarce lives who is not more credulous than he ought to be, and who does not, upon many occasions, give credit to tales which not only turn out to be perfectly false, but which a very moderate degree of reflection and attention might have taught him could not well be true. The nature of disposition is always to believe. It is acquired wisdom and experience only that teach incredulity, and they very seldom teach it enough. The wisest and most cautious of us all frequently give credit to stories which he himself is afterwards both ashamed and astonished that he could possibly think of believing. The man who we believe is necessarily in the things concerning which we believe him, our leader and director, and we look up to him with a certain degree of esteem and respect. But as far admiring other people, we come to wish to be admired ourselves. So from being led and directed by other people, we learn to wish to become ourselves leaders and directors. And as we cannot always be satisfied merely with being admired, unless we can at the same time persuade ourselves that we are in some degree really worthy of admiration, so we cannot always be satisfied merely with being believed, unless we are at the same time conscious that we are really worthy of belief. As the desire of praise and that of praiseworthiness, though a very much akin, are yet distinct and separate desires, so the desire of being believed and that of being worthy of belief, though very much akin to, are equally distinct and separate desires. The desire of being believed, the desire of persuading, of leading and directing other people, seems to be one of the strongest of all our natural desires. It is perhaps the instinct upon which is founded the faculty of speech. No characteristical faculty of human nature, no other animal possesses this faculty, and we cannot discover in any other animal any desire to lead and direct the judgment and conduct of its fellows. Great ambition, the desire of real superiority of leading and directing, seems to be altogether peculiar to man, and speech is the great instrument of ambition, of real superiority of leading and directing the judgments and conducts of other people. It is always mortifying not to be believed, and it is doubly so when we suspect that it is because we are supposed to be unworthy of belief 
and capable of seriously and willingly deceiving. To tell a man that he lies is of all affronts the most mortal. But whoever seriously and willfully deceives is necessarily conscious to himself that he merits this affront, that he does not deserve to be believed, and that he forfeits all title to that sort of credit from which alone he can derive any sort of ease, comfort, or satisfaction in the society of his equals. The man who had the misfortune to imagine that nobody believed a single word he said would feel himself the outcast of human society, would dread the very thought of going into it, or of presenting himself before it, and could scarce fail, I think, to die of despair. It is probable, however, that no man ever had just reason to entertain this humiliating opinion of himself. The most notorious liar, I am disposed to believe, tells the fair truth at least twenty times for once that he seriously and deliberately lies, and as the most cautious the disposition to believe is apt to prevail over the doubt and distrust, so in those who are the most regardless of truth, the natural disposition to it prevails upon most occasions over that to deceive, or in any respect to alter or disguise it. We are mortified when we happen to deceive other people, though unintentionally, and from having been ourselves deceived. Though this involuntary falsehood may frequently be no mark of any want of veracity, of any want of the most perfect love of truth, it is always in some mark a degree of want of judgment, of want of memory, of improper credulity, of some degree of precipitancy and rashness. It always diminishes our authority to persuade, and always brings some degree of suspicion upon our fitness to lead and direct. The man who sometimes misleads from mistake, however, is widely different from him who is capable of willfully deceiving. The former may safely be trusted upon many occasions, the latter very seldom upon any. Frankness and openness conciliate confidence. We trust the man who seems willing to trust us. We see clearly, we think the road by which he means to conduct us, and we abandon ourselves with pleasure to his guidance and direction. Reserve and concealment, on the contrary, call forth diffidence. We are afraid to follow the man who is going we do not know where. The great pleasure of conversation and society, besides, arises from a certain correspondence of sentiments and opinions, from a certain harmony of minds, which like so many musical instruments coincide and keep time with one another. But this most delightful harmony cannot be obtained unless there is a free communication of sentiments and opinions. We all desire upon this account to feel how each other is affected, to penetrate into each other's bosoms, and to observe the sentiments and affections which really subsist there. The man who indulges us in this natural passion, who invites us into his heart, who, as it were, sets open the gates of his breasts to us, seems to exercise a species of hospitality more delightful than any other. No man who has an ordinary good temper can fail of pleasing. If he has the courage to utter his real sentiments as he feels them, and because he feels them, it is this unreserved sincerity which renders even the prattle of a child agreeable. How weak and imperfect soever the views of the open-hearted, we take pleasure to enter into them, and in endeavors, as much as we can, to bring down our own understanding to the level of their capacities, and to regard every subject in the particular light in which they appear to have considered it. This passion to discover the real sentiments of others is naturally so strong that it often degenerates into a troublesome and impertinent curiosity to pry into those secrets of our neighbors which they have very justifiable reasons for concealing, and upon many occasions it requires prudence and a strong sense of propriety to govern this, as well as all the other passions of human nature, and to reduce it to that pitch which any impartial spectator can approve of. To disappoint this curiosity, however, when it is kept within proper bounds and aims at nothing which there can be any just reason for concealing, is equally disagreeable in its turn. The man who eludes our most innocent questions, who gives no satisfaction to our most inoffensive inquiries, who plainly wraps himself up in impenetrable obscurity, seems, as it were, to build a wall about his breast. We run forward to get within it, and all the eagerness of harmless curiosity, and feel ourselves all at once pushed back with the rudest and most offensive violence. The man of reserve and concealment 
though seldom a very amiable character, is not disrespected or despised. He seems to feel coldly towards us, and feel as coldly towards him. He is not much praised or beloved, but he is as little hated or blamed. He very seldom, however, has occasion to repent his caution, and is generally disposed rather to value himself upon the prudence of his reserve. Though his conduct, therefore, may have been very faulty, and sometimes even hurtful, he can very seldom be disposed to lay his case before the casuists, or to fancy that he has any occasion for their acquittal or approbation. It is not always so with man who, from false information, from inadvertency, from precipitancy and rashness, has involuntarily deceived. Though it should be in a matter of little consequence in telling a piece of common news, for example, if he is a real lover of the truth, he is ashamed of his own carelessness and never fails to embrace the first opportunity of making the fullest acknowledgments. If it is in a matter of some consequence, his contrition is still greater, and if any unlucky or fatal consequence has followed from his misinformation, he can scarce ever forgive himself. Though not guilty, he feels himself to be in the highest degree what the ancients called piacular, and is anxious and eager to make every sort of atonement in his power. Such a person might frequently be disposed to lay his case before the casuists, who have in general been very favorable to him, and though they have sometimes justly condemned him for rashness, they have universally acquitted him for the ignominy of falsehood. But the man who had the most frequent occasion to consult them was the man of equivocation and mental reservation, the man who seriously and deliberately meant to deceive, but who, at the same time, wished to flatter himself that he had really told the truth. With him they have dealt variously. When they approved very much of the motives of his deceit, they have sometimes acquitted him, though to do them justice, they have in general and much more frequently condemned him. The chief subjects of the works of the casuists, therefore, were the conscientious regard that is due to the rules of justice, how far we ought to respect the life and property of our neighbor, the duty of restitution, the laws of chastity and modesty, and wherein consisted what in their language are called the sins of concupiscence, the rules of veracity, and the obligation of oaths, promises, and contracts of all kinds. It may be said, in general, of the works of the casuists, that they attempted, to no purpose, to direct by precise rules what it belongs to feeling and sentiment only to judge of. How is it possible to ascertain by rules the exact point at which, in every case, a delicate sense of justice begins to run into a frivolous and weak scrupulosity of conscience. When it is that secrecy and reserve begin to grow into dissimulation, how far an agreeable irony may be carried, and at what precise point it begins to degenerate into a detestable lie. What is the highest pitch of freedom and ease of behavior which can be regarded as graceful and becoming, and when it is that it first begins to run into a negligent and thoughtless licentiousness. With regard to all such matters, what would hold good in any case would scarce do so exactly in any other, and what constitutes the propriety and happiness of behavior varies in every case with the smallest variety of situation. Books of casuistry, therefore, are generally as useless as they are commonly tiresome. They could be of little use to one who should consult them upon occasion, even supposing their decisions to be just, because, notwithstanding the multitude of cases collected in them, yet upon account of the still greater variety of possible circumstances, it is a chance if among all those cases there be found one exactly parallel to that under consideration. One who is really anxious to do his duty must be very weak, if he can imagine that he has much occasion for them, and with regard to one who is negligent of it, the style of those writings is not such as to likely to awaken him to more attention. None of them tend to animate us to what is generous and noble. None of them tend to soften us to what is gentle and humane. Many of them, on the contrary, tend rather to teach us to chicane with our own consciences, and by their vain subtleties serve to authorize innumerable evasive refinements with regard to the most essential articles of our duty. That frivolous accuracy which they attempted to introduce into subjects which do not admit of, 
most necessarily betrayed them into those dangerous errors and at the same time rendered their works dry and disagreeable abounding in abstruse and metaphysical distinctions but incapable of exciting in the heart any of those emotions which it is the principal use of books of morality to excite the two useful parts of moral philosophy therefore are ethics and jurisprudence casuistry ought to be rejected altogether and the ancient moralists appear to have judged much better who in treating of the same subjects did not affect any such nice exactness but contented themselves with describing in a general matter what is the sentiment upon which justice modesty and veracity are founded and what is the ordinary way of acting to which those virtues would commonly prompt us something indeed not unlike the doctrine of the casuists seem to have been attempted by several philosophers there is something of this kind in the third book of cicero's offices where he endeavours like a casuist to give rules for our conduct in many nice cases in which it is difficult to determine whereabouts the point of propriety may lie it appears too from many passages in the same book that several other philosophers had attempted something of the same kind before him neither he nor they however appear to have aimed at giving a complete system of this sort but only meant to show how situations may occur in which it is doubtful whether the highest propriety of conduct consists in observing or in receding from what in ordinary cases are the rules of duty every system of positive law may be regarded as a more or less imperfect attempt towards a system of natural jurisprudence or towards an enumeration of the particular rules of justice as the violation of justice is what men will never submit to from one another the public magistrate is under a necessity of employing the power of the commonwealth to enforce the practice of this virtue without this precaution civil society would become a scene of bloodshed and disorder every man revenging himself at his own hand whenever he fancied he was injured to prevent the confusion which would attend upon every man's doing justice to himself the magistrate in all governments that have acquired any considerable authority undertakes to do justice to all and promises to hear and to redress every complaint of injury in all well-governed states too not only judges are appointed for determining the controversies of individuals but rules prescribed for regulating the decisions of those judges and these rules are in general intended to coincide with those of natural justice it does not indeed always happen that they do in every instance sometimes what is called the constitution of the state that is the interest of our government sometimes the interest of particular orders of men who tyrannize the government warp the positive laws of the country from what natural justice would prescribe in some countries the rudeness and barbarism of the people hinder the natural sentiments of justice from arriving at that accuracy and precision which in more civilized nations they naturally attain to their laws are like their manners gross and rude and undistinguishing in other countries the unfortunate constitution of their courts of judicature hinders any regular system of jurisprudence from ever establishing itself among them though the improved manners of the people may be such as would admit the most accurate in no country do the decisions of positive law coincide exactly in every case with the rules which the natural sense of justice would dictate systems of positive law therefore though they deserve the greatest authority as the records of the sentiments of mankind in different ages and nations yet can never be regarded as accurate systems of the rules of natural justice it might have been expected that the reasonings of lawyers upon the different imperfections and improvements of the laws of different countries should have given occasion to an inquiry into what were the natural rules of justice independent of all positive institution it might have been expected that these reasonings should have led them to aim at establishing a system of what might properly be called natural jurisprudence or a theory of general principles which ought to run through and be the foundation of the laws of all nations but though the reasonings of lawyers did produce something of this kind and though no man has treated systematically of the laws of any particular country without intermixing in his work many observations of this sort it was very late in the world before any such general system was thought of or before philosophy of law was treated of by itself and without regard to the particular institutions 
of any one nation. In none of the ancient moralists do we find any attempt toward a particular enumeration of the rules of justice. Cicero, in his offices, and Aristotle, in his ethics, treat of justice in the same general manner in which they treat of all other virtues. In the laws of Cicero and Plato, where we might naturally have expected some attempts towards an enumeration of those rules of natural equity, which ought to be enforced by the positive laws of every country. There is, however, nothing of this kind. Their laws are laws of police, not of justice. Grotius seems to have been the first who attempted to give the world anything like a system of those principles which ought to ruin through, and be the foundation of laws of all nations, and his treatise of the laws of war and peace, with all its imperfections, is perhaps at this day the most complete work that has yet been given upon this subject. I shall, in another discourse, endeavour to give an account of the general principles of law and government, and of the different revolutions which have undergone in different ages and periods of society, not only in what concerns justice, but in what concerns police, revenue, and arms, and whatever else the object of law. I shall not, therefore, at present, enter into any further detail concerning the history of jurisprudence.